Good morning and welcome to the 11 o'clock a.m. public portion of the closed session of the April 26, 2022 City Council meeting. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. <coughs> and for anybody in the public here in person, it did look, nope, okay, thank you. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Currently absent. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruner. Present. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? If you are attending virtually, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in your webinar controls. When it's your turn to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I will pull up our attendee uh, list to see if there's anyone via Zoom. We have nobody, no members of the public in person. And let's see, on Zoom, <coughs> It looks like nobody is attending via <coughs> Zoom. Okay. <laughs> so seeing none, this meeting will now be adjourned and council will go into its closed session. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the 12.30 p.m. session of the April 26, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Our first meeting back in person, welcome. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Is absent. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers? Present. Present. Vice, Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Brunner? Present. Thank you. Our first item on today's agenda is a mayoral proclamation declaring May as Affordable Housing Month. And I would like to welcome uh, Director Bonnie Bush as well, up to the front, and Jessica DeWitt, and our housing team from the city. What did I say? Bonnie Lipscomb, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm multitasking here. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. It's so exciting to be back in person with you this month for the exciting announcement of Affordable Housing Month. There are some really great activities in line for this month, kicking off actually this Sunday with Housing Santa Cruz County at the Cessnon House. Thank you. I have a proclamation to read briefly, and I, I'd appreciate it if you uh, stayed there uh, and and please come up this you work so hard as well they the have i'll say team. the whole housing team and yes, not all of them are here team. we're missing please this yeah is we're for everybody andrea and tiffany as well but with me today is jessica dewitt the housing program manager and community development manager 
and Jessica Meller, the management analyst for the housing team. Thank you. So whereas quality affordable housing is vital to healthy, safe, vibrant, and diverse communities, a fact that continues to be highlighted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas access to a stable, healthy, affordable home is necessary to take critical steps to preserve individual and public health, such as sheltering in place and self-isolation. And whereas affordable homes are the solution to homelessness and provide support to seniors, families, youth, veterans, people recovering from illness and people with disabilities. And whereas even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, rising housing costs have led longtime <coughs> residents to be displaced, live in overcrowded and substandard homes or become homeless. And whereas creating new permanently affordable homes and preserving and improving existing housing makes for stable, vibrant communities, helping residents maintain community roots and fostering racial and economic diversity for generations. And whereas affordable homes close to public transit and jobs reduces greenhouse gas emissions and provides low-income families better access to opportunities and amenities. And whereas nonprofit organizations, local jurisdictions, community organizations, faith-based groups, and many others continue to build inclusive communities supporting low-income people and those with special needs. And whereas regional housing organizations are continuing to recognize the month of May as Affordable Housing Month, because the housing crisis can only be resolved when the entire region takes action. And whereas local jurisdictions, such as the city of Santa Cruz, play a critical role by raising local resources for affordable housing to leverage the federal, state, and other funds. And so now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 as Affordable Housing Month in the city of Santa Cruz, along with other local leaders in the greater San Francisco and Monterey Bay Area regions. Thank you. Can I pass this to you? Oh, please, thank you. And, and I just wanted to draw attention. I know that the events are um, posted above on the screen. I did want to draw attention, um, in addition to the kickoff this Sunday, our, the groundbreaking of our Pack Station South project, which is May 19th, um, which is, you know, decade plus in the making. And so we're so excited and appreciate all the support of council um, and past councils and mayors in, in making this reality of this uh, affordable housing project um, a dream come true for our community. So we look forward to seeing you all there on May 19th at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item number four is a mayoral proclamation declaring May 1st through May 7th as Municipal Clerks Week. And we have uh, Bonnie Bush and Julia Wood here with us today, our, our clerk's office. Whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world. And whereas the office of the municipal clerk is the oldest among public servants. And whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between citizens, the local government bodies, and agencies of government at other levels. And whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all. And whereas the municipal clerk serves as the information center of local government and community. And whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs 
of the Office of the Municipal Clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meeting of their state, province, county, and international professional organizations. And whereas in 1984, President Ronald Reagan signed a proclamation officially declaring Municipal Clerks Week as the first full week of May, and in 1994 and 1996, President Bill Clinton also signed proclamations confirming Municipal Clerks Week. And whereas, whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the office of the municipal clerk. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brenner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 1st through May 7th, 2022, as Professional Municipal Clerks Week in the city of Santa Cruz in recognition of the exemplary dedication to public service and extend deep appreciation to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush, Deputy City Clerk, Julia Wood, and the staff of the Santa Cruz City Clerk's Office. Thank you. I will just say we might be the oldest public service, but we are the least known. <laughs> and that'll be the question I get is, what do you do? <laughs> Thank you. Starting the meeting off on a very nice note. Um, moving on to our next agenda item, uh, number five, we will uh, come back to you uh, around 4.30. Uh, 4, 4.30 will be the estimated time. It will be the outstanding volunteer recognition. I have a few announcements and then we will continue with our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you please respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of chambers. For the consideration of our community, Please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually, please call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen with your television or streaming device on, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is your time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. Please note that public comment is only heard on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers eight through 28 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members, if there are any statements of disqualification today. <clears throat> okay, I have one statement of disqualification. Uh, item number 25, 415 Natural Bridges. 
Um, I think you need a reason. And the reason is I uh, currently sit on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, and uh, that is one of our projects. Are there any other? Okay, moving on. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session this morning. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the city council. This morning, the council met in person in closed session in the courtyard conference room at 11 a.m. to consider two items. The first item was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. Uh, the name of the action is Emmanuel Trujillo versus city of Santa Cruz. Uh, it's a case pending in the United States District Court in San Jose. Second item was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning significant exposure to litigation. Uh, one potential uh, case was discussed in closed session. Council received a report from the city attorney's office and gave direction on those two items. Uh, there was no reportable action. Thank you. Now is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees. Mayor, sorry, we just skipped six. I will continue with item number six, the city council calendar, uh, meeting calendar, and I'll call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. <laughs> Thank you. Agenda item number seven. This is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. And I will start on my right with Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, so uh, since our last um, meeting where we had the opportunity to provide updates, we have had some Metro meetings. And the big news is that our new CEO of our Metro District, Michael Tree, has started. He started yesterday. Um, I wasn't able to make it to Friday's meeting, so I'll let Council Member Myers give that update. Um, and then just that the TSA mask mandate uh, expired on April 18th. So that's what I have for the Metro. City Schools Committee also met. Um, lots happening there, lots to talk about. Parks and Rec, uh, of course, launched their summer uh, registration successfully. and. Um, uh, so we're communicating and working with city schools on partnership, continued partnerships for summer programs. I'll let Council or Vice Mayor Watkins talk about the Children's Fund. And um, we're working with city schools on uh, potentially partnering on highlighting, looking at uh, school campus, opening school campuses on partially on weekends. So that's still in discussion. And just as part of that, I'll give a, a quick update on the Children and Youth Bill of Rights. Um, some of us council members have been working with a youth action network. That's the youth group that is under United Way, um, working on creating a youth liaison that would directly work with council members. And just an announcement that the Youth Action Network is hosting their Santa Cruz City pop-up in partnership with the uh, Teen Center tomorrow tomorrow at the London Nelson Center and Park from 2 to 5. And that UCSC, there's a UCSC class that's taken quite an interest in the Children and Youth Bill of Rights, so they're working with us in terms of how does it look for operationalizing and implementing the Bill of Rights at a city. And then my last um, committee that I'll report on is the Health and All Policies. We are looking at really focusing on analysis of city commissions and committees and what they look like now and how we can improve inclusion and diversity in city commissions and, and uh, committees. 
Thank you, That's Council it. Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I will start with the uh, Regional Transportation Commission. We've had a lot of activity and have been using our extra time that we have for transportation policy workshops to learn more about uh, some of the particulars around transportation financing, which is very complicated, uh, as well as uh, thinking about how we will uh, potentially use the Measure D funds um, through bonding to finance larger infrastructure projects moving forward. Um, gives a, there are pros and cons, and we've talked about this here at the city for larger infrastructure, um, in particular with water, so I think you all are familiar with the um, concept. Uh, so we've had some really productive discussions, interesting discussions about how we'll proceed there, um, but I think it will give us an opportunity to um, be able to build out some of the projects that the voters told us are very critical to them uh, and um, do that in a shorter time frame. Uh, we did, at our last regular meeting, uh, did vote to increase funding for the Santa Cruz Metro, Lift Line, and um, local jurisdictions through Transportation Development Act funding. Um, we've received some grants from Caltrans for two sustainable transportation projects focusing on climate adaptation and, and uh, transportation equity in Santa Cruz County. And um, <coughs> we also got an update and uh, talked about the, the benefits of the Go Santa Cruz County program. So I wanted to just highlight that here. The city of Santa Cruz has had a major role in that and our, um, our staff was really at the uh, the forefront in putting this program together. It is the Cruise 511 program that uh, provides information for uh, commuters, residents who are interested in finding alternative commute solutions to uh, look for those and also to plug in to um, a system where they can actually record alternative transportation commutes and, um, and receive benefits as a result of their participation. It's a great program. It's expanded into the county through the RTC and um, will continue. So go Santa Cruz County. I recommend uh, getting the app and, and using it, looking at it, and kind of learning about all of the features and what it can do. Uh, we also had, um, so I'll, and next one, I'm going to go on to the Area Agency on Aging, our most recent meeting. Uh, we discussed, uh, we, we finalized our area plan, which is uh, really a comprehensive plan for San Benito and Santa Cruz counties. That's the jurisdiction that are part of the, the AAA. Uh, we talked about some good news related to uh, nutrition infrastructure funding, ARPA funds, and OAAR funds that uh, the, the, the AAA will be able to distribute to local programs. And we also talked about some good news with the state budget, um, which seems to be a theme, at least for this year, um, in a variety of arenas, given the state surplus. Um, but what that's doing, uh, given the impetus for um, really uh, focusing on older um, Americans and the Older Americans Act and the master plan on aging that the state is now uh, established. And um, so I think that we will see uh, some some funding coming to programs that really meet a, a variety of critical needs for low-income seniors in our community and um, and beyond. So uh, that's, I think, um, those are the big updates from the AAA. And um, our last uh, Air Resources District board meeting was relatively mild-mannered, um, so I don't have a lot to report there, um, but we did get a presentation from uh, uh, students at UCSC who are involved, and, and it, this is a really interesting partnership that the Air Board has uh, established with the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, to help fund a class where students come in and actually get to work on uh, projects around air monitoring and finding new <coughs> innovative ways to um, conduct air monitoring and take policy action as a result of that. And I think for the Budget and Revenue Committee, I will uh, pass that on to one of my colleagues uh, because I did have to leave early last week uh, to get an update on uh, that. And 
Councilmember Nuttall. Uh, Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see. LAFCO uh, met on the, um, I believe it was the 6th of April. And the one significant um, action that took place at that meeting was Opal Cliffs District. Um, the recreation district was reorganized and has been officially dissolved. And that district is now moved into County Service Area 11. Um, at the we had a special meeting of AMBAG, and at that meeting we approved to continue moving forward with um, remote meetings, and we will be revisiting that topic again in May. I would also like to mention that um, for LAFCO, that the city of Santa Cruz, the cities um, that are participants in LAFCO rotate every few years and next on at the first meeting the meeting in may will be the last meeting uh that santa cruz will be have a seat on that board i think for the next two years and so my position representing the city on lapco will end after the meeting in may and i believe it'll be about two years before we have a seat on that commission again um and that i believe is all i have to report Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Oh, one more thing, sorry. We, um, we were, the Public Safety Committee had been meeting, and we had scheduled monthly meetings, but it looks like we're gonna move back to quarterly meetings, so we will be meeting, our next meeting won't be until June, and so just wanted to make that update as well. Was there a reason to move to quarterly? Historically, we've the public safety committee has met historically or has met quarterly. Um, this year, we put placeholders on the agenda to potentially meet monthly should something arise. And so, if um, there's a reason for the public safety committee to meet before the June meeting, then I believe that we will have those meetings. Okay. But as it stands right now, it doesn't appear that there'll be anything forthcoming that will meet that will require the public safety committee to meet until June. Great. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. I'll uh, report a little bit more on the Metro, uh, recent Metro um, board meeting, which was held last Friday. Council um, Member Myers, can you move your mic closer? Thank you. Uh, the Metro board did meet on Friday of last week. Um, a couple of exciting things that were um, completed in that meeting was a um, long-range bus replacement program, including um, the analysis ne necessary um, to test the initial zero emission buses that were purchased last year, and to forecast the building of zero emission bus infrastructure before um, the agency transitions to a fleet of 100% zero emission buses. So big transition there for our, um, for our transit agency. The other thing that uh, the board took action on was actually to release a um, request for proposals for a South County um, zero emissions operating and maintenance facility plan. Um, this would be is envisioned to be built in the South County area and it would basically create a regional facility um, where um, you know, zero emission vehicles, primarily metros, obviously, but um, I believe there's some discussions with other agencies that we would have basically a zero emissions operating and maintenance facility in South County. So that's pretty exciting to imagine more of that infrastructure built, being built throughout the, um, throughout the county. So uh, Metro's taken the lead on that, and um, they will be issuing a request for proposals for a consulting team to begin the planning work on that and that's being funded by federal grants to look at that uh, to look at that analysis um, I'm also on the mid county groundwater agency now and that agency met uh, we had our meeting at the end of March and that's a quarterly meeting I believe uh, the agency adopted a 7.6 million dollar grant um, relating to various water projects um, for the Mid-County 
uh, aquifers that are a focus of the Groundwater Sustainability Act. So um, that includes uh, additional scientific investigation of the aquifers, but also implementation projects such as conservation, well metering, things like that to, um, to get a sense of how to better manage that aquifer uh, from seawater intrusion. And then um, I'm a member of the Cowell Working Group. Um, that group will be uh, participating, members of that group will be participating in the 10th anniversary of the World Surfing Reserve, um, which is held um, this coming Friday on the 29th, um, head, head, headed up by Save the Waves Coalition, and there will be facil facilitated discussions at that event, um, focusing on water quality as well as uh, climate adaptation, uh, public access, and um, uh, what's the last one? One, more, one other subject that will be used, these facilitated sessions will be used to forecast the new stewardship plan for the World Surfing Reserve uh, here in Santa Cruz County. So that's this Friday at 1 to 8. Uh, the 5 to 8 period is a public celebration out at Long Marine Lake. And I'll be t participating in the climate adaptation group, um, helping to facilitate that with Tiffany Weiss West of our staff. And those are my reports. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Myers. And Vice Mayor Watkins. So let's see, what I have to add, um, so Visit Santa Cruz County met uh, May, no, excuse me, March 30th, and we had a chance to meet the new executive director whose name is escaping me at the moment, so I'll look to you, Mayor, if you can recall. But we have a new executive director who filled um, the big shoes of Maggie Ivey, um, really jumped right in, talked a lot about data, his passion for data. Um, we had conversations around some of the um, topics that impact the city, state of the industry, COVID-19, um, TOT proposed increase, homeless issues, et cetera. Um, and then also just looking at the trends in terms of visitors coming in to our community and sort of what we're learning and what, what kind, of, um, kind of populations we're drawing on as things have changed with COVID over the, over the years, these past couple of years. Uh, we had the two by two meeting and we talked about emergency shelter and safe sleeping status updates, street outreach capacity building, uh, home key update, the 14 million investment plan and status updates as, along with the eviction and homelessness um, prevention planning. So conversation around those items. And um, the Housing for Health Partnership had its second meeting, a lot of very nuanced discussion around um, the integration of, of many different agencies and entities and billing systems that I'm learning a lot about, um, but also around really the prioritization and kind of initial feedback from the board on how we want to um, prioritize the, the continuum of care coordinated entry system policies, procedures, and et cetera. So um, some conversation about really re-upping that process, which will essentially in turn Kind of think about how we're designing some of our grant funding and other um, strategies for prioritizing different populations and in terms of the the children's fund very exciting to have that resource thank you to the council and the community for voting that in i'm really just looking at firming up how we want to move forward since we've had a, a relatively informal process in place prior to having the voters affirm our um, dedication of this resource to kids to a more formalized process in which the ballot language identifies specific um, entities or stakeholders to help advise the council on funding moving forward. Um, so conversations are ensuing. The funding is um, kind of retroactive, right? So it's we audit and then we think about the funding so that um, we have a little bit of time to establish that process. And I think that covers my update. Thank you, Council Member or Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I will just add with uh, the Revenue Budget Committee, we did uh, meet and we had a brief presentation with our finance director and looked at uh, where we are with uh, some of our after some of our reductions and we looked at projected uh, uh, graphs and looking forward if measure F the revenue measure were to pass versus 
it not passing. And we also uh, continued to explore other revenue options. And one of those um, options was uh, uh, exploration into a, a real estate transfer tax and uh, some research done in other cities, for example, San Jose was brought as an example and how they have a tiered uh, approach. Um, and so properties over, you know, a couple million uh, are assessed at a higher rate than those not. And so that creates a larger revenue stream for uh, different cities. We also explored the relationship on the various taxes and what the city receives versus the county receiving, and um, that about concludes that meeting. And our other meeting that I attended was the homelessness two by two meeting, and um, we covered shelter capacity and current and upcoming. We have. Uh, a navigation center and armory uh, location, which is up near De La Viega, and the timing of closures of the COVID shelters that the county is running there, um, and the timing and plan for the safe sleeping and sheltering site that the city is standing up there. We had a home key update, uh, housing program capacity outside of the city, and we had a discussion related to the $14 million uh, that we are receiving a one-time fund. Uh, competitive grant awards for Santa Cruz County, uh, and there was a PLA LHA, and I don't remember what that stands for, I apologize. If anyone here knows or remembers what PLHA stands for, the acronyms um, CDBG funds, HDAP funds, and um, we also had a discussion regarding encampment response in relation to our newly adopted homelessness response action plan, and uh, we had uh, discussions around outreach, homeward bound, flexible funding, and uh, county services, standing up temporary um, uh, services around the benchlands. It's permanent local housing allocation. Thank you, permanent local <laughs> housing allocation. Thank you, Council Member Brown, for looking that up. And Council Member Cummings. I just had one question since you all got an update on the county, kind of how it's um, shutting down its services at the armory and we're opening up our services. I'm wondering if um, there was any update on what will happen with the people who are currently there. Are they being housed or? They've kind of been working on? with, uh, they have teams of folks working with those, anybody up there. They've already been reducing it over the past several months. And they have also uh, had a rehousing wave program that has been working to uh, rehouse with housing vouchers. And um, at two meetings ago, they did give an update on those numbers. I don't have that in front of me, but I'm happy to have um, uh, those notes uh, given to you. And then one more thing. I'd a member of the public just reached out and they said that it would be good if we speak into the mics because we're speaking a little soft and kind of far away and people who are watching online aren't getting it picked up. So just a reminder. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Okay, we're getting used to uh, being back in person. So thank you everyone as we navigate through uh, what's working and what we need to improve on. So I will lean closer to the mic and ask that all council members and anybody speaking lean right into the microphone. Thank you. Okay, moving on with our agenda.
If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of items polled by council members, now is the time to do so. Next up is our consent agenda, items 8 through 21 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, please call in with the instructions that are on your screen. Remember to mute your streaming device. Raise your hand either by dialing star 9 on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Okay, council member Cummings. I'd like to pull um, item number nine and item number 11. Council member Brown. Uh, I would like to pull item 12. I've been asked by members of the public Council Member Cummings is pulling item 9 and 11. Council Member Brown is pulling item 12. And I also was going to pull item 12, so uh, I will add that. And anybody else? Great. If there are members of the public that would like to speak to any of the items on our consent agenda, with the exception of items 9, 11, and 12, now is the time to do so. If you are attending virtually, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes. Members of the public who are joining us here in chambers and wanting to comment on an item on the consent agenda, Please line up to the right of the dais. You will have three minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Seeing that we have no members in the public, I will go to Zoom and look at our attendees in Zoom. And I have one hand raised, Equity Transit. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, City Council members, for your work and uh, the time you spend on these very long and important agendas. Um, I just want to say also thank you for speaking closer into the mic. It was hard to hear some of you. Um, I just want to briefly say, because it sounds like the item is being pulled, I was going to support opposition to Measure, measure D and thank you the City Council for that. I imagine that there are reasons for it being pulled, which I don't understand. Um, so that's all I'm going to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any? I just wanted to see if we could, Mayor, sorry, excuse me, to clarify that the reason for having it pulled was so that we can have discussion about it. The caller was disappointed that it was pulled, but it's being pulled so we can hear it. Thank you for clarifying. Council Member Brown brought up the clarification that the pulled items 9, 11, and 12, we will come back to those items after this time right now. This time right now is for the other consent agenda items. So if there are any members of the public that would like to speak 
to items 8 through 21 with, with the exception of 9, 11, and 12. Now is the time to do so. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to council for a motion on the consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda. I have a first by Counts Vice Mayor Watkins. I'll second that. And a second by Council Member Myers. Okay, now we will come back to the polled items in the consent uh, agenda. I just need to take a roll call vote on the motion. Thank you. We will now have a roll call vote on the motion made. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Councilmember Golder? Still absent. Uh, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Watkins? Aye. And Brunner? Mayor Brunner. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Those consent agenda items passes unanimously with Golder absent. Mayor, may I ask a question around order? Yes. So I was just curious, This is since this is the first time we're meeting um, in this hybrid format, I'm just curious about, because I know Previously, when we met in person, we take motion motions. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed, no. And now we're doing, um, um, we're going individually. And so I'm just wondering if that's because we're hybrid or we've never, we've always done a roll call vote. In in person, we. Mm -hmm. It's always been a roll call. I don't remember that being the case when we when we met in person. Yep. We can clarify that for our next meeting, and if you have any um, further questions, sure. I'm happy to discuss. Thank you. Okay, are, are we ready to move on? Okay, uh, we are moving on to, we had a pulled item in our consent agenda. Item number nine is the first pulled item. And that was pulled by Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this item is the minutes of the April 19th, 2022 City Council special meeting related to district elections. Um, during the meeting, I brought up how many members of the public um, feel that this process has been undemocratic, that districting by ordinance violates the state constitution and the sixth district number 602 map reduces the percentage of voters of a protected class in concentrated areas, which reflects gender, gender mar, gen, gerrymandering and perpetuates systemic racism. And so for the record, I would like the motion, to, the minutes to reflect that council member Cummings voted to oppose the draft map 602 because the process was un undemocratic and dilutes concentrated communities of a protected class, specifically Asians and Latinos, which reflects gerrymandering and perpetuates systemic racism under item number two and item number three for the record council member cummings voted to oppose the ordinance because changes in the city charter by ordinance is undemocratic and violates the state california state constitution and i sent that language to the clerk so that it can be put on the screen um, but largely just making sure that that is that language is reflected um, for the record in the minutes is that what was said in that it was reflected or is that what your interpretation is now that you want reflected is there, does that matter? I expressed that a number of times during the meeting and would like that to be reflected in the minutes. I, just to clarify, yeah. there wasn't the previous um, the initial for the record, so we didn't put it in the minutes as part of the record. Because there's a, there was a lot of conversation, so we couldn't determine if it was something for the record or not, which is why it's not there. But we can add it if- But it was said at the meeting, during the meeting. 
I would have to go back and clarify that, but I know that there were comments made and we did not put them in as a record. That's all. So, yeah. Okay, does that clarify your, your question, Vice Mayor Watkins? Well, yeah, I mean, I think if it's a for the record that was stated that should go in the minutes, that makes a lot of sense. But if it's your interpretation of what your for the record should have been said and now you're trying to change it, I think that's different given that these are uh, I, this is an item on the minutes. So I guess if it reflects what was said, then that makes sense. But if it is now different and worded different, I, I don't know how that works. We process. can, can I um, <clears throat> go back and watch the video and then if this is what it says. We are happy to amend the minutes as reflected. And then if not, maybe we could, I could re-agendize this for approval later. And city attorney, if you could weigh in. Yes, um, this is actually addressed in, in the council's uh, policy manual. What it says is that the minutes shall be kept by the city clerk administrator and shall be recorded in a file kept for that purpose with a record of each particular type of business transacted by the council set off in paragraphs with subheadings. City clerk shall be required to make a record only of such business as was actually passed by a vote of the council and shall not be required to make a verbatim transcript of proceedings. Uh, a record shall be made of the names of persons addressing the council, the title of the subject, whether they spoke in support or in opposition to the matter. With regard to remarks, from council members, uh, the rule book says that a council member may request through the presiding officer the privilege of having an abstract of that member's statements on any subject under consideration by the council entered in the minutes. And if the council consents, such statements shall be entered in the minutes. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So we have um, a clarification from Council Member Cummings regarding the minutes from our special meeting on April 19th. Council Member Myers. Just, I'm curious to hear from our city attorney. This, I guess these terms are, I mean, this statement is pretty, Definitive, um, and uh, the way I read it is, does this expose us to any kind of litigation? Um, <laughs> hmm. that, I don't know how that determination of any of I, any of those statements. I would made. argue in court that it's a lay opinion, um, not uh, a statement of the law. Um, so I don't see this in and of itself exposing the city to litigation, um, but it does state facts which, uh, if correct, uh, might support a claim against the city. But it's re like I said, I would I would characterize it as a lay opinion. Can I add to that? In that it wasn't. I mean, given that our demog demographer had given us legally viable options, it's in their expert opinion, correct, that this is actually not um, accurate, and that is a lay opinion, correct? That is correct. Our demographer provided the council with a range of options that the demographer concluded were um, consistent with the requirements of the California Voting Rights Act, and the council selected among options that were provided by the expert demographer. Um, with regard to item three, I would say that um, the statement that changing the city charter by ordinance violates the California Constitution is uh, not a legal opinion that I would agree with. Because cities, charters, several charter cities in California have, under the California Voting Rights Act, uh, changed to district elections without amending their charters. One last clarifying question. Then for the for the minutes, would it be that Councilmember Cummings voted to oppose the draft map 602 because in his opinion he felt, <laughs> as opposed to that being more factually stated? Or do you don't put that in the minutes? Because that would, I think, feel so, better, or no? As I, as I said, um, the council can authorize statements to be included in the minutes other than the actions that were taken. But it's a council decision. 
So really what council member Cummings is asking the council is for the council to authorize these statements to be included in the minutes. The council should vote on that if that's what um, is that if um, that's what's requested. So, so I've read this as a form of a motion that the council can either accept or reject by by vote. Did you have anything to add? No, I was just going to say whenever somebody does a statement for the record, we do it verbatim. Uh -huh. So there's no question. Council Member Cummings, is that your verbatim statement there after hearing uh, the other comments? Um, the, the statements that you made uh, are more statements rather than opinion. It's a statement for the rationale. Be it's a statement of rationale for why I voted the way I did. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion uh, by council. It has to go to public comment first. Yes. Did you have one more input? Thank you. Uh, at this time, we have a motion. Uh, council member Cummings has pulled agenda item nine to include some statements for the record from our April 19th meeting. And I will go out to attendees on Zoom. We have no attendees in person. And I see one member of the public with their hand raised. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, press star nine on your phone or raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. So phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and unmute with star six. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Good. Uh, first of all, you skipped over the public comment on 13 and 14 when you were off offering an opportunity for the public to speak. You, I, I dialed in and for some reason you ignored me, which is unfortunate because I only had a brief comment, which is open the bathrooms up. If you're going to be spending this kind of money, it's really important that you actually act, allow people, who, members of the public, to have access to bathrooms like the San Lorenzo and the Loudon Nelson bathrooms, which they haven't had for several years. Uh, however, regarding this particular situation with the minutes, it seems to me that the public needs to have as much and as detailed an understanding of what goes on at city council as they can have. And I've always been concerned when members of the council, perhaps for purposes of simply speed and efficiency, and maybe to save a little wear and tear on the city uh, administrator or the city clerk, try to cut this short and make it a, a much more sort of template, only the actions get recorded and so forth. And that's none of the comment. This also goes for the public. When the public has comments to make, we get so brief a time to actually talk uh, to each other and to the city council, although I feel that most of the time the council follows the directions of the staff and isn't too interested in what the public is saying. So I would say that if a member of the city council, regardless of their political orientation, wants to correct a record or add a statement, I mean, why not show that person the respect to do so? I mean, I, I would say to the council majority that you may be in this situation at some point in the future, and it's just a matter of simple justice. Uh, thank you. That's all I got to say. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment on agenda item nine in the consent agenda uh, that has been pulled? Seeing none, I will bring it back to council for deliberation. If there's no further comment to keep the meeting moving, I'm happy to. I have a comment. Okay. Yeah, given that it's factually inaccurate, I, I mean, I personally don't feel comfortable adding that. So I, I don't know what the motion would be or what your motion would be to add, but. The motion w was what was on the screen, so. We can do a roll call vote. It sounds like you okay. may be voting no. Yep. 
I'm not aware if there was a second. I didn't even get to make the motion. I was still stating it, so. Um, I'm sorry, my understanding was that was yeah. your motion. Yeah, so I'll make the motion that was proposed um, to accept the staff's um, recommendation of the minutes with the proposed amendments to items number two and three. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second. So we have a motion by Council Member Cummings and a second by Council Member Brown. I have a comment before we go to vote. Okay, and now I will take it for discussion. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, I'll support the motion, but I just want to comment that these are inaccurate statements and it undermines the work of staff and the work that's been done but I'll support the motion of my colleague if that's how he would like to be stated for the record. Okay, any other comments? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, Council Member Myers and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not gonna support the motion. Um, I, I agree the statements are incorrect. Um, and I think there's a way to express the reason for voting against the item without um, having definitive statements that we believe to be uh, uh, not legally sound. So I'm not comfortable with using our minutes as a way to try to um, state something that I think um, our attorney has stated is, is not probably not legally accurate. So I, I will not be supporting the motion. Typically, I would definitely want to honor a member's um, desire to, to correct minutes as needed, but um, not with inaccurate information. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I, I understand the concerns that I'm hearing. Um, however, I wanted to remind uh, uh, my colleagues that we did, um, you know, that was a, a pretty intense discussion, and we did receive a message from our city clerk afterwards asking us to um, provide some clarity and succinctness in our uh, uh, making comments for the record because um, our wonderful city clerk <laughs> does uh, try to capture that for us. And, um, and so that was uh, quite uh, difficult, to, I think, to capture. And so um, I think that um, regardless of whether we agree with the statement made, that those are the, that's the feeling of a particular council member, and it would, they were statements that were made during the meeting, and so I think supporting it um, is appropriate at this time. And uh, I certainly was reminded, and am again reminded, that uh, making very clear and concise statements for the record will help us kind <laughs> of not not do this um, moving forward. Thank you, Council Member Brown, and I'll just echo what you said. Uh, it's very important that. Uh, as we honor our city clerks during city clerks week especially that we remind ourselves to make uh, any for the record statements as um, clear as possible uh, in a mid discussion and uh, I see this item council member Cummings as uh, not a statement of fact but a statement of what you um, uh, wanted to have reflected on your vote and your intention um, with this with that meeting and that item so with that let's go to a roll call vote Thank you, mayor council member Kalantari Johnson aye Holder absent Cummings aye Brown aye Myers no vice mayor Watkins no and Mayor Brunner. Aye. So we have four, two, and one absent. Four in favor, two against, and one absent. Yes. Okay. Moving on to the next pulled agenda item. Item number 11 was pulled by Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I want to start by thanking the council members who brought this item forward. Um, consistently, you know, since I've at least been on the council, and I would imagine 
prior to me joining the council, I know that the council has been in support of the rail and trail. And uh, what's before us is on item number 11 is opposition to Measure D, Santa Cruz County Greenway Initiative, and reiterated support for continued rail planning on the Santa Cruz branch line. Um, I actually pulled this item because um, just given the sentiment around Measure D and the community, I just thought that because there were other items on here that we might have received comment on that providing space for this item to receive independent comment was probably something that the community would appreciate. And so I actually pulled this for the purposes of allowing community members to uh, specifically have their public comment time allocated towards this item as opposed to it being included with all the other items. And so um, I just want to express my support and, and um, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Are there any questions from council members? I will take it out to public comment. Okay, so now I will take it out to public comment for item number 11 on our consent agenda, I, uh, consent agenda. and I will be uh, allowing members of the public in person as well as on Zoom to make public comment. And um, we do have a member of the public in person for item number 11. If you can step to the right and sign your name. And I will just look out to uh, attendees in Zoom as well. It looks like we have four attendees with their hands raised. So if you are an attendee on Zoom, and you would like to comment on item number 11, opposition to Measure D, Santa Cruz County Greenway Initiative, and reiterated support for continued rail planning on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. Uh, you can press star nine on your phone or select raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set to three minutes. I will begin with uh, our member of the public in person here at Council Chambers. So you may approach the microphone, thank you, and please try to speak into the microphone. I will, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Members, for bringing this uh, to actually public, but also consent agenda. Uh, I very much support your opposition to Measure D. Um, I am a bicyclist, I'm a walker, but I also love trains and <clears throat> other forms of uh, rail transportation. Um, we need it. We are in dire need of more public transportation. And <clears throat> having written Amtrak and you know, San Jose, uh, um, public transportation on rails, uh, I find it both a communally very enticing and pleasant way of transportation. Um, I think we need to preserve it for the future, whether we have a light rail uh, at this point or a PRT at some point. Uh, that is up to the, the future council members to decide but do not do away with the rail. You will need it later. So thank you for your opposition. Please vote for the opposition to Measure D. And I hope the public thinks, studies it, and thinks carefully about what they're doing. Thank you. Did I say my name? No. Matilda Rand. Matilda Rand, thank you very much for your public comment. I will go out to Zoom attendees and we can come back to uh, in-person in chambers if there are any more members of the public uh, on this item in person. But for now, I will go out to our Zoom attendees. I see Brian Trail now. Go ahead and unmute yourself by pressing star six. Yeah. Yes, thank you. This is Brian Peoples with Trail Now, a local organization, been an organization for 
10 for over a decade in transportation. And we're strongly advocating for you to not support no on D. At the end of the day, the RTC staff is moving forward with rail banking, which is preserving the coastal corridor for future transit. That's not the debate. That isn't the debate. For the Greenway Initiative, what it is, is it is giving direction to the county staff to update the general plan to give us more options. Right now, our hands are tied. We only have rail, it's rail only. What the county staff needs is that option. Options with rubber wheels on asphalt transit. That's what we need. You're making it actually more difficult for our community to achieve grants. We are not in any position to get rail grants. The RTC executive director, Guy Preston, specifically said that we would have to spend millions just to do a 30% design for a rail, and then we'd have to do the EIR. Then we got to compete with LA. We got to compete with all these local large facilities. It just isn't matting up. So we're truly asking you to not stir the pot more. RTC staff is negotiating with the rail at uh, Roaring Camp, Ms. Clark. Don't tie his hands. Don't step on him. That's, you all need to support staff. And that's what we're asking you to do. So please do not oppose this and think of Watsonville. You all got your trail in Santa Cruz. Yeah, great. But Watsonville, South County, Aptos, all Capitola, you have yours. We need to open up the coastal trail now. So please do not support this radical opposition. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Pauline Seals. Go ahead and press star six. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, for this chance to speak. Uh, Brian Peoples is part of a group that's been trying to rip out the trail for years. They are against public transport. They have a very limited vision. Uh, I'm so happy that the council is going to vote no on this. We need public transportation for climate fighting and social justice reasons. The people who are stuck every day on Highway 1 in their effort to get to jobs at Dominican Hospital, the county offices, uh, metro drivers, etc., cetera, uh, have no other way to get here and can't afford to live here. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad situation. Also, Measure D would slow things down. There's one section of trail already built where I live on West Side and three more sections that are shovel ready that will be delayed and put on hold. So uh, Measure D will definitely not help us get a trail. It's the exact opposite. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, which has 1,700 members. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is David Hart Public Transit. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, um, good afternoon, uh, esteemed city council members. This is David Van Brink. Uh, thanks for all you do. Um, I, I do have a prepared statement. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, this is my prepared statement. Please support resolution opposing Measure D. Please tell everyone. Uh, this concludes my prepared statement. Thank you for listening and thanks for all your efforts. Carry on. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Matt Farrell. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, I just wanted to point out that proponents of Measure D 
are not being truthful. What Measure D does is it amends the general plan and removes all references to rail planning or study, as I'm sure you are aware, and inserts only the development and authorization for a greenway. So to pretend that somehow these people are supporting transit is uh, a falsehood. And uh, secondly, I just like to say that as Pauline and Mathilde have mentioned, the trail is under progress now and moving forward with rail banking will delay all that work, which is what the proponents are recommending. So thank you so much for um, bringing this resolution for you forward and we deeply appreciate your support. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Equity Transit. Welcome. Hi, thank you. This is Lonnie Faulkner with Equity Transit. Um, I just want to remark, uh, Brian Peoples mentioned earlier about rubber wheels on uh, our tracks. I just have to say as a biochemical endocrinologist that um, our rubber tire industry has been directly related to a huge, huge um, rise over the last 50 to 70 years of autism, cancers, um, Alzheimer's, all sort of untold diseases. I could go on and on and give you lots of um, data behind that. But um, I just want to say that Measure D is not democratic. Greenway has been controlling the message and misinformation campaign alongside Trail Now, of which um, the earlier speaker was a part of. And we really can't have a democratic vote unless the public understands fully what they're voting on. And with the current misinformation campaign, I support you in voting uh, to oppose Measure D. I also um, want to say that Measure D does not guarantee us a trail. Of course, they have to attack and destroy Felton's Roaring Camp line in order to um, attack our line and destroy our line. Um, we are already building a trail now. We have the 2014 award-winning Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail that it, it was awarded the master plan. We are building that now. So we will have a trail and a rail. We can have both. And um, we have huge amounts of money that are coming available through the state rail plan, as well as through the federal infrastructure bill, which I've um, attended some of the grant workshops. But really, there are um, activities that have to be done before we can get access to those funds. And right now, Greenway has managed to put a stick in the mud and stop those processes. Um, the removal of the rails uh, from the general plan, all wording around rail and from the general plan for our branch line, basically will prevent us from doing anything, including applying for grants and moving forward on bringing a clean electric light rail in our community. And um, we can have both. Rail and trail is a true multimodal system. The systems that are now being built throughout the world, systems that the top uh, environmental activists and scientists throughout the world are promoting is exactly what we can have here. We've been noted by a number of top government officials throughout the country that I've talked to who've said that our system is um, a very front running system would be eligible for a lot of money. Um, but that information is actually being squelched by Green Wind Trail now. Um, and then uh, just having conversations with uh, underrepresented communities, people with disabilities, the elderly, having both rail and trail serves equity the environment and our future economy and our future children. So thank you for bringing this up and being able to bringing it um, for the option to vote to oppose Measure D. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Magi Ama. Hi, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm the committee chairman for the Climate Committee for the Santa Cruz Sierra Club. And I'm also the committee chair for the Santa Cruz for Bernie Climate Committee. And at the state level, the Sierra Club has opposed Measure, measure D. And they have opposed it for many reasons, but specifically, if Measure D passes then it will require that not only they take up the rail track, but they remove all of the ballast underneath it that some 
six feet wide and three feet deep of, of gravel and rocks. And those rocks are contaminated now with chromium, which means that this stuff once removed will have to go to a one grade below a Superfund site, which will be hauled away in trucks. It will cost tens of millions of dollars according to our calculations. So it's incredibly important that the public and the county and the city do not support this measure because it is going to cost everybody a lot of money. And you know, above and beyond that, we do need public transit. We have now a plan to connect our rail with the Monterey County mail, rail and with the ultimate light rail that's going to be going around the Bay Area. And that in fact will connect with a bullet train that will go to LA and down to Mexico. And all of this is insanely important for the future of the climate. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public has a phone number ending in 8359. Yes, hi. Hello. Hello there. Yeah, hi, my name is Laurence Gantti and I, I thank you so much for putting this on the agenda today. And I wholeheartedly support your position to, uh, to measure these. I want the trail and the rail and as, as we all know, the transportation sector is responsible for more than 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions in our county. We really need the rail and public transportation options. Um, that is the really the only solution. The climate emergency worsens every day and we must absolutely do everything to curb auto emissions and Again, public transportation must be a part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public via Zoom is Barry Scott. Hi there. Hi, thank you, Council. And um, my name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. I'm the chair of the Mid County Democratic Club, and I want to I want to say how proud I am of the of all three uh, candidates for uh, for supervisor uh, who, who presented to our club and expressed uh, absolute opposition to this this terrible idea called Measure D. Um, I, I'm, pr I'm proud of the work that you've done before in your uh, opposition to the unanimous vote to oppose adverse abandonment of the Felton Line and the Santa Cruz Main uh, Branch Rail Line. And I, 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 I'm going to presume that you all realize that several studies have resulted in the in, 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 every single time that rail transit is the right thing to do for our community and for our future. And the idea that a, an initiative can be put out there that would reduce our options. And it really, there's no question now that what Greenway plans to do is simply remove our rail line forever. It's absurd. And it's 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 awful, and we are all so encouraged uh, that the council would come up uh, would 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 would, uh, <laughs> would bring to the agenda this resolution. And I I hope we see a another unanimous uh, vote in support of the resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our last. Member of the public from Zoom is Garrett Phillip. Yeah, hello. Uh, I wasn't going to speak to this, but uh, since a lot of people are speaking, I would just say that I, I'm not as confident as you are that rail is a cost effective or will anytime soon be a mass transportation option, even though you would really like it to be. I'm not endorsing the Greenway, but it's going before the voters, and I'm uh, not so sure you need to weigh in on this one. They will decide. You can all go vote in June like they do. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. And now I'd like to bring it back to in-person chambers. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to this agenda item? Please come forward. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. It's really good to see you back here again. And I, I think you should 
rejoice and kind of wallow in this niceness for a moment that sounds like most of us agree about what we're talking about here right now. <clears throat> and I just want to say that um, the production of this conversation is very valuable to the city of Santa Cruz and makes Santa Cruz a shining star for what good government should be like. And I just want to say that this Measure D, I agree with you, so happens, by coincidence, um, is a good example of a bad example in, in community government, in, in citizens' participation. It's an example of one of the worst things money could buy, of not participating in the process, and instead of having one or two people's ideas come out and be bought and paid for at huge expense. And I'll just give you an example, because you probably all got the same uh, 11 by 17 flyer on your doorstep that I got in four, four colors. Very expensive to drop door to door at every doorstep in the county. And inside it, I, I don't know if others picked up on this, but inside it is a section of the rail line. I think it's down around La Selva Beach or someplace like that where there's this little urban community, just a little tiny urban community right at the beach. And it showed the rail line right there, which parallels the road in front of those four or five businesses. And it shows it turned into another road. So here's the existing road, which is more than adequate for this small village, and another road next to it. And it shows the lie that these people are telling because the rail line is gone, there's more paved roads. There's about four lanes separated by curbs, all visible in this fairly big picture. And they're, they're, they're throwing this in our face and saying, here's, here's what we're advocating. Well, I'm sorry. These are the few people who are not in tune with our community. And I'm thrilled that you guys are doing this production. And be happy about this. And be happy that there is agreement amongst us. And maybe that can rub off on some other things. Thank you for your comment. <clears throat> that concludes public comment on this polled item number 11 on today's agenda. I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Is there any council member that would like to make a motion and we can continue with discussion? I'll move. We have a I'll second it. motion by Council Member Kalantari Johnson to approve the motion as stated. As the, stated in the um, agenda report. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm. Seconded by Council Member Myers. Are there any council member comments? Council Member Brown? Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. I, um, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this item to our agenda. I do believe it's uh, a really important step for us to take as a city uh, to uh, reflect what I believe is a will of uh, the city of Santa Cruz. And you know, we've had a lot of uh, opportunities to support moving forward. And, um, and this I see as a, a real attempt to block that forward progress. So I just really appreciate you bringing it forward for all of the reasons that are uh, discussed in the resolution. I'm going to support it. I also wanted to add that um, Council Member Golder, who is um, unfortunately not here, she has a conflict today, did want me to share with you all and with the public that uh, were she to be here, uh, she would be supporting this. and. Um, Appreciates you bringing it forward as well. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Any other comments? Uh, I would like to say I believe this uh, item does uh, con is consistent with past and present council direction and action. We've all unanimously taken a stance opposing Measure D, so this is an opportunity to make that clear and support. With that, we will do a roll call vote. Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? 
Still absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes five in favor, one six in favor, one absent. Okay. We are now moving on to polled item number 12 on our consent agenda. This is item Senate Bill 886, California Environmental Quality Act Exemption for University of California Housing Developments. And uh, I asked to pull it in, to ask if we can continue, consider a motion to con continue this item to our next meeting based on uh, all the community input we've received on this item and in looking at the urgency of the timing of this at the state level, um, I think it warrants a further research and in information uh, from the public as well as council members. And I know that council member Brown also pulled this item, so I'll hand it to you. Uh, sure, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I don't have much to say here. I did have a conversation with uh, some members of the public who are um, not uh, very happy about our bringing this forward, who have a uh, you know, different perspective about the urgent need for housing on, uh, for student housing on campus. And so I did say I'd uh, pull the item. Uh, however, I'll just say right now that it has not changed my uh, perspective on uh, what, uh, what to do here. And, and so I do wanna uh, have the opportunity for, for folks to engage in that dialogue. But thus far I have not been persuaded, so I, I didn't pull it to change course, um, but I did want to give that opportunity. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, yeah, the more research that um, I've been able to do, as well as what, from what I understand from the bill history, that there's a, a hearing tomorrow in the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. Um, this bill seems to be still under revision, and um, even though I definitely support some of the intent behind what this bill is trying to do, which is to really make sure that you know housing built on campus is is available and and able to be completed um CEQA is an important law and um i've talked with some of the folks who have been upset about um the opposition of of, of this and explained that you know as a jurisdiction whereby the university of california is you know conducting development um you know, we need to maintain the ability to have um, mitigation that is, um, you know, that it addresses conf uh, uh, potential impacts within our community and, and should be binding mitigation. And so, um, from what I understand, uh, hearing about some of the amendments that are going on in the bill over the last um, uh, few days, it does seem to be changing. And I think it's wise to look at a, a more current version of the bill today. Uh, in interaction, so I would support the, the, the uh, motion to table. Thank you, Thank you Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I'll reiterate the, uh, the same sentiments. I think it's at a critical moment, and I would be interested in seeing uh, what it looks like after it's gone to committee, and I would be in support of uh, tabling it as well. Any other council member comments? Council Member. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I just, want, I just want to make sure that we're, it's clear, to clarify that you're proposing a motion to continue the item to a future agenda, not to table it. Yes, you're right. Oh, okay. sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Table. More calm. <laughs> yes, right, sorry. Right. No problem. So and I'm supportive of doing that, given what I've heard. Time for a cup change. of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'll just say that I haven't, as an author on this, um, I wasn't aware of the changes that were being made. I know there's some people who've been trying to reach out and, um, but um, was not aware that this is gonna be continuing because my understanding was that this was going 
to session. This was, this was going to be in session either today or tomorrow, and that was the reason why we were pushing to make sure that it got on the agenda and so that we could take a stance before it was voted on. Um, and so that's the reason why it's been coming so quickly. And I know that we've, um, you know, that's part of the reason why we um, you know, wanted to hear it today. And so I'm just, it would be great to understand when we're expecting this to be voted on at the state level, because I think, you know, what we want to do is ensure that um, we're supporting um, not only the community's needs, but the actions that have been taken by our county supervisors and supporting, um, you know, ensuring that the voice of the community is being heard at the state level and that the state's aware of our position before this is voted on. And there was um, some, um, you know, difficulty of getting this on this agenda. And I know that staff put in a lot of hard work to try to get this to us and took our, you know, feedback and interest into account. And so getting some clarification on that, especially given um, how we brought this forward with such urgency, I think would be great so that we can, we can, and the community can understand, you know, why we're holding off on taking action today. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I completely agree. And uh, one of the reasons I brought this um, uh, suggestion forward was uh, as of today or this morning, I learned that there is a hearing tomorrow. And for us to submit any, any type of letter of support or opposition um, is too late for tomorrow's hearing. And so, um, Given that there is still time to give our input, I thought it would be best to see where uh, tomorrow's hearing brings, as well as hearing based on input from the community, uh, hearing about uh, how there's a lot. This is such an important item. Um, and we want to make sure that our community impacts are really, uh, the intentions of this are really clear in this bill and understood. So. And Mayor, if I may. Yes. Um, and thanks for the question, Councilmember Cummings, because there is always time sensitivity to these bills as they're making their way through uh, the committee process. Uh, so as already uh, has been mentioned today, um, there's a hearing scheduled tomorrow with the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. It will then, um, depending upon what changes are recommended through that uh, committee's review, we'll move on to the Appropriations Committee. So we did have an opportunity today to connect with our state uh, lobbyists and they recommended waiting to see what happens with tomorrow's hearing and that we will have time to weigh in on uh, influencing the bill as it moves on to appropriations. So we'll continue to track that closely and we can plan to, to have this back on for, for May 10th if that, if that made sense. So can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Do you have any sense of when this is supposed to be heard by the Appropriations Committee? Uh, that, uh, to my understanding, has not been scheduled yet, and it will depend on what type of changes come out of the, the uh, hearing with environmental quality. Uh, there are likely to be amendments that are made through that process, and that will determine when it will come forward to appropriations. Mayor, I have a question. Um, Council the, Member Myers. The only other option would be, and I don't know how we would register this based on what the mayor just stated, but um, I don't know if we could oppose unless amended, um, City Manager Huffaker, if just to just to go on record as opposed um, unless amended. And obviously, amendments are underway, um, and I know that. That probably can't be registered by tomorrow's meeting, but it could potentially just very simple letter. Um, that would be an alternative motion potentially, uh, Mayor, that could basically state that at this point, without further amendment, the bill won't work for us as 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 a city. That would be I would be willing to make that alternative motion or at least have that discussion if uh, my colleagues are interested. But I'm also I'm also um, in agreement that we can continue the item and most bills are most bills are in in session right now and they're uh, very busy time up there right now so um, I just that that might be a, another option to look at council member brown thank you mayor I, uh, I I just I was that was 
what I had raised my hand to put forward as a possibility. Um, no, 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 you were ahead of me. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I do think that, I mean, that is common practice. The League of Cities does this. Um, they, re they make recommendations all the time for local jurisdictions to uh, proceed in that fashion of either supporting or opposing uh, legislation um, as written or um, unless amended. And um, so my preference would be that we make that, uh, that statement today. We've known about this uh, committee hearing and that it was gonna be heard at this committee for a while now. Uh, what we don't know is what the nature of the amendments will be. I've heard some discussion about what is intended, but obviously there, um, that will be fully fleshed out tomorrow. Um, but my preference would be to take the position uh, today. We, uh, our staff has done a lot of preparation. Um, the kind of the conditions um, for uh, opposition uh, have not changed for me. And so my preference would be to move forward today with a motion to uh, support uh, this uh, with the, uh, I guess, a change of the language to include um, uh, that we're directing uh, the mayor to send a letter opposed. So I, if I, I guess I'll make the motion. Um, <laughs> unless, is there an official motion on the table? No. It's, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't gone out to the public. public. That's right. Okay. So no, I'm not going to make the, <laughs> I'm not going to make the motion yet, but I would like to see that happen uh, today and um, including language unless amended uh, seems appropriate. Any other questions on this item? I will go out to public comment. I will begin with members in Zoom. And if there are members in the public who would like to comment on public item, on this item number 12 on our agenda, you can sign in at the front to the right of the dais. So going out to attendees in Zoom with their hand raised, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. The first member of the public has the name Joseph Thompson. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, yeah, my name is Joe Thompson. Um, I am speaking to you guys on behalf of being a UC Santa Cruz student, working at our local Starbucks, um, and also as a candidate now for state assembly. Um, I'm asking you guys to really support um, SB 886 and not this motion. Um, the main reason behind it is because after taking the time to actually read the bill, um, I think it's not only a good bill, not only for students, but also any person who supports housing projects um, that favor affordable housing people, um, specifically low-income people such as myself. Um, and recently I submitted a letter to the council describing you know, specifically about how SB 886 will only exempt the individual projects from CEQA, not the guiding plans. Um, that determination really looks at the location, environmental like mitigations of university expansion. Um, the projects still have to comply with all sustainable building codes uh, of both the state and university standards. The CEQA exemption only streamlines the environmental review process for housing or university owned land um, that is not environmentally sensitive. So it still has most of CEQA intact. Um, it's just really streamlining the process um, and really making sure that you know, with, with the UC Santa Cruz students being, you know, over 9% um, are homeless. You know, we need to build affordable housing. And there was recently a housing project a few years back, which would have provided about 3,000 additional beds. Um, because of CEQA, this is still held, out, um, held up in the process because of this. Um, and SB 886 would really streamline that process to make sure we have beds and affordable housing for students on campus. Um, and recently, about two days ago, I went door knocking on campus, um, talking to people about the campaign and other issues. The biggest issue for students overall is affordable housing. Every single person I talked to, their main concern was affordable housing. Um, and it's really because this issue not only hits home, but also really affects students' mental health, their ability to educate and learn themselves. Students should not have to worry about affordable housing in a city like Santa Cruz and not have to worry about affordable housing while going to school. Um, so again, I urge the council to support SB 886 um, and against, you know, item, agenda item number 12. Um, specifically, Rob Bernie and I are supporting uh, SB 886. So we would really appreciate you guys to move forward with us and look forward at really taking the time to not only look through the actual bill and really understand the environmental impacts associated with it, 
um, not just, you know, taking a, a stance um, to look like we're supporting, you know, the, the populations that need it the most. Um, so again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate the council considering this motion. Um, and I appreciate and hopefully you guys will vote for SB 886. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public has the name Zane Sanchez. Welcome, Zane. Hi. Um, I would like to speak uh, from the perspective of another UCSC student, which I am. And um, I urge you all to support uh, UCSC campus housing. I actually was um, affected by uh, the lack of housing in Santa Cruz. I was, unfortunately, um, pushed into homelessness in a way luckily i had family that lived nearby but i saw many other people who had to leave the area or who had to stay in motels for uh multiple weeks and i as well as uh other people who were in my same position were did not have the ability to stop looking for housing it was a continuous search all the time so i do think it's important that we do increase the um student housing on campus and for the council members that say that they support uh, that idea but not specifically the bill i do hope that you in the future i do see your support for uh, other bills that encourage student housing thank you thank you our next member of the public zenin yoliate crow Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm a first year politics major and president of the Student Housing Coalition at UCSC. And I really wanna thank you all today for the dialogue around this motion. Uh, it's really important to us as an organization as we are co-authoring the bill and really looking at the UCSC situation. This is where this bill was born out of. Um, really to go over some quick things, uh, only in this year, uh, only about 65% of freshman applicants to a UC were admitted compared to 84% in 1990. We've seen that across the state, UCs have been affected by the lack of ability to build student housing on campuses, and that's resulting in our access to opportunity and access to education decreasing significantly. And so when we talk about the bill today before you, uh, we really wanna make clear that this bill does not exempt uh, the long range development plans from CEQA. Currently, universities have prepared California Environmental Quality Act reports for both the long range development plans and each project under those plans, but SB 886 only exempts the individual projects from CEQA, not the guiding plans that determine the location and environment mitigations of university expanses. We see that you know having LRDPs as a process for local input, legally enforceable local input is really important in the process of building student housing. And so we really want to safeguard that and as said, allow for uh, those LRDPs through the settlement process to be carried out as right now, what you'll have is individual projects being proposed and then sued even while they're trying to carry out the original LRDPs that were sued and settled under. And so really what we're asking today is we know we've received a lot of really good feedback on this bill and we've taken those considerations and we're hoping to introduce a lot of different amendments uh, at the committee tomorrow. And so what we're asking is maybe we could potentially pursue a support if amended to position to go ahead and, you know, take into account a lot of the things people are saying in terms of wanting to directly tie uh, student housing to things that to making sure it is incorporated under the long range development plans and to making sure there are adequate in, you know mitigation measures when it comes to construction when it comes to traffic management uh, and when it comes to reducing our greenhouse gas and gas emissions and VMT uh, miles traveled so I really implore you guys to please uh, go ahead and support this bill uh, with amendments today uh, and Keep in mind that you know while we make these decisions while we uh push for these bills there are nine percent of students at uc santa cruz homeless and 20 percent of community college students are homeless so it's it's not a problem that doesn't go but go away by the day uh, so i really appreciate you for the time and thank you so much 
Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Ray Diaz. Good afternoon, uh, City Council. Uh, thank you again for allowing me to speak. Uh, so kind of just echoing some of the remarks that some of uh, my fellow students have made. I am as well a student at UCSC, first year politics major. Uh, and, and I do want to bring it back to the issue that SB 886 uh, would only solve uh, a problem that has been ongoing for, for years now. Uh, a lot of electives have been asking for a solution and here it is. Here is a solution that students have brought forward and have taken all the way to the state legislature, have taken time out of our days, long hours, long nights, to present a state bill that can genuinely solve a problem that really impacts, going back to the issue, low-income BIPOC students who are directly impacted by housing and security. We just finished up with campus elections here at UCSC, and the biggest issue that we heard all around throughout this campus, throughout the 17,000 undergraduate students, was that housing is the biggest issue and knowing that they want to have secure housing going and moving forward. Uh, so I urge this council to also support SBA 86 and go more in depth into law and into the, into, the, into the bill and read into uh, what's actually the language uh, pertaining to the CEQA guidelines. Uh, but appreciate your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and I urge this council to support SBA 86. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Bodhi Shargol. Welcome. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you to the council for hearing public comment as always. Um, my name is Bodhi Shargell. I'm a first year student at UCSC, um, a co-chair of the YDSA, which includes the Student Housing Coalition, um, as well as a lifelong Santa Cruz County uh, resident. I'm actually on campus right now. Um, I, I dipped out of a lecture to, to make this comment, so I'll try and keep this uh, as quick as I can. Um, I'm urging the council, um, like everyone else, to support SB 886. Um, this is really important to the whole issue of housing um, in Santa Cruz County. Um, the, it seems like the conversation often goes where someone says that we need more affordable housing in the county, then someone's in opposition to that. They bring up something about students making housing more expensive. And that's true. Students do make housing more expensive along with the incredible economic impact that they bring to our community. Um, and they say that students should be living on campus. And I completely agree with that. But the fact of the matter is that there's not enough housing on campus for all the students um, because of uh, things like sequel lawsuits. Um, so SB 886 is the next logical step to addressing this problem that students can't find housing on campus. The fact of the matter is that we need more housing on campus if we want to solve the housing crisis in Santa Cruz. And if you, if someone will have that previous conversation and then not support SB 886, I, I can't then go and believe that they're pro-housing. If you, if you have that conversation and then you oppose SB 886, the fact of the matter is to me, you're not a progressive. You're not pro-housing. Um, you don't want to improve housing in the community. So I, I was really disappointed by the result um, with the County Board of Supervisors um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I'm urging the council here to support SB 886. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Reggie. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I guess this comment is really to like the broader public um, who might be on this call. Um, this is an issue where <clears throat> I feel like we need to support the students um, in their call to make this change to the regulations because I know that there's like concerns about the environment and sometimes these concerns are legitimate, but historically they really have not been. And the housing situation, just from my like uh, small amount of experience at knowing a couple students, is truly dystopian on campus. Um, people are crowded; they're paying way too much money. And it's true that uh, if the the campus UC system is using this housing 
in a very unethical way a lot of the time. Uh, they're charging market rate rents that are totally unaffordable to students. And it is within their uh, incentives to make this housing unaffordable. Um, but, you know, that's just the situation. It's better for us to build this housing. Um, we've already got, hopefully, the empty home tax to put pressure on uh, the housing to be, like, a little bit lower price and not hold a lot of vacancies. So we have to, like, have at least the resource there, uh, and then we can fight for it to be more affordable. But as it stands, CEQA has been used to just stop all production. And we have to get past this. And we have to, as like a left-wing constituency, be united here uh, and not get, like some of us, you know, don't have the same sort of urgency on this issue, just as some of us don't have the same urgency on defund police or abolition. But we have to respect the urgency of some of our, uh, you know, folks of different communities and we have to push for it as though it is our issue as well. So thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next member of the public is Philip Boutel. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> I just want to echo, I'll just say I'm a local resident. I'm a homeowner. I'm a landlord. Um, and. I support what that earlier caller said that the council is going to take a position today. I think that instead of saying you, uh, you know, are against it unless amended, you should say support unless amended because this is really a solution driven bill and we're all after solutions. And, um, you know, all bills go through the legislature and they come up with amendments to make them a little better as people, you know, come up with the fix the kinks and stuff. And this is a great opportunity to have that input and find out what do we want. Um, because like the previous, another caller said, this still keeps most of CEQA intact. It still has the environmental protections intact. Permits are still required, et cetera. It just makes it a little quicker. And uh, we really need that more than anything. So I'm hoping you will take the support um, if amended position, if you are gonna take a position today. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Are there any members in the chamber that would like to comment on agenda item number 12, please step forward. Hi again, council members, Ed Porter, resident of Santa Cruz. And I think I, I'm pleased with the debate that has taken place here and the discussion that you would consider uh, amending or revisiting in, in at the next meeting, presumably. But um, I'm delighted that Council Member Myers and Council Member Brown, Council Member Conning supported some statement of importance along with that today. And I think that can be gotten to our legislators, especially our local ones, uh, t in a timely fashion for tomorrow's hearings in Sacramento. So that's that's a great step. But I really believe uh, that CEQA is being the whipping boy in this housing problem. It's not a CEQA problem. It's a problem of UCSC since it was founded in Santa Cruz and probably all the other campuses too, but certainly here I know about that. Certainly here, UCSC has failed to ever provide housing for even 50% of the students who attend the campus. And the rest are thrown into this city, and now there's pressure to build here, build there, and oh, by the way, let's build more on campus, which is an obvious solution, and throw out CEQA. What a ridiculous thing. Well, I'll just tell you, historically, it's hard to look at California and understand why that's a bad thing. But just read some history of the United States, especially looking at New York, where housing has been a, a a major issue and a major problem for more than 100 years. And in fact, before any of us were born, huge tenements were built in the city of New York under the same kinds of concepts as throwing out CEQA, forget environmental quality, forget uh, any impediments, just because developers told a lie 
that we couldn't build because environmental quality was held in too high of a standard, in too high of a uh, level of importance. CEQA is critically important, and I just want to remind, I, I support the students who say, yes, there's a housing problem. I agree wholeheartedly. But to corner me and to say, as one, one of the callers just said, that uh, if I'm not in favor of Senate Bill 886, the, that I'm not with them. Well, I'm sorry, that's wrong. I am with them. They deserve, as they have said, to have affordable housing and to have adequate numbers of units so that there are no homeless students. Of course. How could we disagree? We agree. But CEQA is not the culprit here. The culprit here is the university, as I said, that forever has not provided the housing. And this bill should be targeted to that problem and not targeting CEQA. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members here in the chambers that would like to speak to this item number 12 on our agenda? Hi, Matilda Rand. Um, I'm very much in favor of you opposing 866 and possibly looking for the uh, amendments. Um, I agree with Ed Porter when he says that CEQA is not a problem. CEQA has been helping California quite a bit. So off the bat, we cannot just do away with a proven uh, legislation and an act that has helped us both locally and throughout the state. Uh, I am uh, very disappointed with some of the statements that the students made. Um, I do believe that, no, I don't believe, I know we have a housing problem. And the housing problem is not just for students. I am looking at my students who grew up here in our county and can't find any housing <clears throat> or uh, decent uh, jobs that pay them enough to afford the housing. So we need to look at the overall picture of what are we doing for housing? How are we create, creating more housing? How do we get people off the street? I think we need to really have a, um, a comprehensive plan and not just because students at this point are screaming, we need housing, we need housing, and they have a bullhorn and they have people running for assembly. Um, it, that's not the solution to the problem. The problem is we are not phasing and not um, heading on straightforward the housing problem. Let's build a plan, a comprehensive plan. Do not uh, approve or um, be complicit with any bill that says, well, we need housing there, so we'll just lax the, um, the requirements for them. Uh, CEQA is not here for nothing. So please um, continue with your conversation that I really enjoyed. And um, I would say vote for the opposing of uh, the 866 with the uh, inclusion of possible amendments. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have Zoom attendee Mitra Zarinabaf. If you'd like to press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Mitra. Apologies if my internet is making my voice a little scraggly. Um, I'm a th third year student at UC Santa Cruz and legislative director for the Student Union Assembly. I have lived at Santa Cruz for the past three years and I'm here in support of SB 886. Um, I do want to add that the housing crisis is, of course, insane in Santa Cruz and all throughout the UCs, especially UCs that are in small uh, towns. Um, but CEQA, for the last decade, the UCs have had to face these CEQA lawsuits and theatered um, specific housing that is meant to expand students and also ensure that the environment is being taken care of. Uh, specific examples are theater living in the UCS UCSE, UCLA Extension at UCLA, Student Housing West here at Santa Cruz, People's Park at UC Berkeley, and Aggie Square at UC Davis. I also want to add that this, the SB 886 is still um, taking consideration of the environment. It does not want to 
erase CEQA entirely with those environmental standardizations. Um, SBA 6 is currently having uh, added positions to ensure that there's still environmental quotas and regulations to ensure that we aren't destroying the land that we're on. Um, it's to simply create a streamlined process for housing of students. As an RA2, um, I would like to add that over 500 people applied to this position, and we can only accept about 40% of them. And the um, insane amount of people that did apply is due to the housing crisis that we have here and that we haven't been able to build student housing on campus. So um, I'm here again in support of SB 86, and I'm greatly, greatly asking that you also support SB 86 in the consideration of students and future students at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. You did cut in and out a little bit, but I think uh, we were able to get the majority of your comment. Our next member of the public via Zoom is Hunter G. Welcome. Hello. Um, thank you for discussing this here today um, to the council members. And I just really love the um, inspiring comments from our community members. Um, but yeah, I'm a community member here at Santa Cruz, and I just really want to urge the council to support Senate Bill 886 and also support it if amended. Um, some of the two communities here in U in Santa Cruz um, are the workers and people who are trying to work here and find something that's affordable. And then, of course, the students that we've all heard. Um, I've seen time and time again in a lot of these meetings, a lot of the workers coming in and saying, hey, like we need more housing on UC Santa Cruz campus. They're competing with all of the local rental renters here, like finding rental units. Um, so one of the projects like Student Housing West and just like other future projects that are slated um, could actually alleviate like two to 3,000 more students like units being built. Um, just think about that process and like two to 3,000 less people competing for rental units um, with the workers here and people who were locals here in Santa Cruz but are being slowly pushed out further and further into other communities along with the students. So it's really one of those times like where I've talked to a lot of people and I, I also am on a lot of the stuff for like the long range development plan talk to a lot of people who go to those and community members. And this is the one thing that we're all generally like really supportive of. Um, I think there's been some confusion and some of the other community members opposing it, saying that it's gonna like somehow get rid of CEQA, but really it's in a way like focusing the importance of the LRDP and CEQA because it still upholds all of the CEQA laws. So I don't understand why there's confusion there because um, it's not at all like getting rid of CEQA laws. Um, those are still a very strong thing in the LRDP. Um, so I totally support Senate Bill 886, and I really hope um, the council members do as well if amended, because um, it's one of those times where all of the community is just kind of watching this, and we're like, yeah, we want more housing built. So we're just hoping that these council members and you guys um, kind of help fulfill that pro promise and just like seeing who we're going to, like vote for in the future election this year um, based on this because there's a lot of attention brought to this meeting today. So um, yeah, so I just really appreciate it and um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Benjamin Breen. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I, I would just like to say um, thank you to the City Council for, for um, listening to the voices of students on this issue. And um, I'm a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz. I know this is a divisive issue, but I really want to say that the Student Housing Coalition and the movement for housing on campus has been bringing a lot of needed change. And I think it's important to listen to them on this. I believe that there are people on both sides with valid points. However, the inaction on housing, especially the inaction on building housing on campus is inexcusable and we need to do better. So I, I, th I think it's sending the wrong message to oppose this bill. And I urge you to reconsider that, move, that motion. Thank you very much, bye. Thank you for your comment. It looks like that concludes our public comment. 
I will now bring it back to council. And we have uh, council member Brown, who I believe is ready to make a motion. I am. I was too ready before. <laughs> I am ready now. I want to thank uh, members of the public for speaking. And I will. I do have some comments to make. But uh, first, I'd, I'd like to make a motion that uh, to direct the mayor to send a letter opposing uh, Senate Bill 886 which would exempt University of California on-campus housing developments from complying with the California Envi Environmental Quality Act with the addition of uh, opposition unless amended. Can you clarify that, please? Uh, so it, it's a, it's a, I'm just trying to use a, tr a standard phrase that is used in, when uh, oppose unless amended. Um, that it just is used by um, community constituents, the pu general public, when they are weighing in on legislation. Um, so that's just the, the standard language that's used. Um, oppose unless amended is the, so I guess it would be send a letter opposing Senate Bill 886 unless amended. Uh, I have a question for city attorney maybe. Um, so a motion like that to uh, oppose the bill unless amended would mean if it were to be amended, it would we would have the opportunity to uh, come back with that item. Correct. I, I would I would think so. Um, I am familiar with instances in which, for instance, the League of California Cities takes a position to oppose unless amended in a certain way. It might be useful to have, you know, to give some thought to how uh, the city would support it if it were amended. But um, uh, presumably, if that was the limit of the council's motion and it is amended, then we can bring it back to the council for consideration at a future time. I guess my clarification also, um, considering that it could go through several amendments, how that process would look like. Would we be reviewing it each time it's amended? Or as a standard phrase, what does that actually mean? What's the definition? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I, I think um, just as the council was discussing this, I did, I did go on to the legislature's website and put in the information to track the bill so that if it is amended, um, I'll get notification. And other council members, if you're interested, can do that as well. Just plug, you know, just Google the, the bill number and it'll take you directly to the, the legislature's web page where they, tr where they have all that information. And Mayor, if I may, um, the staff report also makes clear a number of concerns related to the existing bill in its current form. So I, I think what I would suggest, and as I interpret Councilmember Brown's request, would be unless amended based on the concerns raised uh, in that staff report. And, uh, City Attorney's point, we will continue to closely track this bill as it moves through, and if appropriate, um, if there's additional action that the council may want to weigh in on, we could certainly bring it back at a, at a future date. Thank you for that clarification. So we have a motion by Council Member Brown to oppose. This is on item number 12 on our uh, consent agenda, to oppose Senate Bill 886 unless amended. And is there a second? I'll second that. We have a second by Council Member Myers, and now we're open for discussion. I was wondering if I could make a friendly amendment with my vote and with my second, which would be um, adding language to the motion that um, city's uh, current stance is opposed unless amended, reflecting the issues um, brought up in the staff in the staff report. Letter would reflect that. So, uh, yeah, I think you mean the, the agenda report. I'm sorry, the since agenda we report. we did sign yes. that agenda yes. report. Yes. Yes. But can I just ask for clarification? Um, I assume the motion is that to direct the mayor to send a letter expressing the council's opposition, unless amended to reflect the concerns raised in the in the agenda report. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. 
just had some comments. Um, I, I think it's premature for us to send this message. I think that this item uh, deserves more conversation and a presentation. Uh, we heard from some community members. I'm sure there are other community members who would like to weigh in. Um, I won't belabor the points about the homelessness and the housing crisis. I know we all know that, but I think if it's not urgent and our decision isn't going to impact what's going to happen in committee tomorrow, it doesn't feel um, right for us to take a position right now. Uh, we haven't, this was on consent, we haven't had a formal presentation, and um, it just seems premature and rushed. Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. So I just have <clears throat> some comments, um, you know, and I'll, also I want to say that um, Council Member Brown, Council Member Myers, and myself have both sat on the UCSC task force for two years up until we dissolved it earlier this year. And so this is something that we've been tracking and working on and following, getting input from the community on for quite some time. <clears throat> I just want to first start by, you know, expressing that, one, I am a renter and, you know, so this, you know, the housing crisis directly impacts me because um, with my income, I don't have an opportunity to buy a house in this community anytime soon. Um, I've fought for things like rent control, which have failed, but, you know, we've continued to move forward with approving many affordable housing projects, trying to increase the amount of affordable housing in our new developments. And one thing I just really want to point out um, to the students and members of public who called in um, regarding this item is that I totally agree with that, you know, we need to provide more affordable housing and that campus also needs to provide more affordable housing. But the concern I have, and this is coming from myself being an environmental scientist, is that one, um, there's a, a real slippery slope that you start, um, you know, that you get on if you start making exceptions to CEQA. Because if we make exceptions for the university, then developers are gonna say, well, I'm trying to put in housing in these areas. I know that the community needs housing. You should exempt us from CEQA. Then affordable housing developers will say, you should exempt us from CEQA. Then small um, people who are single family homeowners who may wanna you know, build on their lots. I mean, obviously they're exempt from CEQA, but I think the point is that we wanna be careful with starting to have these exemptions from CEQA um, because we can end up on a real slippery slope where we completely undermine the purpose of CEQA, which is to protect our natural environment. And so um, I just want to say that, but I think the big issue that's come up as well is that the concern that's been raised by students is the lack of affordable housing, and that's something that the campus is not providing. And so I think what would be really good for us to do is figure out how we can push the state to provide more affordable housing on campuses and make that funding available so that students aren't rent burdened and paying some of the highest prices for housing with the least amount of, of square space in our community. And then I just wanted to point out um, one other thing that was in the agenda report so it's clear to the public that at the University of California Santa Cruz since 1985, over nine student housing developments have been approved with EIRs and four approved with negative declarations. The only, only the 2018 Housing West EIR has been legally challenged. CEQA has only delayed this one UCSC housing project and remains an integral part of development within and around the community. So I just want to point that out that this, that CEQA hasn't delayed, you know, tens of projects for housing that have come forward. It's only delayed one project at UCSC. And so I don't think that we need to be in support of a state law that's gonna have sweeping impacts across the entire state and further remove local control. So um, I am very, I, I think that the comments that have been brought up are really important for us to take into consideration. Um, and I very much look forward to working with the students on campus so we can figure out how to bring more affordable housing into Santa Cruz. But, but as this bill currently states, is currently stated, I don't think that um, it's actually gonna have the intended outcome that the students are, are anticipating with this bill allowing for the production of more affordable housing on campus. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I just, well, I'll add, and uh, this is gonna be brief, but a little bit repetitive because I do wanna drive the point home here. Um, the University of California has not in my, to my knowledge, ever built a unit of affordable housing. The only reason there was affordable housing on the University of California Santa Cruz campus was because of uh, 
campus community driven effort to develop a trailer park there that provided some affordable housing. There is no affordable housing on the UC campus. Uh, this legislation would not lead to the production of affordable housing on the UC campus. And while it might uh, lead to more housing getting developed, um, even that I believe is in question. The UN UCSC has not, does not build housing. There is a housing crisis for students in our community and it's rippled out into uh, the community at large because the University of California does not build housing and they will not commit to building housing. This body ha is, has entered into a lawsuit as a result of their failure to commit to building housing. So I think that we are clearly committed to that, um, that happening. It is not CEQA that is preventing the development of housing on the UC campuses. I recognize that there have been lawsuits that have delayed housing projects and I recognize that that is frustrating. I am frustrated by it as well. However, using a blunt instrument like the elimination of all entire environmental review um, to address a problem that is really much broader than the question of CEQA, and it's a problem with housing production. So if, and I am very happy to work side by side with you, um, take your lead, students um, in going to the UC Regents, going to the state of California and saying, we demand that you provide the resources to build that housing. Um, that's what we need. That's how housing is gonna get built. And um, I'll leave it there. Um, I, I think that my colleagues, uh, Council Member Myers and Council Member Cummings, and I, you know, the three of us, uh, we're, we spent many, many hours in meetings, developing a strategy to try to avoid a lawsuit uh, to push the university to build housing, to house its students on campus. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of my, uh, the issues around the LRDP, concerns about the LRDP being the only level of review for projects. Um, those who wanna talk about that, I'm happy to do that offline. Um, but I think that uh, making that a clear statement, and although our uh, letter wouldn't necessarily go into the record, the public record, um, I am quite sure that the message will be delivered to the committee uh, if we make this decision today. So, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Myers. Yeah, um, just wanted to do a, just a couple of comments. Um, I want to thank the students. I talked to a couple of students today, um, and I appreciate the Student Housing Coalition leadership. They've really... Um, they continue to bring up and bring forward their concerns as members of this community around their choices for housing. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, I had a pretty uh, long conversation with one of the advocates involved in the organization and, and we had a very productive conversation around um, the difficulty in pushing a bill such as SB 886 in a one year frame, time frame. Um, I mean, changing anything having to do with CEQA typically would be completely hands off. Nobody in the million years would ever touch something like that. Um, this bill is trying to change um, the dynamic around the expediency of trying and the predictability of um, actually getting housing built on UC campuses throughout the state. Um, that's a, just a very ambitious thing to do. It's a very complicated thing to do. Um, and that's why I think at this point today, may change May 10th when this comes back, I think a very safe place for us to land as a community right now, just as a council, excuse me, right now, would be to oppose unless amended. I think we have brought up um, some good things in the agenda report. Um, and there are things that we have continued to, to negotiate with UCSC on, such as binding mitigations, uh, around providing housing, um, even binding mitigations with regards to transportation demand management. So again, without having any land use authority over what you see University of California can do on their own property, we as a, as a community, we as a city council have to advocate for the kinds of things that we would typically do if we were looking at a, you know, a similar development within the city. So um, I think these are healthy conversations to be handing, having, and I don't think anyone authors a bill like um, SB 886 
knowing that they're not going to be going through a lot of amendments and they're going to be hearing from a lot of different sides. Um, I really appreciate um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson's um, recognition that you know this is a moving this is a moving target still, and for us to oppose today does feel very final. And I do think if we can you know if we can use if amended and then explain the kinds of things that we would like to see, I think that puts us in a position where we're still at the table. And as a community that has a University of California campus in it, um, I actually asked some of the some of the authors of the bill who had said they were involved. I said, well, how much community outreach did you do with the cities who have UC campuses in them? And they actually said that they had been in conversation with several of those cities. So. I think this is an important bill. It may provide some assurity of not necessarily the affordability of the, camp, of, of the housing, but certainly the production of housing in the future. That's of great interest to me as a city council member because we do want to see that practice be more productive on campus. But um, I'm hoping that this feels like a safe um, step in one direction and on learning more about where the amendments are going in the next two weeks. Um, we bring it back and ha continue to have the conversation, but we at least have an opposition on record. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Myers. Um, I guess I will uh, comment as well briefly. Um, so my initial uh, suggestion on pulling this item and postponing it uh, to a future or our next council meeting, depending on timing of where the bill is and any uh, potential amendments as it's in progress uh, and process. Um, I think one of the, the uh, my understanding based on uh, all the information um, up to this moment is that the CEQA exemption in this bill would not apply to the long-range development plan. And in the agenda report, it also outlines um, where it would not apply it, uh, uh, um, to specific areas um, that are environmentally uh, sensitive areas and where there would be impact. And so um, this CEQA exemption would um, apply to individual student housing projects, but not the overall long-range development plan and the overall uh, environmental impact reports there. So um, my understanding is that uh, this could be uh, a way for the the community. What's important is that our our local impacts are voiced and that analyzed and understood and that is the benefit of having CEQA and environmental impact reports uh, and that's really important to include and that uh, opportunity would be there in the long-range development plan um, although I'm hearing from Councilmember Brown that um, that's not an adequate uh, 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 to have that as the only level of review. And so it seems that this this bill would provide an additional layer of environmental impact for individual housing projects underneath the entire long-range development plan and, and overall plan where those environmental impacts have, have been stated and defined already. So... Um, at this point, um, we have a motion on the floor we, by Councilmember Brown and a second by Councilmember Myers. Are there any other last minute comments before we go to a roll call vote? I would like to um, call on Councilmember Cummings. I just had a question in terms of the, the motion because I was wondering um, if it was included in the motion that this would be re revisited. Um, if the that we would be able to revisit our position if amended, so I was just wondering if that's part of the motion. I didn't say it in in the motion explicitly, um, but I, I think that it was kind of implicit that that would happen, and and council members can certainly bring it back at any point. Okay. Yep. 
Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Were you were you not done? I was just gonna I was gonna say like if if that's the case, then like I was I was gonna make a friendly amendment, but if it's implied that this would come back if amended, um, I guess my only question would be, um, I guess that direction doesn't need to be provided, and and it would come back. Okay, so. No, I think we hear that intent in the motion. Okay. Great. That's all. That, Thank you. That ends my comments. Thank you for clarifying that, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I was going to ask the same question to make the same friendly amendment, um, but I do also want to get clarity when it does come back. Uh, in the staff report, we talk about how many projects here at UCSC have been delayed, but I'd like to look across the UCs in the state of California. Um, and see what the impacts have been. And then I would like to have more clarity on um, that that this is not exempt from LRDP CEQA. And um, this bill proposes to potentially remove a duplicative layer. And I, and I don't know that that's actually correct, but I'd like to get some clarity on that when it comes back. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you. I want to thank everybody for the discussion. I haven't weighed in. I know we're still on consent, um, and I appreciate just having the time to really discuss this, but I also know we'll have further opportunity to do so. I just also want to, at kind of a larger meta level, just remember, you know, this is sort of the process. It's iterative, and it's, and it's an opportunity for us to weigh in. I appreciate the direction we're going in, that we're signaling to the legislation that we want to see amendments made, that we want them to... Um, and I'm happy to hear that they've reached out to different jurisdictions who have universities in their town to understand the impacts. I think that work is really critical, um, but I don't think we also want to remain silent on the issue either. So, um, you know, I'll leave my comments there and, and, and appreciate the conversation and the, and the direction we have at this, at this time. Thank you. Councilmember one. Council Member Cummings. I'm just wondering as well when this comes back if there's um, if staff might be able to bring some information on just general information on campus housing financing so people can understand um, because I mean it sounds like you know the university isn't responsible for building housing and oftentimes it's for-profit developers but I think there's some misunderstanding in the community that by building by the university being able to be exempt from CEQA and build more housing that they can build affordable housing on campus which they're not doing and so I think it's important that the community understands how housing is built on campus, I think, to Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's point, you know, what does CEQA look like on campus as it relates to the LRDP and individual projects? And I think that'll help clarify, not only for the community, but for, you know, newer members of the council, kind of, you know, what are the different constraints around building housing on campus? Uh, thanks for the question, Councilmember Cummings, and we can certainly do more research into that. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Last thing I promise. Um, can we not have this on consent so we can have a, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kalantari, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And Council Member Myers. Is that, was that a formal uh, amendment or just a direction oh. to staff? Because either way, it, either way, I'm, I'm happy to accept. Think of it. it's, it sounds like it's in, um, the intention, uh, yeah, staff's got it, yeah, okay. So I, I don't need. I, I don't appreciate need to make the request. I just. I just want to make sure that this isn't drifting into a discussion about affordable. I mean, I, it's, it's the University of California. It's not the city of Santa Cruz. So I don't think it's. It is not our job to um, oversee the development of affordable housing on the University of California's campus. And so I think it's just important that we understand our lane. Um, and as someone who used to write CEQA documents at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for <laughs> projects that were developed there <laughs> 25 years ago, um, you know, I mean, University of California has to follow CEQA just like any other applicant. So, um, you know, I think what, what this bill is trying to do is recognize that at the project level, which is where I think you get a little squirrely, is that, you know, efficiencies in CEQA may be, uh, may be be used to, again, try to keep development moving rather than tied up in court. So I think there's just, doing that is just a very difficult legislative outcome. Um, it's a very surgical approach and it's not gonna, it's, it, you know, that's why I think we really need to wait and see where these amendments are going. It may be that the bill comes to a place where we can, you know, support it. But, um, you know, CEQA's just a tool. It, 
it doesn't have anything to do with affordability or anything else. Um, CEQA is, has not, it's agnostic about whether you're building a mansion or you're building, you know, whatever. So its job is just to look at the environmental component to what, what happens at the community at large. So I think, you know, I'm supportive of, of, the, mo of the staff, you know, having staff look at these, but I, I don't want to send our staff into looking at affordable housing on, on campuses because I just don't think that's a good use of our staff time, <laughs> frankly. So, um, you know, we can have the university come and talk to us about that if, if we'd like to understand their financing and structures better. But I just feel like we've kind of gotten a little off topic on the, on the amendment, which is really a CEQA case today. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Sorry, I, I just want to make one more comment. I, I agree with account, Council Member Myers, um, but I think, you know, I just want to go back to the uh, suggestion that Council Member Cummings is making, and I think it's more, and it's not about understanding, um, you know, the, the big picture financing and affordable housing questions and mechanisms for affordable housing per se, but it's, um, it is important to have information about you know, for example, the P3 model and what that does to housing, the rate, rental rates on campus in a conversation where the predominant argument we're hearing uh, is uh, we want you to um, support the elimination of CEQA for housing projects because we need affordable housing. I think it is important as just a piece of, to, to understand that. And so it's not, I'm, I'm not getting it as a, like a big research project or, uh, moving in a different, you know, out, outside of this lane, but just understanding a little bit more about, um, well, really, that's, I mean, for me, it's like, I know that's not what's happening, and it would just be nice to have that as part of the picture as we consider future action. Thank you, Council Member Brown. All right, are we ready uh, for a roll call vote on the motion that is on the floor? Okay, uh, may we have a roll call vote, please? Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Apparently absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes six uh, and one absent. Council Member Golder absent. Okay, so now we are at, uh, let me get to my agenda. Yeah, we did. We are, uh, that concludes our consent agenda, and now we are moving into consent public hearings. These are items number 22 through 25 on our agenda, and I will just reiterate that I have recused myself from item number 25, so we will begin with items number 22 through 24, and then I will step out of the room for item number 25. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on items number 22 through 24, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon unless an item is pulled by council member for further discussion. Are there any council members that wish to comment on or pull items 21 through 24? Okay, seeing none. I will now pull up the agenda one moment. Can I ask a question? Council Member Cummings. Um, so the City Attorney, do we, since items numbers 22 through 25 are on the consent public hearing, do we need to poll 25 so that the mayor can step out since she's recusing herself? I understood the mayor was, was dealing with only uh, up to item 24 at this time so that the council can consider that separately. 
just confirm, are you pulling 25 then? Okay. I'm not pulling it uh, unless I need to officially pull it if that's what it takes to recuse myself. I've recused myself from item 25. I have to physically leave the room uh, for that item, so. You could vote on it separately even if it's not pulled. I think that's maybe the direction you're going. So. We'll vote on it separately? Yes, we'll vote on it separately and Vice Mayor Watkins will take over item number 25. Okay, at this time, members of the public that would like to speak on any consent, public hearing items 21 through 24, now is the time to call in and raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. And when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. First, I will bring it out to uh, council members for any questions. Can I just confirm it's item 22 through 24, not 21? Thank you. Items 22 through 24. Okay. I will bring it out to public comment. Are there any members of the public in the chambers that would like to comment? Okay, thank you. Let's see if there are attendees in Zoom. We have one caller uh, with their hand raised, phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Yes, members of the community, including council, um, this is Robert Norris of Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. This is uh, item 24 is the second reading of an ordinance that should actually be getting a full agenda item and not just this sort of what I feel is a rather artificial and public excluding consent agenda, public agenda, which has never used in past years, at least not uh, in, uh, in my memory. Um, this is a way of streamlining the agenda as a way of redlining the public out. And I'm pleased that Mayor Bruner has restored some of the public comment on agenda items in the last few minutes, but I hope that she restores this uh, this change restores the public hearings to public hearings when we have real laws that require decent second readings. Um, there's no justification for this law in terms of the uh, actual arrests or real citations that were indicated around the whole issue of public gatherings. It's a dangerous period in our national and local history when awareness produced protest against established, inadequate, overreaching, or simply illegitimate institutions. Now, you may favor or oppose Black Lives Matter movement, the vaccine mandate protests, homeless civil rights and service demands, or whatever, but it seems that clear that governments, both local and distant, are concerned, as they were in 2011 during the Occupy movement, in shutting down protests. This, would, this is the kind of thing that this does. It contains them so tightly they no longer have any meaning. I'm surprised the ACLU hasn't registered concern. I hope that it will at some point. Uh, again, the specific problems here are that this is an anti-food, not bombs ordinance. And it has to do with, it adds specifics about 25% uh, of the usable area or city park, beach, or open space uh, and on a regular basis. If you're occupying it, even though nobody else is occupying it at the time and nobody needs to or wants to, and the community would like it, Nonetheless, this ordinance can be used to go after people, and I've heard it argued that it can be used to, well, it certainly can be used by a new provision to allow, to establish a public nuisance just by fiat if you're found uh, to have violated any of the ordinance provisions. Spontaneous demonstrations, as Garrett Phillips pointed out last time, are allowed only at town clock and the city hall, which is ridiculous. And also, it simply won't work. People will ignore this and show disrespect for uh, it as they should. But why, why provoke that? That seems to me to be wrong. I mean, have you been aware that any permits have been sought or demanded for the last two years, nor needed? I have not. So I'm surprised that, well, I'm not surprised with this council, frankly, uh, but I think that the, the community <laughs> may be surprised with me. Uh, so this city's farewell to the food not bombs latest assault promises 
more legal problems for the community and it violates the rights and needs of the unhoused community uh, which is of course why i'm really bothering to speak to a, a group that really has made up its mind and sort of rubber stamped this thing from the beginning you may rubber stamp it but i don't think the police would necessarily appreciate what you're doing although who knows i don't know where this ordinance actually came from it's not really clear since stats about permit violations. I don't know if you heard the buzzer, but um, if you could finish your sentence, that would be great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I didn't. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public via Zoom is Garrett Phillip. Okay, thank you. I hope everyone read the item 23 long letter I sent in on this green fee item. I noticed the details of the fee increase are omitted for today, but it was set last meeting to four times the previous rate, which is outrageous. And the number of public employees receiving compensation from this fee source also increased, including a few that never spend a minute behind the building or playing department counter talking to citizens. It adds many thousands to the price of even a modest housing project. There is a serious dialogue that needs to occur between the public and the city government about the need for rational justifications for fees, as in who pays how much and why. Your record of ignoring the need for connecting the dots between your need for money and justification of what city service the city delivers to the actual fee payer isn't perfect. I cite the disconnected rationale behind the child care developer impact fee. These green building fees are not a fee for a service provided builders and that they do not benefit from them. There is no justification why educational seminars or travel junkets for public benefit should not be paid by taxes, but by select individuals just because you can extort money from them or no house for you. The educational fund aspect of this fee is a dodge. It also pays other city expenses like salaries of general public benefit from this fee instead of by tax dollars. The hiring of a green building expert says something more about your regulations, not the incompetence of normal compliance personnel, or perhaps the need for private sector green certified designers. The fee also indiscriminately falls onto everyone getting a building permit, whether they need help or not. These fees lack a direct service benefit to builders, but instead enforces your vision of eco community benefit, dictating green materials and design elements that must be included at a considerable cost, a loss of liberty, and cost to them, and then charges them outrageously extra for that, whether they ask questions or not. This is like if the IRS charged to file tax returns. When will you start charging to talk to any public employee paid by tax dollars that works for the public benefit? If you want money for public benefit, you go to the people to vote on it. If they say no, you just don't get to do that extra you wanted to. Otherwise, we get an always bigger government and smaller citizens. These kinds of outrageous fees and giving yourselves holidays, the likes of which few private citizens have, are not going to make a permanent high in highest interest uh, sales tax increase palatable. It's a matter of trust and empty pockets. Heaven help us when even more misjustified climate change fees pop up. This green building fee is a coercive mechanism this government uses to extract money from a small select public without their consent to force them to spend their money for specific general environmental public benefits, but the kicker is charging them wowie extra for the privilege of that mandated monetary extraction. I hope you are all next in line to pay the uh, extra $3,500 if you remodel a house or buy a new one. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Reggie. Hi, um, I'm just uh, calling in to agree with Robert Norse about the sort of really unfortunate nature of this use of consent public hearings to sort of just move right on through with second readings of ordinances uh, just in batch. Um, <clears throat> you know, there was a lot of opposition to what I'll just call it the food not bombs ordinance, the public gathering expression events ordinance. And there wasn't a lot of rationale for why it should be done. And so I find it very concerning that basically city council just rubber stamped this and now they're rubber stamping it even more by just throwing it on a consent agenda. 
I mean, this was something that we're expected to believe city lawyers, our, our deputy lawyer and our city lawyer are just sitting around just like nerding out over public gathering ordinance language. Uh, you know, Justin Cummings made the point. He sort of revealed what this was about. If you don't get a permit, now you can be prosecuted by the city because it's a misdemeanor. And so since we know what's going on, um, I just like some like real discussion because that was at the very end of the first reading when that question was made and then answered. So let, first of all, at the very least, somebody make a motion to just call this the food not bombs ordinance because that's what it is. Um, if you're not going to, if you're just going to let it go through, at least call it what it is because there isn't a, there aren't a ton of people out there not getting permits for public gathering that the city is actively interested in going after, especially Cassie Bronson, who presented the ordinance. I mean, just a couple months ago, it was very public that she wanted them to get a public gathering ordinance. And so this is so obvious, and it's just shameful that this was presented in such a, like, uh, muddled, unclear way to try to hide what's going on because they fear it's unpopular. Well, it should be unpopular. I mean, you're trying to feed people who are hungry outside, and the city isn't taking up the task. So... Yeah, I mean, just do better. I mean, Jesus Christ, this is ridiculous. Thank you for your comment. Are there any uh, other members of the public? Seeing none, I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation on agenda items 22 through 24 on our consent public hearing agenda. I'll move the items. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins. I'll second. And a second by Callen Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Welcome, Council Member Golder. Thanks. You have to speak into okay. the microphone. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will then, if there is no further discussion, I will take it to a roll call vote. Council Member is Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Golder. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Brown. Aye. I do want to register a no vote on item 24. For the rest of the consent public hearing agenda, aye. Uh, Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. Uh, those, that motion passes unanimously with the exception of item 24, a no vote uh, from Council Member Brown. At this time, I will step out and pass it to Vice Mayor Watkins for agenda item number 25 on our public consent hearing. Thank, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Do any of the council members have any questions on this item, item number 25 on our consent public hearing? No. Seeing none. Are there any members of the community who would like to address the council on this item? <laughs> what? No. And how about on Zoom? Are there any members of the community on Zoom who would like to address us on item number 25, which is a resolution acknowledging the environmental determination approving the lot line adjustment plan development permit, design permit, coastal permit, and heritage tree removal to construct a 20 unit single room occupancy development based on the findings contained in the attached draft resolution and conditions of approval. If you want to speak to this item, you can raise your hand now if you're on Zoom. I don't see any hands raised. OK. We'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for a vote. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> happy to move item number 25. And um, I have a comment after someone seconds. OK, seconds. OK, we have a, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings 
Seconded by Councilmember Golder. <laughs> I think this is. Yeah, I just want to point out for this item that this is um, for because one of the previous items that we just discussed was about affordable housing, and this is the um, you know providing support uh, for a 100% affordable housing project to move forward. Um, I think that this these are the kinds of projects that our community has been saying that wants to see our council take action on. Um, we haven't received any letters of opposition, and so I'm just happy that um, we're able to you know, continue to support the construction of affordable housing in our community. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and take a roll call vote. Unless there's any other comments? No. Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner is disqualified. That passes. Six council members voting in favor with Mayor Bruner recusing herself for this item. We'll go ahead and bring her back, but it looks like we go into a break at the moment. So we'll go ahead and maybe call for a quick break. And let me go ahead and ask her when she wants to come back before I do that. I have this changed. I'll be right back. Thank you, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, that brings us to a brief break in our agenda. Uh, we will, it's 324 right now. And let's see, we will return at 345. Back in chambers and via Zoom. Thank you first meeting back here in the City Council Chambers. So at this point in our agenda, we are now at item number 26. I've allotted an hour for this item. However, we will be pausing to jump back to item number five, uh, which is the volunteer appreciation, since that was a specific time that the volunteers could be here. So we will begin item 26, and there is a possibility we will have to pause it for agenda item five, and then return to item 26. Item number 26 on today's agenda is a public hearing for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to council for action and deliberation. The item is A20-0008, slope regulation ordinance amendments to chapters 18.45, 24.04, 25.04, 26.04, and 24.22 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. We have with us today, I believe via Zoom, our city presenters, uh, staff Catherine Donovan and Matt Van Hua. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of council. Um, it's exciting to see you in the council chambers even though i'm not in there it's exciting to see you there so uh let me just share my screen and start my presentation thank you okay so the item before you today is amendments to the city's slope ordinance. 
Um, and this um, project has, has some history to it. The slope regulation amendment originally was included in a packet of amendments that went to the Planning Commission in September of 2020. At that time, the commission um, continued the slope regulation portion of that packet um, and the rest of the packet moved forward and was approved. We returned the slope with the slope amendments to the Planning Commission in January of this year um, and it was continued on the first meeting until February 17th. And at that time, uh, the commission voted to recommend the approval of the amendment uh, five to two. And a little background on this. Um, the general plan is the guiding land use document for the city and the zoning ordinance implements the general plan. Our general plan 2030 updated policies related to the development on slopes, but the zoning ordinance at this time still reflects the 1990 to 2005 general plan policies for slopes. So this amendment is intended to um, bring those slope policies into conformance with the 2030 general plan. Um, the earlier general plan had uh, slope policies that were set based on the percent of slope um, and they limited any development on slopes greater than um, 50 percent they prohibited. Um, the 2030 general plan directed an update of the zoning of the slope regulations and re had asked that they be based on new construction techniques and best management practices and also directed that geotechnical reports be required when there was a potential for slope instability. And I just have a little graphic here on the bottom to give you an idea of um, what those numbers mean. So I couldn't find one that had 30 and 50%, but this shows 17% um, is the, the lowest slope, then a moderate slope at 33%, Steep is noted at um, 66 percent and very steep at 100 percent. Uh-oh, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse here. Um, excuse me for technical difficulties here. I no problem. Take your time. to replace my battery. Let's try that. No, it's not letting me do it. Catherine, I can go ahead and share my screen. Okay, it's, I got it. I just had to put in the new battery. Okay. Um, so the uh, goals of our amendment are to comply with the 2030 general plan, to reduce and streamline applications for minor projects, to allow development on slopes where it's feasible, and to require site-specific geological reports with science-based engineering solutions when there's a need for them. Um, and the specific proposed updates would require a geotechnical review on or near slopes of 30% or greater. They would require engineering solutions or relocation of the project if the geotechnical report said that there were slope related issues in that location. Um, it would add some exemptions to where a slope permit would be required and it would change the grading exemption, which is now, there's now an exemption if it's a, a 100 cubic yards, and we've lowered that to 50 cubic yards. When we visualized how much 100 cubic yards was, we decided that was an awful lot. Um, we would also we also update the findings to address visual and environmental impacts, and we removed 
Um, there's a list of regulations in the plan development uh, permit section that plan developments are exempt from those regulations. And prior to this, the slope permit was listed in the in that section, and we've removed that because we we think that it's totally appropriate for planned developments on slopes to do geotechnical reports. Um, we also updated the application process, and I've made this little chart because when we tried to <coughs> describe it verbally, it was a little difficult to follow. So currently, um, no public hearing is required if the project is greater than 10 feet from a 30 to 50 percent slope. And what we're proposing, if it is on or within 20 feet of a 30 to 50 percent slope, it would not require a public hearing. A public hearing is currently required before the Planning Commission if it's within 10 feet of a 30 to 50 percent slope. And we're proposing to require a public hearing before the zoning administrator if the project is within 20 feet of a 50% or greater slope. And currently, development is prohibited on a fifth, greater than 50% slope. And we're proposing that development would be based, would be prohibited based on um, the geotechnical report and um, whether there were issues related to the slope and whether or not there were solutions feasible engineering solutions there sometimes there's engineering solutions but they're they're really not feasible um, we had also uh, originally when we took this to the planning commission we had um, included uh, this as an LCP amendment but we spoke with our local coastal staff and they reminded us that the current LCP, which is what they would be reviewing this ordinance under, is has the same standards as the old um, 1990 to 2005 general plan, which reflects the zoning ordinance language that we are trying to get rid of right now. So um, we are in the process of updating our local coastal program um, and we are now proposing to not move forward with the LCP amendment portion of this regulation, of this amendment, until that um, LCP update is completed. And that would mean that um, until that LCP update is completed and then um, the amendments are taken to the Coastal Commission and approved. Um, this these changes would not apply within the coastal zone. Um, however, most, most there there are not that many um, developable properties within the coastal zone that would be affected by the by the ordinance. So we don't see that as a um, something that should delay the rest of the amendments. Um, when we went to the planning commission, there were specific concerns that were raised. Um, they included increased density on slopes um, and SB9 impacts. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what exactly SB9 is, but that's the um, state bill that was passed this, that went into effect in January that um, allows uh, the development of two units on most properties that are zoned single family and um, also allows the most single family zoned properties to be subdivided into two lots that can then each be developed with two units. And so um, the planning commission wanted um, us to address SB9 as part of this ordinance. Um, they were also concerned about wild hazard, wildfire hazard being exacerbated and whether the um, CEQA re, uh, review that we had done as part of this project, whether that was appropriate. Um, so addressing the density on slopes, um, density is regulated by the general plan 
which requires that development be of at least the minimum density unless constraints associated with natural envi the natural environment require a lower density. And that's the direct quote from the general plan. The percent of, of slope alone is not considered a constraint. There, there are many instances where you can develop on quite steep slopes. So, so that percentage in and of itself is not a, considered a constraint. But the geotechnical reports that we would be requiring with this amendment would dis cons discern whether there was an actual constraint or not. Um, and so if those geotechnical reports um, determined that there was a constraint, then we would be able to um, approve development at a lower density than the general plan density for that property. Um, so this amendment, um, because of that, this amendment would not increase the number of units that would be allowed um, on sloped properties. It at most would um, determine the location rather than developing a unit here and a unit over there on a slope, you would have to develop both of the units on a less sloped area. We also um, had looked into the wildfire hazard issue and there's no doubt that wildfire danger is increasing in the West. Um, the city recently adopted a wildland urban interface ordinance and that ordinance allows the building division to apply additional standards um, for fire protection in properties that are within that WUI, they call it the WUI area. Um, and the proposed amendments, because they're not increasing the number of units you could build anywhere, they're not increasing the number of units that you would be able to build in the WUI area. And so therefore, it's not increasing the wildfire hazard because it's not changing, um, it's not increasing the density or the number of units that could be developed. Um, and in terms of whether the uh, CEQA review was appropriate, when we started working on this ordinance, we retained DUDEC um, to review the compliance of this ordinance with the General Plan 2030 EIR. And DUDEC um, reviewed the, what we we're proposing and uh, reviewed what exemptions are available under CEQA and determined that an addendum would be the appropriate um, environmental review for this project because there's not a specific CEQA um, amendment that would apply. Um, and the addendum determined that there were no substantial changes to the general plan. And so therefore the analysis that was done for the EIR would still be in effect and would not change. Um, at the planning commission meeting, there were specific concerns about the addendum itself, the wording uh, uh, of specific sections. And um, so we worked with DUDEC to revise the wording of the addendum and, and um, provide a better document. We also um, hired Remy Moose Manley, a, a law firm that specializes in um, CEQA and land use law in California to prepare a legal opinion um, regarding both the addendum and, S and um, the application of SB9 and whether the, the approval of this amendment the amendment would require any um, environmental review of SB9. And um, Remy Moosemore Manley determined that no, in fact, they, they wouldn't, it would not be appropriate for us to do CEQA review for SB9 because we were not imposing SB9. It, it was already an approved um, uh, statute and um, that the addendum was the correct legal document for this amendment. And that is my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Catherine Donovan.
You're very welcome. Uh, at this time, I will ask council members if anyone has questions regarding the item or the presentation. And we still have a screen view. For, there oh, we go. I'm so sorry. Council Member Brown. I do have a quick question, although I just wanted to say it's 4.05, so I know you want to shift gears. So yeah, I got the wrong PowerPoint. I'm looking for it. I, so and it looks like, I'll just ask my question very quickly. Um, so the um, I'm just curious, um, has the staff analyzed at all? I, I recognize this is intended to um, reduce the barriers to housing production, part of a, a whole package, as you said, of, of changes that we are making. Um, is there, do we have any uh, sense of like how many additional units, what the increment would be um, at, what, it, allowing uh, building on the, changing the, the requirements or re actually eliminating a slope requirement above 50%, which has been the standard? Do we have any sense of how that might possibly, I know it's, it's speculative, but we also do speculate about how much housing can be built within our zoning codes and, you know, Land, land use designations more generally. So was that done with this? Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and actually the number was surprisingly small. Um, we determined that uh, we looked at all of the properties that are sloped and we looked at the uh, portions of those properties that cannot now be developed, that could be developed with this ordinance. And then we um, removed any portions of those properties that had other development constraints, which not surprisingly, many of them did. They had um, creek setbacks was, was a big one. Um, and uh, also um, uh, endangered habitat or, or uh, endangered species locations. So um, given all those constraints, uh, we came up with 28 units, additional units could be built on these sloped areas. So it, it's not a large number. But the ordinance is not only about units. Um, we get, the, the current planning division gets many applications or, or requests for um, development that is, you know, think mostly deck extensions or trellises or, or terracing or um, something of that nature that's, that's not a housing unit, but that makes their property more usable. And um, they either have to go through this um, quite, because it requires a public hearing, it's a relatively expensive process for such a small project. Or if it's on a slope that's 50% or more, they simply can't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the city clerk if the volunteers are ready. Uh, are there any other questions from council members at this time before we pause this item? I had a quick question. Um, I was curious, and, and I think you, you maybe touched on it briefly or slightly, uh, about inside the coastal zone how many how many uh development how many properties would that apply to and i i think i heard you say not many within yeah, the coastal I zone i don't yeah i don't have an exact number for that um but uh, most of the um, coastal development where there are slopes most of it is right along the coast itself and um, that's not developable. So, uh, so there would be some properties along um, kind of near Moore Creek in that area because the coastal zones does stretch up the hillside there. Um, but it's a limited number that are actually in the coastal zone. And those properties for the most part are um, either not developable because they're parkland or something like that, 
or they already have um, development on them. And while they m might want to do something like extend their deck or um, some of these other projects that I was just speaking about, um, and they would not be able to at this time, we are trying to get that LCP amendment update uh, or that LCP update so that we can get this amendment completed as soon as possible. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, at this time we will pause uh, this item number 26 on our agenda and we will jump backwards to item number five. Mayor, if I could just, <clears throat> all the council members have, um, actually, Council Member Golder, I don't think you do because we didn't know if you'd be here, but there's a little script and you all have a section. I don't know if you all saw it, but there should be. Okay, and so item number five, if you give me one moment. <clears throat> I was looking for the title, the agenda title, so I'm going backwards. Here it is. Outstanding volunteer recognition. And we have Christina Thurston, CityServe Program Volunteer Coordinator here via Zoom. Welcome, Christina. Hi. Wave your hand, please. There you are. Okay. Hi. Welcome. Hi. And do you have the volunteers? Are they? Is everyone here and, and accounted for? Yes, I'm here. Jeb Bishop. Great. All right. Well, we have um, each a script, and we will read a little paragraph about each volunteer. And I'd like to start off by saying that National Volunteer Week is about inspiring and recognizing and encouraging people to really seek out imaginative ways to engage in their communities. It's about demonstrating to the nation that by working together, we have the fortitude to meet our challenges and accomplish our goals. The city serve volunteers who give their time and their commitment to the city of Santa Cruz are outstanding examples of what can be accomplished when people care about their communities. Today, we have the honor to recognize the finest of these volunteers. Christina, I'd like to now hand it over to you for any opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, yes, as you said, it's an honor to recognize some of the finest volunteers here during National Volunteer Week. After many CityServe volunteer programs were placed on pause due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're finally reopening and engaging both new and returning volunteers. The individuals we are honoring today are committed to bettering our community and had to adapt to the constant changes during the pandemic. We thank them for the, their dedication and willingness to serve the city of Santa Cruz, despite the many challenges they faced these past couple of years. Um, I'm here with Karen Delaney, the executive director of the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County, who will be assisting me and uh, Mayor Bruner in honoring and the rest of the city council in honoring the, the volunteers. Um, and she'll make some closing remarks at the end. Right. And I know most of our volunteers are here virtually. Some of them couldn't join us. Um, we're just going to honor them anyway. 
And the first is Alan Allen. I've got certificates here that you can't see, but I'm going to mail them out to everybody. Thank you. All right. Alan Allen is a parks maintenance volunteer. One of his main projects is caring for the lovely Rose Garden located at City Hall. He also prunes plants throughout the grounds and assists city staff with weeding and general garden maintenance. He's always willing to take on additional projects and is currently working on, on owl nesting boxes for City Hall. Alan is enthusiastic and has become an integral part of maintaining the beautiful gardens at City Hall. Alan's volunteered over 240 hours, and we thank him for his service with Neighborhood Parks. Thank you, Alan. The next volunteer is Diane Lamond. All right, I'll start by thanking you for your service and for volunteering for our community. Diane has been volunteering with the Santa Cruz Police Department since 2018 and has reported over 700 and 50 volunteer hours. She dedicates her volunteer time to supporting the Santa Cruz Police Department and the community-oriented services. She conducts foot patrols around the Santa Cruz Wharf and is always willing to go above and beyond to serve our city. Diane's professional background as a special education teacher has prepared her for encountering the many personalities downtown during her patrol assignments. She has a natural talent to calm people down and is able to connect with both children and adults. Diane is always willing to make time to listen to individuals and assist them however she can. She serves as a positive police ambassador to the community by increasing police, policing initiatives, enhancing our community relationships, and patrolling for crime prevention and outreach. Thank you so much, Diane. Next volunteer who I see has been able to, to join on Zoom is Drusilla Ho. Hi, Drusilla. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about your work. Uh, Drusilla has been volunteering with Parks and Recreation every week for the last four and a half years, accumulating over 270 hours of community service. She's been regularly volunteering as a Qigong instructor for the Downtown Seniors Program at the London Nelson Community Center. When the community center was shut down in March of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Drusilla quickly adapted her class to stay connected with her students and led weekly classes using Zoom. She is a thoughtful and present instructor to her students. Drusilla is continuously furthering her Qigong and wellness education so that she can create the most impact for her class, the community center, local seniors, and the Qigong community. We're grateful for your service and thank you for being here today. And uh, next volunteer is Mary Scheller. Hi there, Miriam. Uh, my name is Donna Myers and I'm here to honor you um, on your volunteering here with the city of Santa Cruz. Mary has been volunteering with the Waste Reduction Department for three years and has reported just under 100 hours of community service as a master recycler. Some major tasks Mary has, un has taken on include tabling at city farmers markets, giving presentations and webinars about reducing plastic consumption, and meeting with local businesses to discuss ways to reduce the use of plastic. Mary's passion and interest in waste reduction really shine through her volunteerism and waste reduction advocacy within the Santa Cruz community. Her dedication and ability to inform the public have had impacts far and wide. Congratulations and thanks, Mary. And just a quick note to, I know all the volunteers who've joined here, you are welcome to, to share your video if you want. Um, or if you want to say a few words when, when you're recognized. Um, our next volunteer who see is also here is Kaya, Kaya Giuliano Monroe, Monroy. Sorry, Kayla, Kaya. Is it, is it Kaya or is it Kaya? 
It's uh, it's Kaya Juliano Monroy. She got it right the first no time. No problem. No, I just wanted to make sure I said it right. Well, Kaya, my name is Martina, and I get to um, honor you today. So Kaya is an ecologist with the Coastal Watershed Council. She's dedicated to improving the habitat along the San Lorenzo River and Santa Cruz Riverwalk Park. She coordinates teams of youth and adult volunteers who have planted 335 new plants along the river, comprising of 10 unique native species. Kaya and her volunteers plant native plants, remove evasive species, and overall increase biodiversity along the San Lorenzo River. Kaya's passion for caring for nature and our city parks is infectious. She's not only an incredible volunteer to the city herself, but a role model for others, particularly youth who relate to Kaya's experiences and became inspired by her stewardship. Well, incredible work. Congratulations, Kaya. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, our next volunteer is Jeb Bishop and the Ground Swell Coastal Ecology. Hi, I have the honor of uh, recognizing Jeb. He's been a Parks and Recreation volunteer since 2011. Over the past 10 years, Jeb and his group of dedicated volunteers have completely restored the native riparian habitat along Pilkington Creek within Tyrell Park. Jeb and the whole Adopt-A-Park group have taken on invasive removals, erosion control, and have established native flora to rejuvenate the local habitat of this region. Jeb and his volunteers have a deep passion for public service and volunteerism. Their hard work has also greatly contributed to the educational experience for many local school groups that visit the Museum of Natural History, which is located at Tyrell Park. Our community thanks Jeb and each volunteer in the Pilkington group that has dedicated their time to restoring the beautiful Tyrell Park. Thank you, Jeb. Thank you very much. And now, Chris, are there any closing remarks from Christina Thurston or Karen Delaney? Yeah, thank you. This is uh, Karen Delaney from the Volunteer Center. And we want to thank all the volunteers and also take a moment to thank the city council and staff. Um, the partnership with the Volunteer Center that makes City Serve happen has been going on for more than 30,000, more than 30 years, more than 10,000 volunteers have participated in this effort over the years. And as part of our celebration of Global Volunteer Month, this isn't something that the city is required to do but it is something that really helps our community. When people volunteer, the individuals who volunteer, uh, data tells us are happier, healthier, more engaged in their community. They even live longer. Communities where people volunteer have higher voting rates. They have lower crime rates. They have higher rates of donation to nonprofits that, um, Volunteering and promoting and welcoming and supporting and thanking volunteering is one of the things that helps us promote a healthy civil civic infrastructure and weaves our community together. And there's a lot of things pulling us in different directions. So I really want to thank the city council uh, and the city staff for their support of this effort this year and every year. And really want to encourage you as you move through your daily life to talk to people about volunteering, to invite them now that we're all reopening to come on down. I want to take a special moment to thank um, your city staff for your willing to, the willingness to mentor and guide city serve volunteers and make them feel at home and welcome in their own city. Uh, Joyce Blaschke at the police department, Mike Goodsey at Parks and Recreation, Kelly Mercer Leboff at the Senior Center, Kaylee Soon at Waste Reduction, Maisha Nicholas at Neighborhood Parks, Laura Egan and the whole Coastal Watershed Council. And um, we hope that uh, any staff, any member of the community, any council member 
who wants uh, to get more deeper into volunteerism will always reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Are there any uh, further comments from council members? Council Member Brown. I, my, I, my only comment is I, I did just, I heard somebody in the pre presentation say if there are members who were received an award today, volunteers who want to say something, I'd, I'd love to hear from you um, if you, if you want to speak. I, I know we're on a time crunch, but um, this is a really important thing that you're doing. Are there any uh, volunteers that would like to say a few words? Please raise your hand. Drusella. Hi. Um, I just want to th say thank you um, to the Volunteer Association and especially to, uh, as you mentioned, Kelly uh, at the Senior Center. I mean, and, and her staff have been really, really welcoming and helpful and um it has made my experience uh really gratifying um kudos to you all <laughs> thank you thank you drusilla are there any other volunteers that would like to say any closing remarks well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate all of your volunteer hours. Thank you for your work in our community. Okay, at this time, we will continue our agenda and return to item number 26. And that is our uh, slope regulations agenda item. Ordinance amendments. And we have city staff Catherine Donovan with us who just gave a presentation. We have had city council member questions. And um, I'll return it to Catherine Donovan. Thank you. I. Um inadvertently opened the older version of my PowerPoint and there were a couple of slides um, that I didn't have in the older version that I'd like to show you now. Okay. So, um, We, uh, Lee Butler, our director, actually noticed this morning that um, we needed to make this minor edit to the change we were proposing um, under the 24.04.030 types of permits and other actions authorized by this title. Um, we had added the slope development permit and um, I had inadvertently copied the language from a different section that included the um, on or within 20 feet of, and that doesn't need to be here. So we were, we're just proposing to uh, take that out of the ordinance. And then um, we also wanted to provide you with the motion and to add the language, um, keeping in place the existing code for areas within the coastal zone. Um, so it is very clear in, our, in the motion what exactly we're doing. And we're also going to, when we bring the ordinance back for a second reading, um, we're going to actually bring the language that we will need to have in our code to separate out what's happening in the coastal zone and what's happening in the non-coastal zone areas. Thank you. Is there an anticipated timeline on the coastal zone? Um, the... Uh, local Coastal um, Commission staff um, has asked us to um, do a pretty extensive change in the direction of the LCP that we, we had um, released a draft in uh, November of 2021 
and they told us in February that um, they didn't give us comments on it. They simply said they wanted us to go in a different direction. And um, so we are anticipating that we will have that um, ready to go in the fall or possibly the winter of this year. And then we have no control over the Coastal Commission staff schedule, but we're hoping that they can get to it relatively quickly. And then once it's approved by them, we would bring um, just a simple resolution to you to approve to take it to the Coastal Commission and then take the amendment to the Coastal Commission. So that part of it would take, you know, no more than a couple of months probably. Um, but it's the, the LCP update itself that is, it's unclear to us how long that's gonna take to get approval from the Coastal Commission. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions from council members uh, before I take it out for public comment? Okay, at this time, I will take this item out to public comment. There are currently no members of the public in chamber, so I will look to our Zoom attendees. And if you are a member of the public that would like to speak to this item, now is the time to raise your hand, either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will then be set to three minutes. Okay, and I don't see any members of the public in Zoom with hands raised. I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Are there any council members that would like to make a motion and then we can continue discussion? I'm happy to make the motion um, with the amended language that was brought before us by Catherine, um, acknowledging the coastal distinction. So I'll move that. We have a first by Vice Mayor Watkins. Is there a second? We have a second by Council Member Myers. Are there any uh, comments or discussion? Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, a couple of, of brief comments um, that I'd like to make, and um, I, I'm, I think I'm going to propose an amendment, which I, unlikely to be a friendly amendment, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I recognize the. Also, I forget to take my mask off when I'm speaking, and so you <laughs> heard people haven't been able to hear me. So I'm going to try to get better at that. Um, so for me, you know, the, um, the substance of this item is, is really eliminating uh, current slope regulations that we've had in place for some time now, uh, allowing development on a slope of any angle if an engineer says it's okay. I recognize that engineers um, have the ability to provide uh, guidance to suggest don't build, but they also have incentive to find ways to build. Uh, because they are employed by uh, the folks who want to do that building. So there, there's some concern there about um, the, you know, the, the legitimacy, I'll just say the word legitimacy, of those reports in some cases. Um, it, it worries me. Um, and so eliminating that prohibition of building on slopes of 50% or greater does represent, in my perspective, a retreat from... Uh, you know, the city's kind of long-standing commitment to um, environmental concerns, including building out into open spaces. And um, it's really one of the only objective standards that we might be able to maintain uh, for use under the Housing Accountability Act as well, uh, related to environmental concerns. So um, while I'm... Uh, I understand the, uh, the rationale and the motivation to move in this direction, and I, want, I will support the uh, ordinance 
changes. I um, I want to. Um, I'd like to just move an uh, amendment to. Uh, and I'm not. I didn't go through. I did go through the whole ordinance, and I I did decided not to try to bring up a, a bunch of changes, like finding where it, all of all the changes that would need to be made if we did adopt this um, amendment, but um, just to eliminate the uh, regulation or, or to, to to maintain, I guess, maintain the 50% uh, slope regulation. Uh, and to maintain the ability to request exceptions in those cases rather than a blanket um, uh, permission. So that's my, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think about a way <laughs> to, to do that um, in, you know, in the language that would, I mean, if it would be sufficient to just say eliminating the um, removal of the 50% regulation for now, um, and then should we, should I get a second or support for this, we could kind of figure out what, how that would play out in terms of the specific language. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, um, given where I anticipate the council is headed, but I do want to try to put that out there as a, a possibility and just give you briefly my concerns. So that's my uh, motion, or my, amend, my proposed amendment, and we'll see if I get a second. All right, Council Member Brown has an amendment to the current motion. Is there, Go ahead. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, I wasn't sure if that finger point was your second. I was gonna wait till you were done just so my hand was raised. I see. Yeah. Uh, it's very different being here in person, mm -hmm. having everyone uh, in my peripheral. So uh, thank you. Uh, so we have, uh, an amendment by Council Member Brown and a second to that amendment by Council Member Cummings. And so now at this point, Council Member Cummings, you had a comment? Yeah, I <clears throat> wanted to, I won't reiterate the points that Council Member Brown made, but, made, but just wanna express my agreement with those points. And I also just want to point out that there was a recent survey and we had a presentation by a group um, that yeah, you know, really went out and, and surveyed the community. And one of the things that survey pointed out was that there was overwhelming community support for protecting the city's environment and open spaces. And, you know, removing the 50% prohibition would, you know, in some ways go against this desire for us to do what we can to help protect and preserve our environment and our open spaces when possible. Um, in addition to a lot of the concerns around building on steep slopes and what that means for fire, mudslides, um, and not just environmental safety, but public health and safety as well. And so um, I feel like this is a reasonable compromise. I mean, there's a lot of things in here, a lot of um, updates to our slope requirements that you know we're moving forward with, and this seems like it would be one way to find compromise on this topic. And so that's why I'm supporting the amendment. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I wonder if Catherine Donovan is um, available to speak to that amendment? Yes. Um, this amendment would have nothing to do with development in open space. It would not, our open space is not developable because it's open space. It doesn't have anything to do with the degree of slope. This would um, strictly apply to uh, private property development um, the city has no intention of developing their parks, um, and and most, the, actually the, the the vast majority of sloped properties within the city of Santa Cruz are parklands. Um, so this this would not have an impact on on, on open space development at all. Um, it would be strictly related to private property development. Thank you. And I see uh, city staff, Matt Van Hua. Yeah, thanks. I would just like to follow up on Catherine's point too and just say that the 50% the slope, uh, you know, getting rid of that uh, also allows for a lot more flexibility on properties for property owners to add an ADU, something like that. Uh, 
you know, when there are current science-based engineering solutions that would allow uh, a unit to be built on a property uh, in a different location, but say it's on a 50% slope, you know, something like this would allow that as well, but it would also allow a property owner to just even put stairs in their property on a 50% slope, which isn't possible right now. So the, the majority of this is really to give property owners uh, the ability to build on these on these slopes uh, anywhere from a minor project to a unit. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Do any other council members have questions regarding that 50% elimination? I don't have a question, but I appreciate the clarification. I think it really helps. Yeah, I, and given that information, I don't feel like it's necessary to not include that. So I won't be in support of the amendment. Okay. So um, I think we can do a roll call vote on the, uh, or it sounds like the amendment was not accepted. Well, it, was, well, it wasn't friendly. We have a first and a second, so now we do a, the roll, a roll call, call vote on it. On the amendment. Substitute. One vote. Yeah. Thank you. Council members, Calentari Johnson. No. Holder. No. Cummings. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. No. Vice Mayor Watkins. No. And Mayor Brenner. No. That motion does not. Or the. The amendment to the motion does not pass with five against, two in favor. And so now we return to the motion. There was a first by Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by Council Member Myers. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? No. I mean, aye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cummings? No one for the record. Um, these changes do potentially pose impacts to our environment, which is a core value of our community and has been held for quite some time. Brown? No. Myers? Yes. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes with five in favor and two against. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Catherine and Matt. At this time, we are now in recess until our evening agenda. We will return at 6.30 with oral communications and the continuation of agenda items 27 and 28. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to our 6.30 p.m. session of the April 26, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Kalantari Johnson. Present. Boulder. Here. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Brunner. Present. Thank you. Next up on our agenda, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the pub public and community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. 
Oral communications is an opportunity for members to speak to us on items not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing, addressing the council, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. You will have three minutes to speak. Members of the public who wish to address the council who are here in person, please line up to the right of the dais. You will have three minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure the correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public and we are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public. But when we are able, we will address any questions raised after oral communications has completed. I will now pull up my Zoom window just to see if any attendees via Zoom wish to speak for oral communications. If you do, please press star nine to raise your hand. Okay, at this time, I do see members in the public. Welcome, everyone. And uh, so we will begin with uh, oral communications. And the first person in line, have you already signed in? Great. Please approach the microphone, please. And if you could speak clearly into the mic. Sure. Um, howdy. Uh, having reflected on the election redistricting decision, my impression has changed it that it could have been better. I now find the sixth district sequence flawed insofar as it is badly asymmetrical with respect to districts, with four districts alternating every two years between voting for mayor and then later a council member, but the other two districts vote for both mayor and a council member every four years, then in the intervening election they don't vote. Only the two west side districts will have incumbent council member terms expiring perfectly to then run for mayor, which disadvantages incumbents in four of the six districts. If incumbents in the other four districts want to run for mayor, they must either wait out two more years or abandon their seats, which isn't realistic. This is then lopsided and district unequal. It's a subtle issue, but also wannabe politicians are few in a small town. Walk on inexperienced candidates have little chance of a straight up mayoral election victory. Over time, we need the largest council experienced mayor candidate pool possible. It is unbalanced that two districts possibly need to field two politicians, but the other is always only one. And again, there is that two district advantage of the mayoral election incumbent timing. It's best that an equal situation should exist for each of, uh, district over two cycles. I'm okay with the maps and my strong preference is still for an elected mayor, but to me the perfect symmetric solution should have been three districts voting in November for council and then uh, a two-year transitional period appointing the current vice mayor to mayor for one year, another council vote for mayor again for just 2024. Then the public mayoral at-large election voting cycle would begin in 2024 election, electing a mayor for a two-year term which then accomplishes a perfect voting symmetry among districts with a zero district incumbent disadvantage. You could still have done your map and sequence self-interested rigging, but also left the people with a completely fair and district equal election system for generations to come, but you didn't, and this less than perfect change could last forever. In the seven district model, the council picks the mayor forever without public input is a total no-go for me. May I suggest for seven districts, either the rotating council seat vote should have been in June, no runoffs, and either an at-large vote for mayor chosen from the entire willing future council be in November, or an at-large after November special election mail-in mayoral ballot would have remedied that defect. I think Member Cummings' losing motion to table the seven district item was sage, although it would have been even sager to table everything and uh, go with a better seven district ordinance uh, including a publicly elected two-year term mayor chosen from among all the willing future council members, then revisit the balanced six district model with an at-large two-year term mayor elect plan for 2024 charter vote. 
the remedy of district elections to eliminate supposed at-large racial voting discrimination to form districts even more likely to racially discriminate is just more of the far left's growing anti-racism racism in disguise. Their activism tears some people down without rational proof to assign privilege to others supposedly as victims, and they call that equity. Thanks. Thank you. May I have the next member of the public? Welcome. Hi. Uh, Kyle Davenport, I'm, a per I'm pursuing a PhD in chemistry. I want to help with the next breakthrough in science for sustainable energy, electricity, electrical cars, and those types of things. Um, please give me your blessing <laughs> on that. I, uh, I've been inauthentic, not authentic, not putting my time, money, and energy into what actually means anything for me. I have spent my life wasting away on things that are completely meaningless to me in my heart. Um, on a separate subject, the people experiencing a lack of housing in the camps who um, have a lack of safe, comfortable, and sanitary housing, obviously, they're living on the streets and in the camps and in the gutters. I, three years ago, I spent a year studying the phenomenon, the situation. I looked into everything that had been looked at on the federal level, the county level, the state level, the city level, everything you have tried, all the organizations in this county. I looked at every single census that has been taken. I made graphs. I looked at everything. The only thing that I found is similar to sort of a scientific method in that our brainstorming and our solution finding processes aren't working. Whatever we've been doing has not been working. The situation is getting worse and worse and worse. So I spent a year and thousands of dollars on this coaching and ontological training uh, to figure out how do we brainstorm better? Are we creating the problem at, with our solutions? Are our solution finding processes coming out of the problem? Uh, the only thing that I found, well, I mean, I found a lot. The most direct, if, you, if you're excited about this, as I am, I'm very excited about it. The most direct way out of solutions that don't work that, in fact, recreate the same problem, um, the most direct way is if we can be honest. And I'm sharing this with you because it is simply what works and that all human beings are not honest and not authentic all the time. By saying it out loud, you engage the prefrontal cortex or the frontal cortex or whatever it's called. That part of your brain has the ability to kind of like reform the rest of the brain into better answer finding processes, even better neurology. That's outside of the culture and the mentality that created the problem in the first place. So it's like getting outside of the box. How do we get outside of the box? I'm telling you, it. I hope you can believe this. It starts completely with saying out loud to other people, I've been dishonest. I have been unauthentic. I have done tons of things that are not authentic to what's actually meaningful to me whatsoever. I have, and I'm sure we all have. If you can say that out loud, it starts getting your brain outside of that box that's creating the problem in the first place. And I've been doing it, and it works. The other piece of it is hidden sorrows, grief, hidden bad memories from the past, whatever they are. So I tell myself every night, Turn the bad memories into good memories, and it's working daily. Thank you. Thank you. Next member of the public, welcome. Hi, my name is Keith McHenry, McHenry like the library, and I'm here to invite the community um, to come to our preparation for nonviolent resistance on Monday, May 2nd, from 6 to 8 at the Resource Center for Nonviolence at 620 Ocean Street. Um, we are preparing to resist uh, the uh, city's attacks on free speech, and we are uh, preparing to um, defend the, the rights of the homeless here in Santa Cruz who are also threatened by city policies. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the increase in homelessness is getting very dramatic. We are running out of food. Um, often within a, an hour sometimes of, of setting up because the, the need is so great. I just went to uh, St. Francis yesterday to see when they're opening because we really would like to go back to, two, uh, to Saturday and Sunday as we had done for years. But they are telling me that they will not open until maybe June, maybe later. So this means that about roughly 200 people um, a day would go without food in downtown Santa Cruz um, of the people getting hot meals and the 
400 people in the bench lands are depending upon us for our food deliveries there every week, as are another uh, 500 uh, undocumented um, members of the community who get food from us each week. And so, um, you know, we uh, have this nonviolence training. Everyone's welcome to come. Not everyone attending needs to um, feel that it's necessary to risk arrest, um, but. Uh, um, you, but, the, you know, that will, is one of the possibilities as people will um, need to risk arrest. And we also go over past successes in other communities where we've resisted attacks against free speech, um, such as in Fort Lauderdale, where we won a um, federal lawsuit um, um, protecting our First Amendment rights in that district. And, of course, there's the several million dollars that the city of San Francisco spent trying to stop us, which failed. And um, so, you know, we uh, are experienced in resisting um, police state tactics by vicious governments like this one, and so we will be doing the same. And again, I want to, uh, uh, everyone's welcome. It's uh, Preparation for Nonviolent Resistance. Again, it's on Monday, May 2nd at 6 o'clock, and it will be at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. And we encourage all community members that want to defend free speech in this uh, city and uh, defend the rights of the homeless against these vicious attacks to uh, uh, attend. And, uh, um, you know, as I'm sure we're all aware, there's got the amount of homelessness that is, is going to skyrocket. Uh, and we're, there's a very good chance it will double in the coming months. So we need to prepare for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the next member of the public, welcome. Hi there. Hi, I signed in. I'm also going to be able to make public comments on 27. At this time, we're doing oral communications. Uh huh. For so I'll be any able to comment on 27 when it comes up. Correct. That's great. Wow, I haven't been here in about two years. Um, what to discuss? Spent a lot of time at the uh, in the county meetings. Um, you guys are probably covering or not covering about the same different types of information. Seems like this city's even more stringent than the county. A lot of state laws that are going through that are uh, really affect people's freedom and their choices. Seems like a lot of the communities doesn't seem to understand the difference between legal and alienable rights that are presented to fellow citizens that are made by other individuals and lawful unalienable rights that you could say are given by God. So. I have a lot of le leeway to talk about stuff. What's, what's really of most importance? There's been a lot of destruction of the food supply and the fuel supply and transportation. This city seems to really be promoting the agenda 21, 2030, and 2050. Doesn't seem to be talking much about what the real cosmo cosmology resets are actually going to be. Um, but there's lots of dialogue about subjects that seem important when many are just being missed. So I'm not quite sure exactly, I wish I was, when uh, the UN took over the United States. I think it was uh, 1946 or 1947. So I'm holding a document here from the World Health Organization. This was uh, all nations from what I thought were going to lose their sovereignty in early 2024. So although it seems like there's some real use to being an American state national, um, this legislation is going to go through in less than a month. Um, you wonder why the borders are open in the United States? That's deliberate, because they're going to eliminate the borders. Um, so I guess it's just nice to see all of you. I recognize half of your faces and stuff. And it's nice that I can be here. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now uh, the next member of the public. And if you could please speak into the mic as much as possible. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good. Uh, the city manager's council here is still silent on the sweeps. On March 8th, city manager Matt Huffaker advised the city council that the Benchlands encampment is a sanctioned campground 
This means the city's new harsh sleeping ban, the camping services and standards ordinance, could be enforced. And to top it off, the Benchlands, Huffaker, and his lieutenants, Butler and Wally, told us it will be dispersed in July anyway. As he's here, perhaps he can elaborate on this after the oral communications period, but I doubt he will. No details whatsoever about where the hundreds of unhoused folks surviving there would go. Of course, council members might ask him this question, but they won't. When asked repeatedly by callers about this at the April 12th council meeting, council members Brown and Cummings, as well as Myers, Watkins, Calum Calamari Johnson, excuse me about that one, and Golder were tactfully silent. No questions that might embarrass the new city manager. At today's city council meeting, Mayor Bruner's report on her city county homelessness committee was likewise barren of news, real news, specifics. The Association of Faith Communities stubbornly refused to give details of its so-called safe parking program, of how many vehicles it can house or how it responds to concerns, complaints, and exclusions. Yet in the last few months, largely stripped of the COVID-19 shelter-in-place protections, and with Project Room Key and Home Key temporary housing shutting down, we have seen sweeps throughout the city. Poganip, Coral, and Limekiln streets, Highway 1 railway tracks, Highway 1 east of the San Lorenzo River, the Old Camp Paradise area, Hell's Trail, Lot 27, the West Levee, and the Soquel Creek footbridge are only some of the folks who were told to clear out in apparent violation of the Martin versus Boise federal court ruling. Huff proposes housed members of the community, and that's Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, set up a daytime presence in front of the city manager's office, since he seems to have the power in this situation, demanding real answers to these questions. I notice he's not looking at me. We insist he direct the SCPD to stop its sweeps and want some real answers as to how $14.5 million dollars the city council has pocketed is slated to be spent. How much will really go to those outside and how and in what programs? We hope to provide coffee and snacks and invite people living outside to join us to seek answers and tell their story. If you're interested, contact Huff and just grab one of these flyers before you leave. And I'll give some to the council in case anyone wants to serve food to homeless people. Thank you. And now the next member of the public. Hi there, welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, you can. Yes. Uh, my name is Sola Sarmiento. I am a retired public health nurse and have worked many years with the county to help impoverished citizens obtain access to services and food programs. Food Not Bombs saves those people's lives who have no money and nothing else to survive on. Trying to shut down Food Not Bomb is cruel and callous towards those citizens who would otherwise starve and die on the streets. If the city stops the volunteers of Food Not Bombs from doing their honorable mission to feed the hungry, it will create a public health disaster. There will be likely an increase of deaths on the streets. There will also be an increase of ER visits and hospitalizations. The spread of disease in this population will probably skyrocket likely crime will also go up. I foresee that this will create an immense financial burden to the city and county budgets. If the city cannot provide low-income housing and food services, minimally it should allow Food Not Bombs to continue its humanitarian mission. We should be applauding Food Not Bombs, not trying to shut it down. The city should be adopting ordinances that support the viability of all the citizens, including the marginalized. Thank you. Thank you. And now the next member of the public. And if you're uh, not speaking or in line, please have a seat. Thank you. Good evening, members of Welcome. Santa Cruz City Council. I'm really glad you're back meeting in person. I was wondering if I was going to have to instigate a movement to make that happen. I really don't have time for that, so I'm trying to find a paid job. So I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for opening up. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the city uh, considering regulating the space at the town clock. 
Um, so I want to start out with something that may sound far afield, and that is the normalization of nuclear war that is going on right now. So much has been written about this, but what's particularly sad for me, as I am in my sixth decade, is to see something coming back that I had hoped really went the way of things like diapers that you had to wash in the washing machine and things like that. But maybe that's a good idea now because disposable diapers are an environmental problem. No, it's just um, nuclear war is unthinkable. We will not survive a nuclear winter. We can't have this happen. It was actually President Reagan in the mid-'80s who signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. What does this have to do with the town clock? Well, the town clock, sorry, Sonia, I'm just so, like, I'm not very flexible, so I tend to look at whoever's straight across from me. Um, the statue at the town clock, it's about collateral damage. And it's Santa Cruz has a history as one of the most humane and peaceable and compassionate towns. But that is a thing of the past. And with every passing year, it becomes more and more a thing of the past because big money is here and ruling politics and big concentrated wealth is one of the ways that you shut down democracy. You marginalize speech and that is what's happening at the town clock. We have a law, Citizens United, that allows free speech to be equated with money. I would love free speech to be equated with sharing of food. Food is necessary for life. We've been in the midst of an economic war for 35, 40 years, and many people are homeless and poor, if not for long periods of time, short periods of time. So I just want to say a couple things about Food Not Bombs there. Food Not Bombs is doing the work that the city should do and used to do. It used to serve two meals every day out at the Coral Campus. That was shut down a few years ago under Cynthia Matthews, Donna Myers, and other people who say they're Democrats, but I do not consider them the classic form of Democrat. It, we are in the midst of all kinds of meaning war as well. Uh, that's it. Too bad. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public, welcome. Hey there. Uh, my name is Taylor Lane. I'm the founder of the Cigarette Surfboard. We have 15 surfboards that collect over 500,000 cigarette butts all picked up at the beach in California. Uh, as stewards, can I interrupt you? Sorry, your microphone, if you could uh, a little closer. raise it higher. And sure. there we go and speak. Thank First you. First rodeo here. Um, so as stewards of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, you know, we have a moral and ethical responsibility to lead an example for the entire world of what a marine protected space means. And right now, single-use filtered cigarettes are threatening the sanctuary. They're leaching toxic chemicals and microplastics into an ecosystem, up the food chain, and into us. We've traveled the world with these surfboards, and every place we go, this issue persists. With 4.3 trillion cigarette butts littered every year, Big Tobacco takes zero responsibility and externalizes all the costs onto communities like ours, nonprofits, volunteers, and millions and millions of dollars of our own taxpayer money. The world needs a solution, and Santa Cruz is the most place, is the most prime place for this to happen. We have a huge track record of championing environmental issues and initiatives. And with surfing in the ocean being so centric to our way of life here, it's a no-brainer. After all, filters are a complete sham, and studies have shown that they increase more deadly cancers because they allow smokers to inhale the toxins deeper into their lungs, let alone increasing adolescent smoking because it allows it easier for these children to smoke cigarettes. A year ago, you all passed a resolution citing that toxic human environmental threats against cigarette waste are reckoning our community, and I'm wondering what we're going to do about it. We're not asking to ban tobacco in this community. We're merely asking to ban anything that's sold as a single-use filtered cigarette. Big tobacco, at the end of the day, is a bunch of crooks and conmans that will lie and deceive their way for decades to come and have been. Ultimately, when this product is used as directed, it kills people. 
Businesses in this community will hurt because they will not be able to sell single-use filtered cigarettes. However, these are fundamentally and ethically false grounds for which an economic argument should be made for these businesses. Human lives in our environment is priceless. Big tobacco doesn't care. And we should not be afraid of them when all the facts are on our side. Several model, pol several model policies currently exist from the Public Health Law Center that Santa Cruz could begin to customize for our own needs. All of you up here have an opportunity to be heroes. The world is watching, and this does not need to be a vote that the entire public needs to go through. You have the power to do something to protect generations for myself, for yourself, and after us. Please move forward with the model policy to ban the sale of single-use filters in this city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. I, I also have some materials for city council that I would like to hand out. I'm going to give that to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now the next member of the public. Thank you. Hello. Hi, council members. It's been a while. Nice to see you. Um, my name's Allie Webster. I'm chair of our local uh, Santa Cruz chapter of the Surf Rider Foundation, and I'm here to speak in support of a single-use cigarette filter ban. Um, I went for a walk this morning. I left my house, and in 45 minutes, I filled up my jar with cigarette butts. I thought it would take a couple hours, but it took 45 minutes. Probably at least 300 cigarette butts here. And I think the most important thing to ask just to start is to start noticing it when you walk around. Look at the ground, and you see them everywhere. Um, and we're planning to make that more clear to the whole community coming up here in our, in our campaign. Um, we're under no delusion that this is some easy thing that we're asking you to do. We know that it's real businesses and real people and a lot of money, um, and it's never been done before. It's a really huge thing that we're asking. Um, but Santa Cruz has before and can again um, be so important to force the hand of big companies. Um, and if we were to do something like this, we would force the hand of big tobacco in a way that's never been done before to clean up their act. Um, we've been the catalyst for a lot of huge environmental changes throughout the world um, from being the first to do stuff like this. So I just want to encourage you to work on this with us. And we're really excited moving forward to figure out how we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. And now the next member of the public. <clears throat> Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mayor Bruner and City Council. My name is Sean. Um, and as a professional surfer, coordinator for the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve, um, run by a local nonprofit, Save the Waves. And growing up in Santa Cruz, I spent a lot of my time in and around the ocean. But you don't have to spend your whole life around the ocean or do numerous beach cleanups to understand that there's a trash problem here in Santa Cruz and across the globe. But as a beachgoer, the one piece of trash that stands out to me more than anything else in the, is the cigarette butt. Not only are they toxic to human health, health, but they are the, the most littered item in the world. I believe it is here in Santa Cruz, a place with a surfing reserve, marine sanctuary, and great stewardship leaders that can start a wave of change. I stand here today in strong support of an ordinance banning the, sa the sale of single-use cigarette filters in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, council members. I also want to mention that Taylor built all of these surfboards out of cigarette butts that he found on the beach. So pretty incredible, incredible work. Uh, my name is Trent Hodges. I represent Save the Waves Coalition. I'm the conservation programs manager. And uh, Santa Cruz is one of 10 world surfing reserves we have across the world. We have an incredible resource here in the Monterey Bay full of incredible surf and incredible marine ecosystems that we need to uh, protect. So I just want to mention that Santa Cruz has an incredible place in the world as one of 10 areas um, to be represented as a world surfing reserve. And as part of that world surfing reserve, uh, Save the Waves helps manage a stewardship plan uh, to help control contamination, to protect our coastal resources. And as you know, the Cal's Working Group and protecting Cal's water quality was a big focus. And uh, trash also needs to be a big focus for the World Surfing Reserve. And we know that cigarette butts are the most polluted uh, item we find in our beaches. And every beach cleanup that we do, along with groups like Save Our Shores, Surf Rider, and others, 
uh, consistently cigarettes are the number one item that we find on our beaches. Um, and we know that once we pick up a, a cigarette butt, it will return there the next day. Um, you know, data for years and years has shown us that cleanups uh, over and over again uh, are good to raise awareness about the issue, but really they're not a solution to the problem. Uh, as we saw with the California plastic bag ban, um, we saw that that was really the only change that allowed us to really make a, a dent in the plastic pollution problem here in California. Um, and so just like the, the plastic bag ban, we see that a, uh, an ordinance that would ban single-use filters could help us move in the, in the same direction. Uh, there's been some movement at the state level to ban single-use uh, cigarette filters, but we believe that Santa Cruz can really be a leader in this, uh, in this effort um, and can really cause a domino effect um, so that we can really make a, a difference here. Um, if, if not here in Santa Cruz, well, else I would say. So uh, we really look forward to working with all of you council members on this. Uh, thank you for all your leadership uh, in protecting the ocean and the coastlines of Santa Cruz. And uh, we strongly recommend uh, that you look forward to an ordinance for banning single-use uh, cigarette filters here in Santa Cruz. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the next member of the public. Hello, and thank you so much for your time, everyone. My name is Camila Vega. Today I'm here representing Save Our Shores. We're a local nonprofit to ensure ocean conservation throughout the community. On average, our volunteers collect around 17,000 cigarette butts per year. As a coastal community that relies on the health of our ocean, we strongly urge that you ban the sale of single-use cigarette filters. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Chelsea Woody. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz, co-founder of Textured Waves, an organization that promotes diversity in surfing and access to aquatic and outdoor spaces. And I'm an African-American female surfer. Um, the health of our environment affects us all. That's why I strongly support an ordinance banning the sale of single-use cigarette filters in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. How's it going? I'm Willem Banks. I'm just here to put more emphasis on the ban of single-use cigarette butts and plastics in general. Uh, yeah, as a surfer growing up in Santa Cruz, I love to see our oceans clean and for our generation and the next. And I've taken part in quite a few cleanups that I've given back to these works of art behind me. And it's not a pleasant sight to pick up cigarette butts behind um, fishermen and surfers that yeah, are uh, just littering as they're reaping the benefits from the ocean. So yeah, hopefully you guys can make a difference and help us out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you're not uh, in line to speak, if you could please have a seat just so I can see how many people are left. We have, um, okay, great. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Hi. Joseph Schultz, formerly known as India Joes. Um, it's great to see you in person in real. I uh, tried to comment in various Zoom uh, Zoom meetings you've had, and I was unsuccessful in getting any comments in whatsoever. So I, uh, you know, it's great to see you in real, even if you don't pay any attention to what I say. Um, I'm here for two reasons. One is uh, is to support uh, Food Not Bombs operation, uh, and the other is is to just uh, look at a larger question here. Uh, we're often asked to pass laws to prevent things that might end up being a problem. A uh, sleeping ban is a good example. No one is, is saying that sleeping by itself is any sort of a problem. But we want to ban sleeping because people that sleep outside might defecate in public or they might block the sidewalks or they might you know, do something antisocial. I'd like to separate out the harmless activities from the harmful activities. Um, I, I have no problem with, with, uh, with of uh, you know, criminalizing people who do an antisocial activities uh, of any sort whatsoever, but banning all activities in order to prevent some antisocial activities is a fool's game. Um, the cigarette ban is a really good example. Someone just said they picked up 17,000 uh, butts off the beach. 
it's a terrible thing and it's a drag and I'm sorry there's so many litter bugs in the world. There's, it's bigger than just smokers. But 17,000 butts is less than 1%, probably one tenth of 1% of the cigarettes that are smoked. So banning all cigarettes in order to get 17,000 butts off seems like, uh, um, it seems disproportionate. Um, uh, in the same way, uh, I think we can all agree that the homeless, or as, as they're affectionately known, are associated with certain problems around Santa Cruz. Um, I, I, I wouldn't deny it for a second. I deal with them on an almost daily basis. Criminalizing poverty, which is what we're really talking about, is not the answer to criminalizing um, the kinds of behaviors that we're trying to prevent. Um, and Food Not Bombs has done an extraordinary job for the last couple of years of providing a service at no cost to the taxpayer whatsoever that probably should be provided by some sort of governmental agency. Um, the raises that most of our government has gotten in the last year, the raise alone is higher than our total budget for the year. So I think that it's, it's an amazing bargain that uh, the city is getting for food night bombs. They keep the area clean. They're even pressure washing the streets afterwards. They, they're there for a very short period of time. They're in a place where it's unlikely that we're going to see the unsightly shanty town springing up around it. So um, minimal, um, minimal impact and maximum value. I, I, uh, I, uh, uh, Food Not Bombs will not be stopped, and if it's necessary to go to jail to support the uh, compassionate sharing of food, I'm, for one, ready to go to jail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Greg Bengston. I'm a uh, resident of Santa Cruz. I'm not sure which district I belong to anymore, but I will vote. I do vote. And I bring votes to the... Um, I live in uh, San Luis Park. Um, I do thank Food Not Bombs for keeping me alive. I also thank the police department and um, and the fire department for keeping me alive on a couple occasions, including Officer Bedeo out there. Um, but um, you never know where your life's going to be saved, and. Um, we need to keep options open for how that happens. Um, not block off things, but to allow things to happen. And to keep eyes open, ears open, souls open. Um, that's about all I have to say. But food not bombs, rocks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, it's nice to see you all in person here. And I, well, I would like to just say I really appreciate the fact that we can be here and you can be here. And I see you in your, well, actually in the authentic City Council chambers, which is great, because I think uh, it has been frustrating, I think, to many of us not to have the opportunity to speak before you to, because it feels to me like it's part of the democratic process is having dialogue with constituents and people in the community. And I think the Zoom world has made that. Uh, a substantial hurdle for many of us. And so I just want to thank you for, for opening up and having this here. I would also say that it's, I, I've been surprised that it was just word of mouth that I found out that this was even occurring. I haven't seen, and you know, I don't get the Sentinel on a daily basis. Maybe it was in the Sentinel, but I haven't seen anything in the Good Times. I haven't seen anything on the radio. And I see that chambers are relatively quiet at this point. And I, to me, it's, it's a cause for celebration because I think it's, it's an engagement with the community, and I feel like that's an essential part of being the representatives that you are. You're representatives of the community, and I think it's an important responsibility to communicate with the community to say, this is what's happening, or this change has occurred, or you can now speak in person. So I would uh, love it if the council or the city did some further outreach to really let people know, because I think it's really important. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Nice to be back here. Um, I want to tell you about my experience um, back in 2000, beginning and end of the 2011, 
through 2017, I believe it was, um, I did Food Not Bombs. And what my experience was is that we used to clean up very, uh, make it, sh make sure it was immaculate. And, um, excuse me, and what happened was we did public records request. And these people, a whole bunch of people wrote in and showed pictures of like a cup here or there, or a cigarette butt or whatever it was, which you can find all around the city, by the way. Um, once in a while, there'd be a little more there. And what we would find is, is we'd end up um, starting to um, get to Food Nut Bombs and set up, and we'd find things there that came from someone's kitchen. No way did it come from people living out in the street. It was looked like someone took their, their uh, garbage from their um, trash can and just threw it there, and then they would take pictures. So we started taking pictures because of that. So I've heard that one of the reasons that you want this permit is because you've heard negative things about things being found in the fountain and complaints, and you don't know who put that there. You really don't, if it was there. And I've also heard uh, many people go by and see that there have never, you know, that it's always clean. Once in a while, they may have caught it where someone from their house went there and dumped something there. Um, you know, it, I'm taking a risk by saying this, because by saying this, someone out there will get the idea and start doing this even more. So it, it, it's, it's to try to stop and make food not bombs look bad. And they help people. They know if you, if you stop them, and, and even if they were to get a permit, which I doubt it, which I will go to jail too, even if they were to get a permit, um, it's only four days a week. And if it was, if they had a move, people don't know where they're going to be. And it's just very difficult that there's, there's no other place for people to eat these days. They closed down the Monday Night Red Church. They've closed down places all over. This is how they sustain themselves. You've already taken away a lot of places where people live. And you're about to do that in San Lorenzo Park, which I highly suggest you don't. Um, anyway, so that's, I'm, I'm thoroughly against the ordinance that I think you have a second reading perhaps next time. Is anyone going to smile or shake their head? <laughs> Can't answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the next member of the public. Hi, welcome. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone is well. My name is May. Um, so I'm here on behalf of, well, myself, but I'm here in support of Food Not Bombs being permitted to continue its operations without a permit because they're feeding people who, in many cases, don't have a place to get food. And it's not only houseless folks that they're feeding. I'm pretty poor myself, so once in a blue moon, I will go there and get food because I have no other place to go at the time. Um, also, I'd like to point out that if uh, the city sweeps the bench lands, um, that's going to make it a great deal more difficult for service providers, be they med uh, medical professionals or um, case managers, to contact the people living in the bench lands because they're going to be dispersed all over the city, all over the place. And that's also, I think, for um, the business interests, that's going to be a bad thing because it's going to cause trash to pile up all over because there's not going to be any um, concerted area where people can put the trash away. So it's going to cause people to die as well because those people there are supporting each other in whatever way they can as the government fails to support them. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Please don't sweep the bench lands. And I am also willing to go to jail um, in defense of Food Not Moms. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I will now take it out to our Zoom attendees. I'm seeing a phone number ending in 1298. And if you have already spoken here in the chambers, if you could please have a seat. Thank you. Go ahead and unmute yourself on Zoom. Press star six. Hello. Hi, welcome. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi, my name is Kalia. Um, I am a local case manager at a shelter and I'm also pretty involved in serving um, the community experiencing homelessness. Um, and I'm really concerned over the lack of wraparound support for those living in the benchlands, um, considering the impending closure of the encampment in July. Um, throughout my service there over the past year, I've gotten to know folks who have no option but to live there. And I know the names of many of those whose lives are really fraught with the turmoil and exhaustion caused by city sweeps, natural disasters, and the uncertainty that's lying ahead. Um, and with the millions that are allotted for rehousing during COVID, it's really the right of our community members to receive the restorative support they deserve rather than punitive chasing. Um, we cannot close the bench lands or other encampments without providing these people safe, dignified, and supportive housing. And as an avid member of Who Not Bombs, who's relied on the re resources offered there myself, I urge the city to create policies that promote community members ability to serve compassionately and freely. We are trying to be the solution to our own community's unmet needs, and we need our city's encouragement so that we can focus on caring for one another. As a case manager at a shelter, I see daily how a lack of wraparound support for traumatized and marginalized folks passes these social ills on to future generations. If we want the best for our neighbors, we must realize that the vitality and morality of a place is most clearly seen in how it treats its most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, it looks like that concludes members of the public in the Zoom meeting. Um, and that concludes members of the public in person. And so um, I would like to uh, bring it back to council. I know there were a few uh, questions and statements brought up. Um, so we, since we're not allowed dialogue in oral communications, we do have the opportunity to uh, kind of further address some of the questions and statements that were brought up. Um, I would like to uh, start with um, the Cigarette Surfboard, thank you uh, for coming. Um, and uh, we did recently, as a council, write a letter of support on AB 1690 um, for banning single-use cigarette uh, butts. And um, I know that there's still work to be done. Uh, at this time, I don't know if there's any updates on that. but. Um, I do know that um, we have been uh, keeping keeping tabs on that that bill, and I know also I'd like to pass it over to Vice Mayor Watkins um, for an update that you had. Thank you. And yes, thank you for your presentation or for your oral communications. And although we can't take action or have, I know, robust conversation, I serve as a tobacco education in my other capacity and have been a strong advocate against big tobacco, as well as really pushing forward with our flavors ban that we enacted first in the county, then led to other jurisdictions assuming um, and following suit. So um, I just wanted to offer that I am a member of the Tobacco Education Coalition and there's a number of initiatives that are underway around um, tobacco waste policy, particularly around state agencies and county-wide agencies throughout the state coming together to come up with a framework for model tobacco policies as it relates to tobacco waste. And I'm happy to either connect you if there's questions and or if um, I know our county partners would be happy to come and present on some of the work that they're doing at the state level in regards to some of the tobacco waste um, initiatives and policies that are underway, really just factoring the realistic abilities for uh, ordinance to find success, not only in passage, but also in enforcement, right? We know that there's limitations around uh, capacity there. And then also just really thinking about how we're gonna be part of this bigger movement, which ultimately, as we know, it's about um, thinking local, local, but also the impacts of global. So um, I spoke to some of my colleagues at the county. They're happy to either be a resource to any community members or uh, council members and or more um, happy to come and present if we'd like to have that at a future time as well. So I just wanted to make that announcement. Thank you, and thank you for coming. 
Thank you for that update. Um, I also, sorry, uh, Council Member Cummings, uh, I know that you want, you had a question or you wanted to uh, address one of the oral communications. Thank you, Mayor. I had two um, items. One was a question for the city manager. There's obviously been some um, communications from the public related to the bench lens. I'm just wondering if, um, when we should expect some kind of update. I know that um, I'm not sure if it was quarterly homelessness updates or if we we're going to get um, updates with the city manager's report, which is every other meeting. So I'm just wondering for members of the public if we could just get an update on when we might hear more about that process publicly. Yeah, we appreciate the interest in that this evening, and thank you for the question, Councilmember Cummings. We are uh, currently working and planning to bring a quarterly update on May 10th. And so uh, Larry and Wally, as well as Lee Butler and our homelessness response team will be bringing a comprehensive uh, update on our, on our current homelessness response work, including a detailed implementation plan related to our homelessness action plan, as well as more details regarding uh, the closure of the bench lens as well. That, that'll all be on May 10th for those that are interested. Uh, more details to come. Thank you. And then the next item, so I just want to thank the um, Cigarette Surfboard people from, for coming out here tonight. Um, as you know, someone who has a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology and as someone who's dedicated their life to environmental conservation because of you know, what we were hearing about um, 20 years ago with, as it relates to the impacts of climate change, environmental pollution, and our need to do our part um, for future generations. I think that it's really critical that um, we're addressing these issues around pollution. Um, I've already conducted two beach cleanups this year, and I know there's a there's a uh, council competition again, <laughs> and I, I won that competition last year. Um, but I also um, was really compelled when I saw the pres when you all came out last year for your beach cleanup, and I know that this is something that um, your group and many other groups have wanted to address. And just want to state that, you know, for members of the public and the council, you know, this is an environmental health issue, or sorry, a public health issue. It's an environmental justice issue. It's a social justice issue. Um, we passed resolutions um, saying how cigarette butt waste is a problem. And we also know that this fits well within health and all policies. And I actually um, want to thank um, Vice Mayor uh, Watkins for, you know, the work that she's done and also pointing out that. Uh, county partners is willing to present on this item so i would be willing to pass a motion that we bring back an item for discussion no later than the second meeting in august to discuss the topic of banning single-use filtered cigarettes i think that this could be an opportunity for us to figure out a pathway forward if we want to put a, um put together a subcommittee if we want to bring an ordinance forward i think it's a great opportunity for us to hear from county partners and it's an opportunity for staff to hear from us and work with the um, members of the public who brought this forward so we can actually have an item on the agenda and have a discussion about how the city can move forward on this topic. Wait a second thought. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. <laughs> so uh, we have a motion from Council Member Cummings with a second from Council Member Golder to bring back an agenda item for discussion. What was the date? No later than the second meeting in August to discuss the topic of banning single-use filtered cigarettes in the city of Santa Cruz. May I just add one correction on AB 1690? So it was recently amended and it was stripped of. Where This is not the time, um, but I'm happy to have that dialogue with you after this formal process. Sure. Yeah, that part is just no longer part of the bill. That's why we're seeking a local ordinance. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I, I was wondering if the maker of the motion would be open to having a presentation from County Public Health just because they have done a significant amount of foundational work. They're connected to statewide county agencies that are looking at tobacco waste policy across the board. And I don't think, um, you know, it would behoove us in any jurisdiction really to be connected to these bigger initiatives and um, really just in terms of the bigger strategy. So a presentation I think would be a really great first step in terms of how to get us primed for what could be possible. I think we want to be informed. Yeah, no, and I, I think the purpose of this is to have, you know, those type of people come and give a presentation as you 
as you pointed out earlier. Yeah. And I'm happy to help arrange to have that presentation yeah. possible. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it would be great if staff could, you know, get input from the council as we put this together so that, you know, we're really trying to address the community concern and, and also the con concerns that um, members of our council have brought up. And the other thing, sorry, if I could just add, is tech is an open meeting, so anybody who's willing to roll up their sleeves, get to work, learn how to understand the issue, all the nuances of the issue, learn from the community, talk to the best practices, you know, they welcome your work and participation. So those that are interested, please join other community initiatives that are already working on this issue. And um, that's one way to do it. And let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm happy to hear that we're uh, taking this seriously and, and wanting to talk about moving forward. And I just wanted to ask Vice Mayor Watkins if you could share um, how folks who are interested might actually reach out and get involved in those efforts, just a, couple, a way to yeah, yeah, yeah. connect. So the county has a dedicated team around tobacco education, and there's the Tobacco Education Coalition, which is TEC, which is what it stands for. And they meet on a regular basis. They adopt a number of policy priorities and strategies, one of which was environmental impacts of tobacco waste, really working with other jurisdictions throughout the state of California to identify model policies that are enforceable that could have, you know, stand legal muster and also make an impact, I think, ultimately to uh, make a big movement and, and start to change the, the way that we do things. And I think the flavored tobacco ban, that's how I learned about it. There's model ordinance language. This is something that isn't, a, isn't out there, really, in terms of model language. So I think there's a lot of work underway, really thinking about holistically in, in strategy around it. Um, on the county website, there is a tobacco education page. And on that page lists a number of resources, as well as meeting um, times and welcomes participation for people who want to get to work on the issue, as well as um, you know really educated and knowledgeable professionals at the county who are willing to address the community and the public on where we stand and some of the bigger issues in, that are underway um, within the state. And, and yeah, and it's really exciting. Actually, there's a lot of movement happening in the next month or so, and that we're going to be hearing it from a number of statewide agencies to ultimately come up with a whole strategy around tobacco waste policy. So really a lot of stuff happening in this area. Lithia, I just want to say that the, the uh, public this is, health this is law not, center. It's not appropriate. Thank you. It's not a dialogue. I appreciate your, um, your passion for this. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, Council Member Cummings. Just one more uh, comment related to this is um, if we could also get an update on uh, the state bill. Uh, AB 1690? Yeah, at that time, yeah. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say that, you know, this is likely going to be a long process. I mean, as is um, a lot of legislation, especially when it relates to going after big tobacco. But, um, you know, hopefully we can have a robust discussion and figure out a pathway forward. And those are all the comments I have. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, the website is the County of Santa Cruz County Department of Health website. Uh, there, They have a tobacco page on the county website. And that was the website that Vice Mayor Watkins was referring to. Uh, with that, we have a motion on the floor. I'd like to ask for a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Calentari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone, for uh, oral communications and also for joining us here today in person. Continuing on with our agenda, bear with me one moment while I pull up the next item. <coughs> okay, next up on our agenda is item number 27. AB 481, Military Equipment Funding, Acquisition and Use Policy. For members of the public, 
who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation from staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. And at this time, I would like to welcome Interim Police Chief Bernie Escalante. Good evening. Uh... Can you uh, scooch it as close as you can to your mouth and speak right into it? Can you Thank hear me? you. All yes. right. Good evening, Mayor Brunner and Council. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Interim Chief Bernie Escalante, and I'm here with Sergeant Josh Trog from the Police Department. Uh, so tonight we got a, a presentation um, outlining the things that we've done, the things that we're doing, and the things that we will be doing, uh, according to Assembly Bill 481 uh, that passed in September of 2021. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Sort of uh, a, a lot of items here. We'll work through it as quickly as possible. Um, we'll talk about the purpose of AB 481, uh, the timeline. <clears throat> Uh, we'll define the military equipment that we currently have based on the definition of AB 481. Um, I won't go into our, the details of our policy, but our policy is online. It has been online, uh, policy number 705. Um, we'll talk about all the current inventory that we have, related policies and legislation that already govern uh, the use of this sort of equipment. We'll talk briefly about the citizen complaint process that, that exists now um, and reporting requirements, the annual reporting requirements per AB 481. Uh, all the community engagement that we've done over the last probably couple months and, and impacts based on you know, the decisions that, that you will make tonight. So again, as I mentioned, uh, this bill was signed in September of 2021. Um, it was effective January of, of this year. Um, essentially, in a nutshell, it uh, basically requires us to obtain approval from council to uh, acquire um, and basically govern the use of, uh, acquire the equipment, how we can or when we can acquire the equipment. Um, and it uh, requires us to establish a new policy and post that policy on our website and make it fully transparent to the community. Uh, it also requires public hearing. Um, not only the, the previous public hearings that we've already had, but also annually we have to report out on, um, to, to the members of the community. Um, and again, we will submit a, an annual report regarding uh, any use of the equipment, and there's more to AB 481, uh, any complaints that we've received, uh, any new equipment that, that we purchase, all of that needs to be included in that annual report. Um, per the legislation, the process of getting approval needed to begin by May 1st, so um, here we are just before that deadline. Um, next slide. So why do we have this equipment? Um, you, know, you will see shortly uh, that most of the equipment that we have are less lethal options for our officers to resolve very difficult, challenging situations. And the equipment that we have um, allows our officers to have additional tools and resources if they are appropriate for each and every situation. Um, and it allows our officers uh, to safely resolve situations, not only for the individual involved, but the greater community. Um, and at this point, we're not aware of any reasonable alternatives that do the same 
thing and accomplish the same goals that, that we're able to accomplish with this equipment. Um, typically, the equipment is funded through the general fund. Uh, depending on how much of the equipment we're going to purchase, we obviously follow city guidelines and, and policy around uh, certain levels of approval, whether it's city manager or the city council level. Um, but the, the money that we use is from our budget, uh, and we typically budget for that every year. We have used a federal grant um, to purchase the armored vehicle, uh, but other than that, all of our other equipment has been funded through uh, the general fund. Um, <clears throat> we do not participate in the program that's known as the 1033 program. Um, there's currently a resolution, I think, from back in 2020 that stated that we would not participate in that, and we do not. None of the equipment that we have currently was uh, um, purchased through or acquired in any way through the 1033 program. Um, and AB 41 does not distinguish the difference between how we acquire the equipment, whether it's general fund, grants, or the 1033 program. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. We still have to present it for approval uh, through you. So um, I'm going to have Sergeant Traug go through these categories, but based on the definitions from AB 481, these are the categories that we had to cover. Um, and so he will go through the different pieces of equipment that we have that fall under these, these categories. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, again, my name is Sergeant Josh Trog. I'll be going through the list of items with a brief explanation of each one and their capabilities, um, and then uh, go from there. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about this here every year. Next slide, please. Okay. So in category one, uh, AB 41 requires that we document uh, any type of robotics. Um, the Santa Cruz Police Department currently has one robot. It's the Recon Scout, which is depicted uh, in that photo, what it looks like. Uh, it is a, a small um, device that has a uh, remote control with a black and white screen on it, similar to a video game controller. Um, that can allow the robot to be driven around um, in the area that we put it in. It can't climb stairs on its own. Um, it has to be thrown. That's why it's called the Throwbot. It's fairly robust in its construction. It's designed to be thrown uh, to help it get into places where we don't need it, like balconies, things like that. Um, it uh, doesn't uh, record audio or video. Uh, we can't talk through it. We can't hear through it. Uh, the image that it projects on the screen is in black and white. Uh, it has some uh, low light infrared capabilities. Um, it can see in the dark to a point. Um, that is all we, the robot that we possess. Robots that we have access to uh, are the Avatar 2 uh, robots that the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office has. Next slide, please. Um, unmanned aerial vehicles, again in category one. I'm not sure if that was me. Uh, the unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles that we have access to are all owned uh, and operated by the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. Um, if we need them, we must request them. We have to follow their department's protocol for authorization uh, for use. Um, so it has to meet their, their guidelines for deployment. Um, feasibly, we could ask for something that they wouldn't allow us to use them for um, if, if that situation existed. Uh, they can be used in a number of instances, uh, mostly providing an aerial view of a given area. Uh, they, you know, natural disasters, significant uh, uh, critical incidents where we need to see what's going on over a wider area. 
um, it gives us that ability. Um, uh, and it helps us see uh, where people may be, where other officers are, just gives us a better idea of what we're looking at in the vicinity that we're working in. Next slide, please. So the armored personnel carrier, the Bearcat. Um, we've had it since 2015. Uh, it is a armored vehicle built on a Ford F-550 truck chassis. Um, it is capable of withstanding small arms fire up to 50 caliber um, and small explosives um, such can as... Can I stop you for a minute just with the mic and maybe we can take a minute to troubleshoot the mic and perhaps switching places with um, Chief Escalante so that you could pull it closer to your mouth. I know it's uncomfortable to have that screeching sound. Sorry to disrupt you. That's all right. Is that better? Yep. I Hopefully that works, and if not, I don't know if there's someone from IT the, available. The problem was I had to turn the volume all the way up because you were talking kind of low, and I think it kind of the feedback affected that. Okay, thank okay. you. Let's I try will, this. I will speak louder and more clearly. Uh, so the Bearcat armored vehicle, uh, as I said, is designed to withstand uh, small arms fire up to 50 caliber, and uh, it can withstand small explosives, uh, improvised explosive devices such as small pipe bombs uh, or classes of explosives like you would think of a military-style hand grenade that size. Much bigger than that, it's not designed to withstand. Uh, next slide, please. So with the Bearcat, we have already had a use policy for the Bearcat uh, since we got it. Uh, it has to be authorized to go anywhere. Uh, we have to sign it out. Even if we're going to take it and put gas in it, get the oil changed, anything like that, it has to be signed out. Uh, the reason why it's, why it's going out, um, and, and then it has to be signed back in when it comes back. So we know the timeline of how long it was gone. Uh, if it's to be used for critical incident, um, a uh, watch commander has to approve it if it's happening now. Um, if it's a pre-planned operation, that would go through the chain of command and decide whether the Bearcat would be used. Uh, we don't use it for anything. Uh, we don't take it out on patrol. We don't do car stops with it. We don't do anything like that. Uh, it only gets used in training or in operations where it is authorized to be used. Next slide, please. So some of the situations where it's been used, um, one of the most recent and, and tragic ones was on 6-6 uh, six, six of 2020 uh, when uh, Sergeant uh, Damon Gutzweiler was killed in the line of duty. The Bearcat was used to rescue officers who were pinned down by the suspect. In that instance uh, where the Bearcat was taken up there, the suspect had the high ground, um, had a tactical advantage over the people that were pinned down uh, on a very narrow mountain roadway uh, that was not a good position to be in. Um, and the Bearcat was used to get in there and get those people out safely without uh, any other serious injuries. Uh, the suspect was using IEDs had IEDs in the, sh in, the, in the form of pipe bombs, um, and the Bearcat was used to great effect to protect the first responders that were up there and many other people that were in and around the area. Um, so that was used for, you know, that's the purpose it's used for. Um, the Watsonville PD situation, uh, the subject had uh, barricaded in a vehicle with his child. Uh, there was numerous felonies that were wanted there that the subject was wanted for, but the sheer size and weight of the vehicle was used to stop him from being able to leave in his vehicle uh, and take the child elsewhere. And law enforcement was able to bring a safe resolution to that uh, without injury to the suspect or the child. Um, We've used it on uh, numerous barricade situations. Uh, in 2021, we had a, an armed barricade. Um, 
subject reportedly in possession of a firearm making statements about killing others and himself. We used it to provide coverage for the officers um, who were uh, dealing with that situation. Um, and, you know, numerous other instances uh, where it gets deployed um, with the approval of chain of command. And these are the types of incidents that we take it to. Next slide, please. So AB 41 also requires that we document anything that could be considered a command and control vehicle. So uh, those will be the next few slides that you see. This vehicle is a 2008 F-350 transport vehicle. Um, it's a standard Ford F-350 with a, with a box on the back of it. Uh, it's got multiple storage compartments. It's got bench seats in it uh, so people can sit in there. Um, and we keep all manner of equipment in there, um, shields, tools, uh, medical supplies, uh, things that we might need on an on a ongoing critical incident. Um, it provides us the ability to have that equipment on scene. Um, and then any other additional equipment we choose to bring with us is what we would use as in addition to people. The, this slide uh, discusses our Chevy Tahoe patrol vehicles. Uh, three of them are the marked black and white supervisors vehicles uh, that drive around the city every single day. The other one is a, uh, the one that the lieutenants drive. It's the same vehicle, it's just black uh, in color. Uh, they're all marked patrol vehicles and they can act as mobile command centers. Um, they have small compartments in the back of them that keep uh, different things, whiteboards, markers, medical supplies, and, and it can function as an, a uh, hasty command center if the need uh, exists. Next slide, please. Should we take a, a stretch break? A t two minute stretch break <laughs> while we figure this out. round uh, that's designed to defeat uh, locking mechanisms and hinges on doors. Uh, that is its purpose, to rapidly make entry into 
um, a structure. Uh, we mainly would use that in the event of a hostage situation when there, there are extremely violent things occurring now and we need to make entry and we need to do it as fast as we possibly can. That is when we would use this tool. The other is a 12 gauge uh, pump action shotgun. It's a Remington 870. Uh, it was repurposed from an out of service shotgun that we had. We had it rebuilt, um, brought back into safe functioning order, and it has been turned into a chemical agent launching shotgun, and that is its only purpose. It cannot, it is no longer capable of firing live shotgun rounds. So it can only launch chemical agents. It is marked clearly um, as less lethal. It, the, the stock and the forend are bright orange, like safety orange, and they say less lethal on them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so ammunition of greater than 50 caliber, uh, the launching cartridges for the 12 gauge launching shotgun, um, it is a black powder blank cartridge. Uh, and the expanding gases of when it goes off is what launches the uh, canisters from the end of the shotgun. That's what its purpose is. Next slide, please. Uh, specialized firearms and ammunition of less than 50 caliber. Uh, the department has four precision bolt action rifles. Uh, three are a company called Defiance that manufacture them. The other is Accuracy International. Um, they belong to a group of officers that are part of the Emergency Services Unit Tactical Team, uh, their Precision Rifle Team. There are four officers. Each one is assigned to his individual officer. They are not available for anyone. Uh, before an officer can actually use this rifle, they have to be selected to that team. They have to go through a selection process, and then they have to attend a, um, at minimum, a post-basic precision rifle school before they are ever allowed to deploy with this equipment. Um, and then the ammunition that goes along with it is uh, 308 caliber, uh, 155 grain match grade ammunition. Uh, it is extremely accurate ammunition. Uh, it's designed specifically uh, for these rifles and uh, they are designed to address lethal threats uh, and violent situations. Um, at distances and through barrier mediums that uh, other weapon systems cannot uh, defeat. And that is their purpose. Uh, next slide, please. So flashbangs, tear gas, pepper balls, and all under category 12. Um, so noise flash diversionary devices is the, the technical term for a flashbang. Um, the department has uh, two devices that fall under the flashbang category. We have uh, the Defense Technologies uh, low roll flashbang. Uh, that one's designed to, uh, if we use it in an indoor situation, it, it is designed such that it can't just roll away from where we put it. It uh, is designed so that it just kind of goes right where we leave it and uh, doesn't get away from us. But it is a device that emits a very loud bang and a very bright flash. Uh, it's designed to overwhelm and disorient, disorient people. Um, and it provides us a window of time where we can intervene in extremely violent situations. Um, this um, device is the, 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 the flash and the light and the pressure that it generates, um, it can be disorienting. And if that's the difference between uh, you know, saving a hostage and not saving a hostage, that's what we would use these, these types of devices for. Um, and they can be used factually as a distraction device. If I want to divert attention from one thing to another thing, this device could be used in that manner if it uh, is within policy and uh, the, the use is uh, justified given the instance that we're using it in. The other device that we have are called stinger grenades. They're a uh, rubber ball that has 60 32 caliber rubber balls inside of it, as well as a small NFD device. Uh, when it goes off, the device opens, separates, and it expels the uh, smaller rubber balls. Um, these are useful uh, in 
violent riot situations. Um, they can be used in small areas, uh, say on a barricade, armed barricade in a, in a building. If the suspect was in a small area, they could be used to help make that person want to leave the area that they're in. Um, and they, you know, it, 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 it's uh, got the NFDD uh, portion to it, so it's got a smaller version of the other flashbang, but it produces a, a loud bang and a bright light and a little bit of pressure when it goes off. Uh, next slide, please. So also in category 12, chemical agents. Um, these are all of the agents that the department has. Um, the crowd control CS canister, um, or riot control CS canister, uh, that device is intended for outdoor use. It uh, expels CS gas, uh, which is an irritant. It's uncomfortable to be around. Um, the tri-chamber flameless is a canister that expels CS gas, but it's specifically designed to be used indoors. It's a baffled device. It mitigates the risk of fire danger in indoor scenarios. Uh, the baffled launchable CS canister is a, also a baffled device designed to be used indoors, uh, and it is launchable. It's launched with that shotgun that I mentioned uh, earlier on in the presentation. Um, the triple chaser separating canister also expels CS. Uh, it is a device that once deployed, it separates itself into three smaller uh, canisters that expel CS. Um, it can cover a little bit bigger of an area, but with a smaller amount of agent. Um, aerosol OC fogger is a non-pyrotechnic device. It looks like uh, a bug bomb that you get at the hardware store. That's exactly what it looks like and functions like. It expels uh, OC, like what's in the pepper spray canisters that officers carry. Uh, works really well in small rooms, vehicles, things like that. And it, it is not pyrotechnic. It just uses uh, compressed air to expel the, the OC. And then the CS and OC liquid ferret projectiles, those are designed to be uh, defeat barriers, uh, windows, light wooden doors. Um, they allow us the ability to introduce agent into an area um, through a window, through a door. Uh, it's a small amount of agent, and when it goes in, the, the hardened uh, round, once it penetrates through the agent, it opens up and uh, puts the liquid agent inside the room most effective in, in small areas, and they are not for, they can't be fired at people. They can be fired into areas where people may be present, but they expressly cannot be fired at people. Uh, next slide, please. So pepper ball guns, the department has four. They are paintball guns. Uh, that's exactly what they look like and function like. Um, they fire uh, a round that is the size of a paintball, and instead of paint inside of it, it has a uh, irritant powder uh, derived from a pepper plant, and it can be you can you can fire it quickly. Um, a number of projectiles um, in a given area or at a specific individual, um, and that's what it's uh, it can do. It's designed to be used at specific people uh, who may be involved in behavior that is riotous, illegal, violent, uh, where we would be justified in the use of force to deploy it on that person. Um, it helps us not be indiscriminate. It's designed for uh, a point target, for lack of a better term. Next slide, please. So the LRAD, or the Long Range Acoustical Device, um, this is, uh, it's, it serves a couple of purposes. It, it's a amplified PA system that's portable, uh, very, very loud, uh, very, very clear. So we can use it to communicate with crowds, with people. Um, it can be heard a very long distance away. Uh, it can play pre-recorded messages. It can play MP3s. Um, it can play almost anything we want it to. Uh, it also has 
a hand mic for just like any other PA system so a person can speak live using this device. And then it also has an alert tone that is very uncomfortable to be around. Um, and it is a directed tone. It can be directed at specific individuals or groups of individuals engaged in behavior that needs to stop. And it is not a, a less lethal device. It's not a pepper ball gun. It's not a baton. It's an uncomfortable noise that makes people want to leave the area. And we can direct it specifically where we would like it to be. And it is, again, uh, helps us not be indiscriminate. It doesn't affect a crowd as a whole. We direct it where we want it to, uh, to be used. Next slide, please. So these 40 millimeter projectiles that, we will, that I will talk about here are all uh, less lethal munitions. Um, and they all are the same level of force, even if they uh, carry a, a irritant payload or some other type of, uh, like a marking powder payload. Um, so we have, the department has uh, single barrel launchers uh, designed to fire these 40 millimeter rounds. Uh, every single patrol car in the fleet has one assigned to it um, so that whenever a patrol car arrives at a given scene, there is always a less lethal tool available for the officer, uh, multiple in fact. The department has two four-shot multi-launchers. Uh, they are both assigned to the supervisor's vehicles. Um, And then with the uh, ESU tactical team has a six-shot multi-launcher um, that is assigned specifically to the team, and only team members can use it if, it, uh, if we are allowed to use it. Then the ammunition that we have are the exact impact, uh, the 40 millimeter, which is, uh, we call it a sponge round. It's made of foam rubber, um, soft it's spongy-like material. Um, the direct impact is a impact round that carries a powdered OC payload. So in addition to uh, the impact, less lethal force, you have the irritant powder that can be added to that. And then we have the marking round, which has a, um, it's like a powder that's really hard to get off. Uh, and if we need to mark a specific person, say if there's a, a, a uh, large scale crowd control event going on and there's an individual who's throwing rocks and it's only one individual or bottles or, or Molotov cocktails and we need to identify that person for arrest, we can use these marking rounds on them and it's hard to get off. It's hard to disguise that you were the person that was hit with this round and law enforcement can find you and take you into arrest for whatever or into custody for whatever crimes may have been committed. And then we possess uh, training ammunition. We buy these in 24-round kits. They're, much, uh, they're more affordable than the, the service rounds, and we can train a significant, significant number of officers for a lesser dollar amount. So that's where we, we purchase those. Next slide, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> so some of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention tonight is several laws or policies that already exist that govern how or when we can use these. All of this is considered use of force, and we have to justify it. And so there's many layers to what I believe uh, that exist that protect the civil liberties of the community that we serve. First is AB 48, it's, it's new. Um, and in basically what it says is that uh, it protects freedom of speech, it protects peaceful protests or demonstrations. And it, it clearly outlines when we cannot uh, utilize some of the less lethal options that, that Sergeant Trog just discussed with you. Uh, AB 48 clearly tells us that the situation needs to be dangerous, 
it needs to be violent and riotous for us to use these sort of devices. <coughs> Next slide. As I was just saying, our use of force policy, it's online, it's always been online. Uh, it drives a lot of what we do, and it's, it has always driven uh, and created the boundaries for us on when or, or how or, or um, in which situations this sort of equipment may be considered. Um, so our use of force policy, it used to say it had to be objectively reasonable. Uh, now it states it needs to be objectively reasonable and necessary. So there is a standard that's been in our organization and still is in our organization that is part of the policy around the militarized equipment and the, the equipment that we've talked to you about tonight. Um, this policy is still in place and it's something that we follow and we have followed and it really governs the use of some of this equipment or all of the equipment that we've talked about tonight. Next slide. Uh, our de-escalation policy has not changed. It's still in our policy. It's online. It's been online. Uh, we still require our officers to go through the process of trying to find a reasonable solution, a reasonable safe solution through using de-escalation tactics when feasible and appropriate. So this policy is still in existence and still applies when we go through the process of evaluating the use of any of this equipment and, and whether it also complies with this particular policy in our, in our organization. Next slide. <coughs> we also, as an, as an additional layer, we have policy 302. Uh, I'm not gonna you know, go through all of our policies line by line, but this policy also governs when we can use this equipment, the training that's required. There's only select people that have some access to this equipment at all because they have the training. If you're not trained on it, you don't use it. Um, and this particular policy speaks to, uh, it's, a, it's a guideline for us about the situations that it's justified versus the situations where it's not appropriate. Um, I would encourage you to go online and look at this policy along with some of the other policies that I've spoken to. Uh, next slide. Um, another layer to AB 481 is uh, creating um, a process and access to the community to file complaints about our policy, about the use of any of this equipment. Uh, we did not create a new system or a new process. Our current process is online under our transparency portal where you can access a complaint form. On our complaint form, there was an existing um, category, if you will, uh, that allowed members to check off. They had a policy or a question with, uh, they had a question about our policy and or our process. That is still in, in existence. Those forms get routed to our professional standard units, uh, unit supervisor, and ultimately we assess those complaints, respond back to the community members, and ultimately if there is an internal investigation, as you know, we have a police independent auditor that also reviews our investigations. Um, next slide. Uh, as stated before, AB 41 requires an annual reporting requirement. These are the categories that the report needs to include. Um, additionally, uh, if there was any request to acquire additional equipment, this is where you would find that request uh, is in the annual report. We also could always bring it to council separate from the annual report based on the timing, but this would also, you know, this, this report would include that process of explaining what we wanted, what we were requesting and why, and go through all the categories that AB 41 requires us to disclose. And there's an entire process uh, that includes public input and a public meeting uh, for, for feedback on 
anything that we want to acquire that's on this list. Um, and as you can see, the first one will be in May of 2023. Here's a quick rundown of what we've done up to this point. Back in March of uh, March 18th, uh, we posted our policy. Uh, we worked through, you know, feedback from the community. We had legal advice from the city attorney's office. Uh, we consulted with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office. Uh, other organizations in, in our county really tried to do our homework. It was a draft, and so it, we, we molded it as we moved along through this process. Uh, we had a public safety committee meeting, which all of this material was presented to the public safety committee members in March. Uh, I presented all of this information to the chief's advisory body in, uh, in April. Uh, April 11th, we had a virtual community meeting open to the entire public. Uh, and here we are, April 26th, and then ultimately May 10th would be the second reading of this proposed ordinance and policy. The impacts, um, you know, they're significant either way with whatever decision is made. Um, the continued use of, uh, of this equipment significantly increases the safety of the community as a whole not just law enforcement, but the, the, the subjects that we may be dealing with or anybody in the surrounding area. This equipment is less lethal. Almost everything on this list is, is considered less lethal use of force. And their tools, they're not appropriate for every situation or scenario, but they're, they're nice to have when you have them or when you need them. Um, and, and we feel that policy and law guide and govern uh, the safe use of all of this equipment. Um, obviously, there'll be a, a significant increased level of transparency, which we are totally in support of. This is what we have, uh, and, and the community knows what we have and, and when or how we can use it. Without approval, um, I will tell you, it, it will change significantly how we are able to respond to critical incidents. A lot of this equipment, allows distance for the officers to be able to address individuals. Uh, it avoids the need for physical force, or in a worst case scenario, uh, a higher level of force. Um, it, it is, most of this stuff is, is irritants and uncomfortable, but in my opinion, it is a better uh, response than physical force, or in worst case scenario, potentially lethal force. It forces the officers to get closer to a situation, and in some situations, I, I believe, would actually kick off a more violent uh, situation. Uh, it would change significantly our response to mutual aid. There's uh, every agency in this county um, depends on our armored vehicle, and they request it frequently, um, which is all documented. Uh, they, they actually use it more than we do. Um, but when they're uh, involved in a critical incident involving weapons in, in a, a violent situation, uh, without the approval of this particular piece of equipment, it would change the response to all the agencies in our entire county. Um, without this equipment, it's my, my belief that it decreases the safety of, again, everybody in the community. This equipment actually increases the safety and how we're able to uh, resolve real challenging situations. Um, there's a lot of training and there's a lot of skills that we would lose. There's been a lot of investment. Uh, these, these tools are not toys. We take them very seriously. Um, officers have to frequently and routinely train with them and continue to go back and retrain and be recertified in the use of this equipment. So to lose all of that investment uh, would be, would be uh, significant for us. Um, as the leader of the organization, I would say that officers would feel um, less safe. They were not being provided with the proper tools and equipment and technology that's available to the industry and I would have a hard time retaining and, and, and keeping officers in this organization. They would go to other organizations, whether in the county or outside the county, where they are allowed 
to have these tools to resolve some of these situations. Um, and I'm not aware of any reasonable alternatives. Um, and then that's part of AB 481, is if there's reasonable alternatives, that's a decision that all of you are here to make. Um, I'm not aware of it. Um, so uh, those are the impacts without approval. Next slide. Uh, to wrap this up, um, I really want to um, express, uh, I've been here for 25 years, and we've had all of this equipment for the last 25 years. Um, and I feel confident and proud to say that all of the layers of policy and law that already exist, I believe, have, has guided us in a real successful direction, and we've been able to resolve complicated uh, situations without the use of lethal force because of these tools. And of course, some of the other tools that we have, but they're not under uh, the, the definition of, of military equipment. Um, again, most of these items are considered less lethal tools, um, which again, that speaks volumes to our uh, abilities and, and uh, as we work through these situations and try what most is gonna be effective to resolve the situation. Um, again, th these tools aren't new. Uh, the conversations that have been going on, um, it, it, they make it sound like these are new tools. We've, we've had these tools and I think that we've done really well with the tools uh, and, and use them appropriately by what we're governed by. I think that's the next really nice slide. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Interim Chief Bernie Escalante and Sergeant Josh Trog. Thank you very much. At this time, I will bring it to council members for questions. Pardon me. Public comment on presentation. That will follow questions from council. Thank you. Do any council members have questions? I have one general question. I know that you mentioned that you use some of the um, items for training, but like how often do you use, it, it, these are sort of, I mean, are, do you use them regularly? Are they not used reg regularly? I, I see you're shaking your head, okay. Well, you know, just to clarify, uh, we train regularly. We train regularly. Um, I think in I had a question. Um, can you remind me on the uh, the agents, the liquid agents, and and is uh, can you give me an example of? Can you give me an example of the liquid agents, uh, the use of those, a scenario where that might be used. Can. Um, so there, there are, there's many different agents that we have. The ones that are the canisters that I spoke about, um, they are pyrotechnic devices, so their use is controlled on when we can and how we deploy them. So the ones that are designed specifically for indoor use, we can use those indoors. Um, how we would use those is if we are uh, – in, for instance, engaged with a armed barricaded person, uh, like a criminal barricade. Um, and we have been at it for however many hours, um, and we are trying to bring a safe resolution and sending officers into the, the location, it has a high likelihood of, of forcing a lethal force situation. So the in addition to the multiple layers that would be involved into, into a situation like this, hostage negotiation, mental health uh, professionals being on scene and engaged helping the hostage negotiators or the crisis negotiators, um, 
we may start to introduce agents to help that person want to leave and leave peacefully. These agents are uncomfortable to be around. Um, so we can introduce them to uh, create a situation where they don't want to be there anymore. And in addition to the other layers, they would come out peacefully and surrender. Um, we can use them to deny areas of a building. If we are involved in a criminal barricade and we know that the uh, armed subject is on the first floor and it's a two-story residence, I don't want someone that is armed having the high ground over the police officers and the ability to, to shoot down on us. So if we could use those agents to deny the second floor, make that an uncomfortable area to be in, and confine the, the uh, person engaged in the criminal activity to the bottom floor, containing the problem. Um, the liquid agents and the, the uh, pyrotechnic or gaseous agents are the same chemical composition. They just have a different uh, efficacy. So the liquid agents are going to be more uh, persistent in that they will hang around for longer, but they, ex they affect a smaller area. The gaseous agents can affect a larger area, but dissipate over time and go away and lose their effect. So that helps to clarify. It does, thank you. Um, and, and then I just, Thank you for showing uh, all the examples of what is defined as military equipment. I was surprised that some of the emergency response um, items and even the vehicle, uh, the SUV, would be considered a military uh, equipment. So it was helpful to have those visuals with each of those items to understand their use and how many you had. So my other quick question was, um, you listed quantities on all of those items that we have, and you had uh, said 25 years. Are any of them one-use items, or, uh, and how many, like what are they? And so would this um, AB 481, which would require um, purchasing of new, equipment, does that apply like if something's used and now it's no longer rechargeable or it's a one-time use item? Yes, so almost all of the uh, items on this list, uh, aside from all of the agents um, and the 40 millimeter less lethal, the launchers will keep, uh, the, they're more than one-time use, the shotguns obviously are more than one-time use, but all the ammunition, uh, things that would be classified as munitions are one-time use. Um, what we generally do is they all have a, a manufactured recommended lifespan. Most of it is five years. So we use the items in training because uh, training as close to realism as possible is best, and we cycle those through. So what we've done in the past is uh, the munitions that get towards closer to their expiration, we'll use those in training. We will refresh uh, the, the stock by ordering new. Um, and just sort of keep that cycle going so that we uh, don't end up with a whole uh, mass of expired munition that we can't use um, and we don't end up with just way too much stuff because we frankly don't have the room to store, you know, infinite amounts of this stuff. Um, does that answer? Yeah, that was my question. I was picturing how, that, how that's managed and trying to understand that. Thank you. That concludes my questions, uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for the presentation. And I just want to um, say that you know, being on the Public Safety Committee now for two years, um, you know, oftentimes I think people don't come to those meetings, and we have a lot of discussions around, you know, how um, equipment's used. And so I just wanted to um, ask a quick question, just to confirm. Um, Think something that I already know, but maybe the pub members of the public aren't aware of. Um, I remember back at some of our public safety committee meetings, and I was trying to look for an old agenda, but um, you all, I, I remember seeing kind of reported out the use of the Bearcat, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to the public on, you know, when equipment's used, how frequently um, it's reported out, and under what circumstances is the use of, you know, whether it's military equipment or standard issued equipment, like how often the use of that is reported out? Uh, currently, we're required to report out annually on the use of the Bearcat. 
to council. Um, and then now with AB 481, we'll now be required to uh, report out several factors, including the use of any of this equipment. So, um, yeah, and I think that the list for our Bearcat deployment is, is not large. Uh, again, it gets deployed regionally, um, and, uh, and we also capture any time it leaves the back parking lot. Did that answer your question? I'm not Somewhat, but I'm also curious about, because I know, and I think there's you know one item in particular that people have brought to our attention, which is um, the fact that one item of standard issued equipment is the AR-15, and also the fact that, you know, Pistols can be considered, you know, lethal use of force, yet they're not on this list because they're standard pieces of equipment. And so I guess, you know, for example, when officers pull their guns or if someone, if they discharge their arms, is there any policy related to how that's reported out? Yes, a good question. So we have a use of force form. And so anytime a taser is deployed or, um, you know, just um, pulled out, displayed, the officers have to fill out a use of force form that gets reviewed by the supervisor and, and the watch commanders. So the same is true with any of this equipment. I mean, all of this equipment would be followed by a police report justifying the use of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, every time you, use of force is applied, they fill out a form and, and write a report on that. Okay, I have a couple of um I have a couple other questions, if that's okay. Great. Um, I also was curious because some members of the public have mentioned, you know, <clears throat> AR, like AR-15s are, um, you know, firearms that are meant to kill. And, you know, these historic, you know, in the past, I would imagine those weren't standard uh, issued pieces of equipment, but now they are. And so I'm just wondering, what is the process for making something a standard uh, piece of equipment for public safety officers, does that come through the council or is that is there a policy on that? Um, because I guess the question is, you know, there are a number of pieces of equipment that we saw presented to us that are not lethal or they're less lethal. And I think for some folks, they'd be curious about understanding you know, how does something like an AR-15 become a standard piece of equipment that's not listed on this list, whereas we have, you know, um, pepper ball guns are something that are on this list. And so I'm just wondering if we can kind of if you might help the public and council understand how certain pieces of, of equipment become uh, standard issue that might be considered lethal in military versus others. Yeah, you know, the, the AB 481 does not define standard issue, uh, unfortunately. And, and what we would define standard issued equipment is, is equipment that we uh, hand each and every officer to uh, go out into the field with. So, I mean, you could say their, their ballistic vest is standard issued, right? Their axon body camera is standard issued. Uh, their, their sidearm service weapon is standard issued. Around the AR-15, the way that these are defined uh, as far as in AB-481, it excludes those weapons because it discusses that the, uh, it, the exception is standard issued service weapons. At the Santa Cruz Police Department, every officer is assigned their own AR-15. I don't know if that's the case with other agencies in the county or in, even in the region. They have their badge numbers on their weapons. They are specifically cited in for those individual officers, and they go out into the field with their own weapon system, not only their handgun, but their rifle. Uh, we do that for a variety of reasons. One is they are required to maintain their own weapon uh, they are required to keep it sighted in for accuracy. Um, we, if we have to use lethal force, uh, you need to be accurate, right? I mean, there's other citizens around potentially. Uh, so that's very important. So several years ago, uh, we made the investment to, to purchase a rifle for every single officer and they deploy out into the field with their rifle. That's why we did not include that in this list because we consider it their service weapon that they deploy with every single shift. And I guess I'll ask <clears throat> one more question. Um, is there a place on the city's website where people can find policies on the use of lethal and non-lethal force? And also, 
um, is there a list or would it be appropriate for us to direct a list of the various types of lethal and non-lethal standard issued equipment? And I ask that because, you know, I think we'll have a list of what's considered military use equipment, but I'm not sure if it's clear if, to the council or members of the public if some of this standard issued equipment is actually, if there's public information on that. And I think that um, one issue around transparency is just understanding what those pieces of equipment are. And since we're moving in this direction of making, you know, the military, militarily acquired equipment public, then, you know, is there an opportunity for us to do this with the standard issued equipment as well? Yeah, I, I will reference one of our policies. It's 306.3.0. 306 and just an excerpt out of that policy, it says, quote, authorized department issued patrol rifle is the AR-15. That's in our policy. Our entire policy is on our transparency portal on the Santa Cruz PD website. All of the policies that I referenced tonight um, are are on online for anybody to look at. Um, so I think that that answers answers your question. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you. For the, the overview, um, which is was somewhat daunting, um, I'll say just for me to hear all of those, all of that listed out, and um, you know I appreciate getting a better understanding of their purpose. Um, I'll have comments on that later, but for now, um, so one of my questions was about the potential to make uh, available lists of uh, other equipment that is not. Uh, required uh, under the purview of 481. My understanding is that the uh, law does not preclude um, adopting stricter uh, regulations in our own local ordinance ordinances or uh, providing that additional information. And so I'm I'm very interested in trying to find a way to make that uh, information available to the public as well. Um, so I'll I guess I'll. I, that, I sort of got an answer, I think, um, but I'm, I think about it a little bit more. Uh, maybe come back around during comments. Uh, my my question right now is related to the fiscal impact and, and costs that are associated with uh, these uh, this equipment. The inventory has a um, pretty clear listing of the the costs for these items in and of themselves. But you uh, highlighted in your presentation the uh, considerable amount of time that goes into training and, um, uh, you know, uh, preparations for, you know, the, the personnel costs and the training costs associated with the potential use of this equipment. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, is there a way that we might be able to get a handle on that? Um, you know, you, you've suggested it's a significant investment, and um, it would be helpful to know a little bit more about that as well. Um, and I'm not asking necessarily for that information in the moment. I know that's, um, and I'm not asking for some kind of accounting of all of the hours or time and what the time is spent on, but it would just be helpful to have some sense of the associated costs as well. I see uh, City Attorney's Office stepping up to Good evening, the Mayor, City Council members. Um, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, the the annual report that SCPD will be required to provide to council a year from now will include that information. That annual report should include uh, the total annual cost for each type of military equipment, including acquisition, personnel, training, transportation, maintenance, storage, upgrade, and other ongoing costs. So you will receive that um, within a year from now. And also keep in mind some of the standards that we have to meet are, are guided by post uh, that are requirements of what we have to meet. And our tactical team has to train so many hours every month um, or else they become a huge liability for the city. Understood. I, I didn't mean to suggest that there should, those costs should be reduced or in any way. I'm just kind of wanting to get a handle on what, what it looks like. So I have one more quick question. My understanding now is that uh, standard issue uh, equipment can overlap with the military equipment. 
or not? Well, per AB 481, you could decide to put whatever equipment you want to put on the list that we have to report out to. That, that's ultimately your decision. If you want to go beyond what is defined as military equipment per AB 41. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions from council members? If not, I will take it out to public comment. I'm going to check the uh, Zoom attendees. And I see one attendee in Zoom with their hand raised. And that is uh, Joy S. If you are watching from uh, via Zoom, uh, now is the time to call in and comment on item number 27. And you can press star 9 to raise your hand. And you will have three minutes to speak, or you can choose uh, the raise hand feature on your webinar controls. Okay, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, thanks. Hi, this is Joy Schendeldecker. Um, I just wanted to speak to one particular area of this report. Um, there's, I think, a lot in every type of, of equipment that could be addressed, but um, the tear gas section, just because I know a little bit about this equipment, and it's, it's really disturbing that we have so much of it in stock, um, especially these triple chaser CS canisters which are chemical weapons that are banned in war uses, but not in domestic policing situations. Um, for example, they've been used extensively in Portland, Oregon, Ferguson, um, Standing Rock, um, you know, often used against people who are Black Lives Matter or indigenous land protectors, um, protesters. Um, I, I think generally they, they escalate rather than de-escalate situations. They don't keep the populace safe, whether they're used on individuals or crowds. When they're thrown, they separate into three parts. So they're kind of hard to control where they're gonna land, who they're gonna hit, um, and how people can get away from them. Um, they also, in the report, it says that they do not cause allergic reactions. Um, which is, they do cause allergic reactions. There's extensive safety information that you can find with an internet search. You can find the official um, safety data sheet for these canisters. Um, it's a 19 page <clears throat> document. Um, they also come with a Prop 65 warning that they, um, they include lead salts and hexavalent chromium, which are known to the state of California to cause cancer. And they also contain lead salts, which are known to the state of California to cause birth defects or other reproductive harm. Um, they obviously can cause serious injury um, because they're projectiles. Um, they contain heavy metals. They are persistently toxic in aquatic environments and they're toxic to people and animals. Um, there are several lawsuits in Portland that are ongoing because people have had um, problems with their health following exposure, even when they have not been protesters. People who just live within, say, a mile of where um, these have been used. Um, they also, you know, they're not so expensive, but they only have a shelf life of five years. So it's a kind of a, a cost where you have to keep buying them um, and keeping them in, in store. and. Um, ultimately, they have to be disposed of as hazardous waste, which we know that our hazardous waste goes into 55-gallon drums and then is sent elsewhere, so then just polluting some other community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. I will now bring it to a member of our public, 
and I'll do an alternating rotation here. So please step forward. Thank you for waiting. My name is Lee Brokaw. I'm not speaking for the ACLU, but I am chairman of the ACLU Local Boards Police Accountability and Transparency Committee. I'd like to thank, thank the lady for her uh, in-depth knowledge of tear gas. I've been tear gassed by the best of them, uh, Highway Patrol, uh, Berkeley Police, and Alameda County Tax Squad. And I can tell you that they evacuated hospitals and schools because of the drift of the tear gas. Um, I am here to tell you, um, well, first of all, I've already communicated to you in writing in depth, much more logical than I'll be able to do tonight. I'm here to tell you that uh, Santa Cruz Police Department has not satisfied the requirements of AB 481. Um, the state has provided the people of this state the opportunity to look at what the police department have in the way of weapons. And what Santa Cruz Police Department has done is they have left off their assault weapons. And I heard a discussion uh, here uh, amongst the staff and or the council and uh, interim chief Bernie um, about um, service, standard issue service weapons. And that is what he's hanging his hat on by not telling you how many assault weapons that we have in this city. Um, I asked him specifically, I said, I've never seen anybody on a bicycle patrol with an AR-15 over their shoulder. He says, no, they don't. I said, I've never seen anybody walking the streets of Pacific Avenue with an AR-15 over their shoulder. He says, no, they don't. And they had considered putting them on motorcycles and then decided against it. If it is a standard issue, it is carried all the time. The Glock 22 is a typical standard issue of police, and it is carried on a holster, and every single officer carries that weapon. They wouldn't even take them off for the Martin Luther King March at the request of Brenda Griffith and NAACP. So the argument about standard issue does not hold. And I would just like to say that Santa Cruz is an outlier. Just on a random survey on a Sunday afternoon, when I would have rather been doing other things, I found out Capitola, Scotts Valley, Watsonville, Santa Clara, Santa Clara Sheriff, San Rafael, Napa, Berkeley, Folsom, Oceanside, San Diego, San Diego Sheriff, and guess what? Andy Mills in Palm Spring all list their assault weapons. I asked Andy, I said, I, well, I called him up and, and congratulated him for publishing his assault weapons, and he said there were people there who urged him not to do it, and his reply was, follow the law. So one of the things that I've done for this community was advocate strongly to hire Andy Mills, and I'm proud of that. And he's following the law. I've offered to work with the city attorney and the interim chief. Uh, I bring the Quakers with me. I bring the ACLU with me and go through all of this and make sure that this is in compliant with 481. As it is presented tonight, it is not. Thank you it's for your It's in violation comment. of the law. And now the next member of the public. Hi there, welcome. Hi, my name is James Ewing. Um, Sheriff Corner Jim Hart and Sergeant Robbins gave a presentation on March 22nd. Pretty good, similar to yours. I appreciate that you guys provided similar and different information. Thank you. Uh, then I think it was April 10th that some other, that Sheriff Corner Jim Hart produced a little bit shorter presentation. So this is all public information. The, uh, what day was that? That's the March 22nd. Oh, so wait, I'm incorrect. Come on. March, excuse me, the, the April, uh, okay, I have the, the date wrong. But there's some information that is not being disclosed as far as the other weapons that can be used. Um, there was the long-range uh, sonic weapons, the VARs. The phase array antennas also do that kind of damage and have effects. This is a really powerful weapon. Only one watt, depends on how far it is from you, but it's actually a really powerful weapon. By my count, there's over 50 phased array antennas. The one that's just right up the street across from the post office, um, 
That technology is very clearly explained. This has only one watt. Uh, one of the devices is eight 300 watts. The other one is three 500 watts. You can kind of imagine uh, Star Trek lasers. Those things operate in billions of trillions of times a second. Um, I actually thank Justin Cummins for bringing up what's not listed, and that's the standard issue equipment. So maybe the phased array weapons are just standard issue to control people in this county, and that's why it's not listed. So I'm looking forward to being here more and maybe sitting down with you a couple times. And I thank you guys for what you produced. Thank you very much. And thanks for the comments of the staff. Thank you. I'll, I will now take it to a member of uh, on Zoom. If you can just hang on one second, I'll do an alternating method here. Uh, so I have out in Zoom uh, a couple of participants. And the first hand raised is Jennifer Tu. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me clearly? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Jennifer Tu with the American Friends Service Committee. Um, and I just wanted to encourage the council to, uh, to, to really think about um, under what circumstances um, this equipment should not be deployed. Uh, we heard in the presentation tonight about the extensive training, and we learned a lot about who is allowed to uh, to deploy this equipment. But we we haven't heard anything about when the equipment should not be uh, deployed. So uh, one particular example would be: uh, should any militarized equipment be deployed when there are children present, when there are elderly present, when there are vulnerable uh, population members present? And so um, I would really encourage the council to consider giving this guidance uh, to, to the police department on under what circumstances the equipment should not be deployed. Uh, kind of similar to that, um, in the presentation, uh, we heard about how uh, 40 millimeter uh, impact rounds could be used in, uh, in protest situations. But then later in the presentation, we also heard about how AB 48 uh, does not allow that circumstance. And so that's also a similar situation that uh, it would be really helpful if the council could uh, could clarify. And then I just wanted to echo what uh, the previous, uh, a couple speakers ago, uh, Lee had mentioned about the um, AR-15. And, uh, and just close with a, a question for the council, which is um, we, we've heard that uh, the AR-15 is standard issue for uh, for your police, and we've also heard that they do not actually carry it, um, as, as the previous speaker said, in all circumstances. The, the, the question I would like to leave you with is um, what, what public safety concerns does the city of Santa Cruz have that is different from all of these other municipalities that, uh, that Lee had surveyed? and found weren't using AR-15s as standard issue, but had included them in their AB-481 policy. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next Zoom attendee is John Lindsay Poland. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me okay? Yes, welcome. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is John Lindsay Pohl and I work for the American Friends Service Committee and we have been conducting a study of militarized equipment used by law enforcement throughout California for the last year, really multiple years. And um, the first thing I want to just emphasize is that the AB 41 gives you 180 days from the uh, presentation of the proposed policy by the department to make a decision before uh, the lack of making a decision has any impact on the use of the equipment, which means that you can talk to the department, you can talk with community members, you can talk with constituents, you can go back and forth, you can send it to a committee. You can do a lot of work on this in 180 days to make sure that it's a good policy. Um, I was in one of the community meetings with the chief in which uh, we talked about the AR-15s. And I asked that question specifically of the chief, 
is there, given that there, the surrounding jurisdictions and other jurisdictions in California are not classifying their patrol rifles, which they have, 95% of these departments have them as standard issue. What is the public safety circumstance in Santa Cruz that has led you to issue these as standard issue to your officers? And the chief did not have any response of any public safety difference. So even if you're, you don't want to go to them and say they shouldn't be standard issue or you, they should be justified as why they are standard issue, at the very least, you should ask for a transparency piece, which other departments have done. Capitola said they are standard issue for them, but as a, as a um, transparency measure, they are including them in their military equipment policy. I want to remind you that use of force throughout this country by law enforcement is used disproportionately against people of color. When you include military equipment into that equation, it amplifies the harm. So the, the disparate impact of use of force by law enforcement is amplified when you have um, uh, militarized equipment, which makes it all the more important that you have um, what other callers have called for, which is prohibitions on certain types of use. To be clear to the department that you want certain types of things prohibited, out, you know, laid outside the u authorized uses of that equipment, rather than language like included but not limited to, or other types of fairly ambiguous language. Um, so I hope you will send it back to staff and we are very willing to work with you in any manner in order to make this a good policy. Thank you for your comment. I will now take it to the pub members here in person. And first member of the public, thank you for waiting. Please approach the microphone. Welcome. Morning myself too. Uh, I'm John Golder. What the heck is this? Sorry, I apologize. Uh, I'm the alleged victim of the uh, uh, um, August 21st Santa Cruz Maniac ride out. You can ask Renee what I looked like. Um, our number one uh, civic and community goal is informed and involved citizenry and responsive and effective government, which is a clause I had inserted in the general plan and unanimously voted by the council on my birthday in 2008. Um, during that event, which was two months after the city council passed three ordinances to control mass rallies and events and marches and protests, every single traffic law in the city was violated. And, and 5,000 bikers came through this town and raised hell. And uh, the Santa Cruz uh, Maniac, Maniac Rideout webpage has 13 photos of the clubs with their star riders or presidents, I don't know who. And if you push on those, those pictures, you'll get a video with a song, which will tell you exactly what it was all about. And basically, it was all about, we're the stars, we're the show, we don't follow the rules, get out of our way. And uh, I watched the whole thing. I'd seen it years before, but it was... It was incredibly disruptive. And of course, I've had conversations with, with many, many people after what happened to me. And uh, uh, there were hundreds of events. I did a records request for every 911 call that was re uh, referred to city services. I got eight responses, including mine. My victims, at, my, the officer who wrote the report completely screwed it up. I didn't get to see the report till, till a few weeks ago. And uh, Everything I told him was wrong, and I'm going to do a citizen, citizen supplement. And my victim's advocate didn't get back to me till, Jan till uh, uh, December. And the next thing she told me was the case was closed because they couldn't find the, t the security tapes. You know when they looked for them? In January. I don't keep security tapes around that long. I saw at least three uh, uh, cameras that could have caught it. So real quickly, um, uh, negligence by the city, a sloppy ordinance had 
uh, language like uh, disturbs the normal flow of traffic which the city doesn't have, vagueness in the law, uh, uh, and I'm not going to hit these, but get yourself a copy of the California Peace Officer's Legal Source Book. That, I got the law library to get that, and that will inform any citizen how the police are supposed to act in every situation. And anybody with a, uh, you know how good a book that is. It tells everything an officer should do in different situations. Have it available as a resource for the people to learn and be informed and involved so these guys can be responsive and effective. And we won't have civil unrest and need all these damn weapons. Thank, Thank you. you for your comment. Our next member of the public, please approach the microphone. Um, I want to provide a perspective that might be somewhat general and a little bit unusual maybe in this type of discussion. Um, the Bearcat was pretty new. We just bought it a couple years ago. Actually, I think we got it free um, from the federal government. And so it is actually new. And I object to a lot of the language through, the, through this presentation. It's basically an advertisement. And I've seen this before. I saw it when the community found out. We found out quite accidentally that the city was considering acquiring a bear cat. We had a, a robust protest um, when that happened because it was military equipment. And we fortunately found out about it. Um, but it is new, and this is an advertisement. I want you to know that. It is an advertisement to use military equipment in a civil setting. So at this point, I just want to say we're facing food shortages. We're facing increasing numbers of people being homeless because after 30 to 40 years of this neoliberal agenda with a concentration of wealth, which is a weapon used against people, poverty is a weapon. Having people out there deprived of mental health services when they desperately need it, it's a weapon. I know of a young journal gentleman this, in this community who's out on the street. He had an uh, interview with his therapist yesterday. He's not getting another one for six weeks. This is for somebody who needs probably a couple appointments a week. I'm saying we need to address the needs in our society, people's needs, need for food need to have uh, environments that are not so polluted. The military is one of the biggest polluters on the planet. Please, let's step back and really get informed and not just swallow this advertisement like we swallow commercials for food with corn syrup that is also lethal. We need to step back from this way of policing our community. I want to add by saying I've been able to absorb some presentations up at UCSE. I wish I could remember the lady's name, so I'm not going to try to say that. But she studies the police nationwide. Her researchers research nationwide. The police in LA are providing computers to elders in communities as a way of securing their favor. We cannot just go blithely into acquiring military equipment except very keenly, very specifically. And I want to say Lee Brokaw told me that in that first incident that was listed up there, that the equipment was used on 6620, a resident took the assailant down, tackled him. None of the equipment was used for that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And next member of the public here in person. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Fitzmorris. Uh, the last time I testified here was 2015, and it was against the Bearcat. And I walked out the door. This place was crowded. I walked out the door, and I was uh, immediately intimidated by a lieutenant of the police department for not understanding what the police needed in order to do their job. I understand how intimidating this situation can be for you. I, I, the presentation was full of that type of intimidation. You're going to lose officers. You're, you're going to risk lives. You're going to, those kinds of intimidations, which are constant. You have to decide what your legacy is going to be. This is a moment to decide that. Do you know what time it is? Do you know what day it is? Do you know what year it is? This is not even 2015, when maybe there was something in someone's mind that said the militarization of the police was a, not a bad idea. This is a new, this is a new day. 
we're in a transformative situation. And it's a transformative situation that may in, in up, end up protecting the police by making them more integrated into the community rather than to be the force that controls the community. Now, I know what the word police means. I know what the word policy means. You do policy. They do police. And there's two different things. And everything I heard in the report that had to do with policy, I, you take it with a grain of salt at least. I went to every swearing in I could go to when I was in office. Everyone. I met the families. Every time I heard a siren go off from 1998 to 2006, I felt responsible for the person who was in the vehicle. You know, I knew they were in danger. I knew that was a difficult situation and that I would have to live with whatever my decisions were with regard to them. And I know you feel the same thing. I really respect that, that this is an important decision. And you're going to want to figure out a way to costume them with power. To costume them with power. And I work in a prison. I've, I've been involved in, in pepper spray events and riots uh, maybe a dozen times in the last six years. I've seen the costumes of power and the necessity for being able to control events. But please, please understand that this is your legacy. You will be judged by this. There's, this is the reason I came back after five, you know, seven years to, to address this body. It's because this is important. Because now is the time to change what policing is in our community. And the only way you're going to do that is by changing the costume, by ch taking away the armor and putting people out there with all the vulnerability that citizens have when they address each other. We all have that vulnerability. I really like the fact that the AR-15 was brought up. That shows you that things are not being presented accurately. That's a problem. I hope you will take that seriously. Um, I think I've said what I need to say, and I, I do appreciate what you, what you folks have to, to decide, but decide carefully, because when the results occur, your name's going to be on it. This is not them. They're the people who are operating the system. You're the person who's in charge. You're the person whose name is on everything they do, everything they do. You know, they, they, they follow orders, and they're, when, they're, when they're at their best, they do it excellently. But Thank you. Beware. Thank you for your comment. Next member of the public, in person, please step to the microphone. Welcome. Good evening, council members. I can't resist saying you should be proud of this day today. I feel like we could be on the verge of saying you hit a home run this day after having been here this afternoon and having feeling appreciation for what you're doing right now, which is something that's long overdue. This is not a topic over history that has been widely discussed at Santa Cruz City Council meetings before. And I don't know who it is, but we should thank the author of AB 481 that it's a, co a topic tonight, because this is darn important. And the Deputy Chief, I, please forgive me if this is impolite, but I want to say something that you said in different words. You, should, you said something to the effect that I bristled at, and that was that we should use uh, those tools that are available to the industry. And I recoiled when you said that, because we should use those tools that are available to protect public safety. We've painted it on our police cars for decades, and it's not about the industry. It really isn't. That's what's wrong here tonight is that it is, should not be about the weapons industry, should not be about, can we get a better toolbox? I mean, it's a nice metaphor, it's okay. But the fact is, we should be seriously and repetitively thinking about these things that are happening in our town, and they're happening in towns all across the country, and whether they are the things that are right for protecting the public safety. So let's think in that frame most of the time not what's the best tool in the industry. And I just want to say some brilliant comments happened tonight already. And regarding the use of force in incidents, which when I was on the city council for eight solid years, sometimes wonderful, sometimes dragging my feet ever so slightly, um, those discussions didn't happen. I think it's unique that we're having this discussion tonight, and it's important and it's valuable for all of you and all of us who participate in this thing 
called community government. And so why should the use of force incidents be hidden away in reports that just happen to come forward to the Public Safety Committee, get read there, but nobody in this town or very few people even know that those meetings are taking place? And somebody even made a comment that people don't come to those meetings. I know three council members go to those meetings. I was one of the first ones that did that. And I wasn't thrilled with it because we used to have a Citizens Police Review Board. And that was a good thing. I know that it had problems, but it was a good thing that it maintained every single year these discussions. So keep having these discussions. Be happy that you're going to hear this again on May 10th. And between now and then, put in some modifications to this so that if we're going to have AR-15s, we at least acknowledge it. They're designed to kill people. Thank you for your comment. Next member of the public in person. Good evening. I'm Scott Graham. Um, uh, the chief of police was mentioning appropriate use for the situation, and I'd like to give a few examples of where this went awry. Uh, many years ago at the town clock on New Year's Eve, two minutes after midnight, the police in full riot gear surrounded the crowd and to tried to disperse everybody instead of letting people enjoy the moment. Well, somebody, some drunken inebriant in the crowd decided to throw a bottle at a police car. So then the uh, police went into high gear and started corral corralling the crowd and forcing them down Pacific Avenue instead of down Water Street towards the jail. It made ex absolutely no sense to herd people down Pacific Avenue. And then once people were being herded down Pacific Avenue, of course, a number of other drunken idiots started breaking windows. To me, that was all caused by an inappropriate use of force by the police. If the police hadn't tried to break up the New Year's celebration two minutes after midnight and it had allowed people to just enjoy themselves for a few more minutes, none of this would have happened. Um, it happens all the time, not only here, but in the, all around the country, where the police show up in riot gear to some peaceful gathering, whether it's a protest or not, and the police, because they're in riot gear, cause a riot to happen. Uh, that's not appropriate use. Uh, another example, Sean Arlt. He had a rake he was swinging around. An appropriate response would to be to check him with a shovel, not sh unload your gun into him, um, which is what happened. And the city paid millions of dollars to his family because of that. Uh, so, you know, when you, you hear that they're going to use appropriate use, there's too many examples when that doesn't happen. Um, I would implore you to not rush this through. There's no reason to rush this through. There should be a bunch of public engagement in this. this the, the citizens of this city need to be engaged, need to be part of this process. So, you know, having one Zoom meeting is not public engagement. I'm sorry. Um, so we need to have a lot of meetings, not just one. We need to have several meetings. So put this off. Do not pass this tonight. Please let the public be involved in this. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. It, it looks like that concludes our public comment uh, from in person as well as Zoom. And uh, actually, there's one hand. I'm just double checking Zoom. There's one hand raised. If you are commenting on item number 27, uh, your phone number ends in 5542. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, Council Members and Mayor. I'm on the Pomeranz. 
A few years ago, I was very impressed and admired how Police Chief Mills set in motion, how he would move the Santa Cruz Police Department's role towards 21st century policing blueprint. In part, that would mean police officers would see their role as guardians and not warriors. The equipment and use policy guidelines before you today run contrary to this direction. There's six pillars in the 21st century policing blueprint. Take note of pillar one, building trust, pillar four, community policing. The question I pose to the council tonight is how do you reconcile the contradiction between 21st century policing and the use of military equipment? Residents are not enemy combatants. I ask the council to look at, really look at, the list of military style equipment that's been approved over many years. <clears throat> military equipment is used in more situations. Is this what community policing and building trust and legitimacy looks like? I think not. Are these weapons that guardians have? I think not. If you've got the proverbial hammer, everything looks like a nail. A thought I offer you is what's best for the community is what's best for the police department and vice versa. For me, this is to seriously minimize military equipment to the barest essentials and policies to avoid the look and feel of an invading military force of warriors. Allowing people, allowing use policies of military style weapons escalates security fear, especially for poor and people of color and provides and promotes tools of escalation rather than de-escalation. De-escalation of tense situations is the best way to go to protect officers and the public as well. I find many of the police department's military weapons and supporting policies potentially in direct conflict with First Amendment rights, as well as needlessly endangering the public with serious injury and or health consequences, as you've heard tonight. Chemical weapons are one such example. I believe that officers need good protection to do their job. The public also needs protection from excessive force. <clears throat> Please keep the preponderance of military weapons on the battlefield and not in our yards, in our streets, or in other public places. <clears throat> I sent in a couple of days ago, I hope you'll take a look at one of the advertisements of one of the contractors that provides for tear gas. If that doesn't look like a battlefield situation, I don't know what does. I wish I was there to show you in person. I thank you for your time this evening. I hope you'll seriously take much more time on this very, very serious matter tonight. Thank you for your comment. And it looks like that concludes our public comment on item 27 this evening. I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I just wanted to see if the staff wanted to respond to any of the issues that were brought up um, by the members of the public. Yeah, I, I did take note on one specific uh, question or scenario regarding uh, the use of some of this equipment with children or elderly present. Um, you know, what's really difficult uh, is to present every possible scenario that we could be uh, involved in and, and talk about whether, you know, this equipment would be used or not used. But I can specifically say that um, if there's a scenario where we have the, we have time to do our homework and our tactical team will go out several days in advance to do their homework on a particular location, if there's signs of elderly or children present at the location, uh, all of this sort of chemical agents and, and less lethal devices are not approved for deployment, period. So I, I did want to touch on that. Um, again, it's really hard to capture every single possible scenario, but I'm proud of the work that we do prior to any sort of pre-planned uh, situation and even unplanned situation uh, to determine what is the safest um, piece of equipment to resolve the situation. Um, again, around the AR-15s, um, you know, uh, I, I've worked closely with the city attorney's office and Stephanie Duck 
uh, we're, we're utilizing the law and the way it's been given to us. Um, and we think that our scenario must be different. I don't know about all the other agencies, but I know that, um, for example, I know Watsonville was mentioned, uh, they do not issue every single officer their own individual AR-15. So I just think that the scenarios, we have to put it into context. And I think that, you know, our situation is maybe unique, but that's why we've come to that conclusion. The weapons are in every single patrol car as they get deployed. We're not trying to hide them. Um, so everybody knows we have them. It's not a matter of us trying to hide them. Uh, it's basically we're just complying with how we interpret the law. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I have a follow-up question for Interim Chief Escalante. Um, what would it take to include AR-15s in the inventory, and what, what would that look like? What would be the challenges? Could we do that? Yeah, you can make that decision as a governing body, and we, we would add them. And they would be included in all of our future annual reportings moving forward. Um, yeah, that's, that's your... Uh, that's part of this process, actually. So. Are there other uh, uh, equipment items that we may not know about that would be similar to an AR-15 that might be considered to be included? N nothing, no. I mean, well, there's other equipment that we carry, like tasers, uh, batons, OC spray, uh, again, all standard issued equipment when, when an officer goes out to patrol. Um, I mean, the, the 40 millimeters are already included because they're called out based off of the definition. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we do have other equipment uh, that, that also did not fall within the definition. Council Member Golder. Well, I appreciate the members of the public that came out, and I was really, um, you know, thinking hard after hearing what um, Mr. Mike. what Mr. Fitzmaurice and uh, Mr. Porter said, and it got me thinking too. What some of the callers also called in and said, and um, I'm just curious. Just I'm trying to think back in my head with these uses of force in our community. How many of our own officers in the county have been killed in the line of duty in the last, I don't know, 10 years, and I don't know if you know, versus how many people have been killed by officers, and I'm not counting like the ones that got killed in those, you know, I'm, I'm, or maybe counting them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But how many instances like that where the uses of force have become lethal? Either way. I, I don't know uh, statewide or regionally. You no, know, just in the county, I, just in the I, county, or just I, in the locally. Yeah, I mean, within the last ten years, I know we've had two officers killed, and, and obviously the sheriff's office just recently had one. Uh -huh. um, and unfortunately, you know, we do hear and read a lot about violent crime on the rise across the country. And and so from from my perspective, like um, when I think about the AR-15s, it, it would be I guess I, it makes sense to include them, you know, but what I was also thinking is I've seen also on the Santa Cruz police and the sheriff's Instagram pages where you've taken those off the streets out of the hands of criminals too. And so it's just from a public safety standpoint, for me, it makes sense for our police to be carrying the most effective weapons. I mean, you don't want to be outmatched. I don't know how to say it, without, you know, articulately, but when someone's out there protecting the community, I wouldn't want them to have less weapons than are readily available to people on the street. And so, it, and even when I was thinking about when someone said around seniors or students, we practice safety drills for active shooters on campus all the time, you know, a couple times a year at every school. And I would really, I appreciate that you have the non-lethal, but I also appreciate that you have some lethal weapons if needed. It's really terrible to think about, but these kind of tragic mass shooting events happen, and I don't like to live in 
a state of constant fear, but I, I want our police department to be equipped with the most effective tools to protect the uh, people of the community. So I, I am happy to move the motion. I'm happy to include that bit about the AR-15s, and I don't know if we want to continue going around the... Um, okay, Council Member Golder has made a motion to... Um, uh, is is it the staff recommendation? Staff recommendation, and then we could add the AR-15s to the inventory. And if that's the only thing. And I can second. And if I may clarify, um, Mayor, I believe that would technically include including AR-15s in the definition of military equipment as part of the inventory we're posting. Is that correct? So, so in the definition of what quali qualifies as military equipment, AB 481 includes any other equipment as determined by a governing body or a state agency to require additional oversight. So here you would be saying you think that AR-15s require additional oversight and therefore you want them to qualify as military equipment to be included on the list. Yeah, that sounds right. reasonable and I think that's kind of... Sounds like that was your intent. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Council Member Golder, seconded by Kalantari Johnson. And um, we can have discussion on the motion. Council Member Myers. I just have a question based on our attorney's comment then. So requiring oversight, um, that puts you that would put the AR-15s in a, I'm just trying to understand, put the AR-15s into a category that would require, for example, employment policies, trainings, all of those kinds of things that were outlined with the various other um, categories that we have went ahead and put into the military category, um, weapons category. And do any of those actions take place now, or is it the AR-15 basically, in a sense, uh, you know, a field, you know, a field, um, a field uh, response? You know, you mentioned they were in every every patrol car, so I'm just trying to, just trying to understand what that looks like. That particular point you just brought up in terms of um, this additional oversight. Because to me, that, that renders that um, particular uh, weapon in, in our, uh, used by our force to, I'm just trying to find out, I'm trying to understand a little bit more about what that means, that, that particular detail. Yeah, I, I think essentially what it means for us is that it's added to the list and part of the annual reporting. And, and everything that is currently required by AB 481 to be included in that annual report would now include the, the AR-15. So whether it's replacements, whether it's you know any acquisition, uh, cost of trainings, and so forth. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? But it would, but it wouldn't impact day-to-day -day operations within the department. No. Are there any other uh, comments or discussion from council members? Council Member Brown. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, and then forgetting to take this off uh, so I can hear me. Um, <coughs> so I, I just want to say, first off, um, you know, ha having read the inventory and, and listened to the presentation. Um, it's pretty daunting, and I, um, the comments I'm uh, going to make right now are general, um, kind of thinking about this on a societal level, just because I, I feel the need to say it, um, that frankly, I can't understand why we as a society accept using some of these weapons, um, which after all are weapons of war, um, on civilians. And I'm, and again, again, I'm talking at a general level here. My comments are not specific to the SCPD intended to question um, the, our officers' use of equipment appropriately, 
Um, I'm talking about the fact that these are weapons of war that are intended to, to maim <laughs> um, and in some cases kill. Um, the chemical agents alone, uh, which are categorized as less lethal, and um, I, probably on balance that's true, but um, evidence suggests they can certainly be lethal. Um, we were told tonight that they can't be fired at people, but the reality is they can be, um, and they are. Not here <laughs> that I know of, um, but they are. We see this happening in communities around the country. Um, the item before us, though, tonight is not about whether or not we're going to ban these weapons or you know, consider um, what to do ab about them right now. Um, we are, we, as I heard, uh, as we heard, they, we've had them here for many years. Um, but what we're talking about is compliance with AB 481 and a consideration of um, how it is that these uh, weapons are um, acquired, used, uh, potentially utilized, and um, you know, managed in our community. Um, I'm glad that we're uh, that there seems to be support for including assault weapons, the AR-15s, on the list. Um, because I believe that that transparency is an important first step, and that's a lot of what AB 481 is about. Um, it's opened up a conversation um, that I welcome, although it's difficult. Um, I would like us to spend more time, now that that conversation has been opened up, uh, reviewing the equipment on this list, getting a better understanding of what the consequences are, um, the, you know, the potential impacts. And I'd also like to, for us to consider elaborating um, in this policy the rules under, uh, you know, under what circumstances this equipment should not be deployed. Um, I understand you take this very seriously, and the rules that you have in place and the training you have in place uh, prescribes much of that. Uh, but what I see in uh, the language in the document is, uh, in the documents we have before us, um, a lot of including but not limited to, and I think a few of the public commenters raised this. Um, and so that provides a, a pretty wide opening for um, uh, use beyond uh, what we might anticipate, the, or what the expected use is. Um, and, so, and it concerns me. Um, and I, you know, I take the comments of uh, uh, folks who are here, um, who have served on this body, um, have thought about these matters um, in, uh, you know, very deeply, and um, and I think that we do have an opportunity here to um, use this as a conversation, um, to open up a conversation about how we move forward, um, and and try to demilitarize our environment, um, the, our community. Um, so, you know, right now, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know that I have the information that I feel I would need to kind of vote that the, we've made the findings um, that are required to move forward here. Um, I would like us to spend more time on it and get more information. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just leave it there and um, see if others have comments before we move forward. Thank you, Council Member Brown. <coughs> Are there any other um, comments for discussion from Council Members? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And I uh, just want to thank the members of the public for their comments on this item. And. Um, I do want to um, just acknowledge something that was said around engagement and discussion, and you know, I, I think that um, you know, as a governing body, you know, I believe that um, even throughout the course of COVID, and and as we've been, you know, really trying to make sure that we're getting information out to people, that you know, moving forward, um, I think there's opportunities for us to do better as well with getting information out to the public about what items are being heard by our various committees and subcommittees um, because this item did go before the Public Safety Committee and that is one of the layers of transparency and community engagement that we use um, in order for the public to be able to engage with us on these topics such as these where we really do want to get community input. And 
<clears throat> and I should say that there were people here in the audience who did come to that meeting and, and who did um, express their opinions about this at that meeting. So I just wanted to be clear that you know we are trying to do our best to make sure that there is transparency and, and communication around, um, especially when it comes to items of um, high significance like this one. Um, I think Councilmember Brown alluded to this, but um, we also brought this up earlier that that you know before this item came before council, we didn't have any policies around transparency of this type of equipment, and um, we also, to my knowledge, and I stand to be corrected, but you know I don't know if, if we have as much transparency around what, as I mentioned earlier, you know what are the non-lethal and lethal forms of standard issued equipment, and I think it'd be good for the public to know what what that is too and, it, and that it's easily identifiable on the website because just by doing a quick search of you know lethal equipment or what have you it's it's not really easy to find out what types of equipment um, whether it's standard issue or otherwise that we have um, in our police department our police are using and so um, I think that this is helpful um, I did just do a quick search and Capitola has their policy online about uh, the use of, of assault rifles and you know maybe that's something that we could build on in terms of you know if we move in this direction, and um, it doesn't seem like based on the language that really hinders the ability of police officers to use that equipment. And I will say to, you know what came up in the presentation and you know being mayor during 2020, when uh, we did have the incident that led to the death of a police deputy, I mean the entire <clears throat> Santa Cruz Police Department was away responding to that call, and the Bearcat, which there's a policy and. That policy is public on how it's used every year, <clears throat> and it's demonstrated consistently that you know it really is used for the purposes of safety, and that's a really good example of how it was used to protect officers who could have otherwise been hurt or potentially killed. And you know it's unfortunate that our country is you know being militarized more and more. We're hearing about more and more school shootings, mass shootings. We had not only Ben Lomond but Gilroy. A couple years back and this is something that we really need to be conscious of and make sure that um, when those situations occur that we're able to actually provide increased public safety um, and so you know I think that there is a balance that we're gonna have to um, there's, there's a tightrope we're gonna have to walk um, as it relates to you know not militarizing our public safety to the point where people live in fear but also giving them the tools they need so that when people are intending to cause harm on mass scales to our communities, that we're able to protect ourselves. And so um, I guess I'll, I'll leave my comments there. I had some other questions. Um, and yeah, I guess one um, question, because I'm interested in potentially making some friendly amendments that I think might be um, acceptable. But I just want to circle back, because one question I do have is around how pieces of equipment become standard pieces of equipment because I don't think any of us know like at what time did an AR-15 become standard issued equipment and who made that decision and like what was that based on. So I'm just kind of curious about that because it sounds like the way the law stands is that if you know we were to designate another form of lethal equipment to be standard use, it wouldn't necessarily have to go into this policy. and so. I'm just trying to reconcile, you know, who decides when something becomes a standard issued piece of equipment, especially if it can be used for the purposes of force. I would say that the standard issue definition is when a new police officer shows up and we issue all of their equipment that they're going to deploy out in the field every single day, that's standard issue. Um, so, I mean, everything from a duty belt to, to boots to, you know, body camera, all of those pieces of equipment that are standard for them to have in their possession when they go out into the field, that's what I would consider standard issue. Yeah. May I just clarify? So AB 481 does not um, exempt all standard issued equipment. It only exempts standard issued shotguns, service <clears throat> weapons, and standard service issued handheld pepper spray. I wanted to get that clarification out there. Yeah, I guess 
I think, I don't know if my question may, might not be clear, but I guess at what point, so like, let's say, I would imagine back in maybe the 1980s, AR-15s weren't considered standard pieces of equipment. And I guess who determines when something like that becomes a standard piece of equipment? Maybe the city attorney can speak to that. Well, the problem here is that the statute refers to standard issue service equipment, but it doesn't define the term. So, um, so in consultation with my office and the police department, um, we determined that because AR-15s are issued to each and every police officer, um, that, that they are a standard issue uh, item. And I would just note that the statute specifically refers to assault, whip, assault weapons with the exception of standard issue service weapons. So by implication, the legislature contemplated that assault weapons can be standard issue. Uh, and as a practice, they are here, but we don't have a statutory definition upon which to hang our hat. Okay. I think possibly, and maybe we could talk about this on the Public Safety Committee, but I think my question is more related to how does something become standard issued equipment? Because, like, for example, if we were going to say, okay, tomorrow, like an M16 is considered a military weapon, and then who is the, like, if, if, if the pub, if the police department was then going to issue M16s to every single officer, who and that's now considered standard issue equipment, who would be the body to make that determination? That's what I'm trying to get to. I, I think the answer to the question, Councilmember Cummings, is that before um, this new law went into effect, then there wasn't a clear process for doing that. But now that AB 41 is in effect, that's what you that's what you're doing right now. So. So there wasn't a, a clear mechanism for you know, dealing with that situation before, and this is the legislature's attempt to sort of bring that process into the public sphere. Thank you. That was my question. So, and then, um, and then I guess also just the, I just want to make it clear to the community that back in 2020, the city council unanimously approved that any military grade equipment, um, whether it's going to public safety or public works or any department would have to come through the city council for approval. And I believe that's what NS 29862, um, which is the resolution that came before city council. Is that? Yeah, that is correct. Great. So I just wanted the community to be clear that we've been proactively trying to work on this issue and this really what's before us is complying with state law. And so, sorry if I wasn't being clear earlier, but thank you for the time. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I just have a really quick comment because I think what I am hearing in general is that these are iterative and that they're new and they're learning and will refine and if other equipment comes about that we need to take a look at, then we could adjust our policy and even adjust our ordinance in, in the future. But this is where we are now with this legislation and I feel comfortable with the motion and I appreciate the addition. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. At this time, um, we still have one more item after this, our uh, Parks and Recreation Report, and um, I know that they're still waiting. Uh, so if that concludes our comments on this very important item, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to members of the public. I'd like to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote on the motion on the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, at this time we will take a two minute break to just readjust the equipment and uh, allow the city clerk to reset. We will return at 9.48.
Director Elliot might be drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can hear you now, Mayor. Oh. Are we up? Thank you. Uh, if council members are all present, great. Uh, we are now at uh, item 28 on our agenda today. This is Parks and Recreation Department annual report for fiscal year 2021. And I'd like to welcome Director Tony Elliott and Lindsay Bass, Principal Management Analyst via Zoom. All right, thank you very much, Mayor and City Council for the opportunity to present our annual report for fiscal year 21. Uh, thanks for staying up late with us uh, as we present. Uh, just uh, by way of a quick acknowledgement, yeah, Principal Management Analyst Lindsay Bass is on the call. Uh, also out there is our Park Superintendent, Travis Beck. And then uh, coming in from Texas tonight is our Recreation Superintendent, uh, Rachel Kaufman. So happy to answer questions once we get to that point. So uh, the, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll move through this presentation pretty quickly here this evening. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Okay, so yeah, um, we'll move through this pretty quickly this evening, but um, please don't let my, uh, my brevity in the presentation uh, discount the, the really exceptional work that's been done here by the Parks and Recreation Department and by Lindsay and Travis and Rachel to put this report together. So. For the council and the community, um, this report uh, is available. And so even though the presentation will be short tonight, uh, a lot of really great information and detail in this report uh, for the community. So the, the purpose of doing this report um, every year, this is our second edition. Of, uh, the purpose is to summarize the Parks and Recreation Department services and portfolio to the community, to benchmark and assess performance against the department's mission, goals, and objectives, and to summarize service level demands and needs uh, within the community. And for a little bit of context, um, and especially for the community, as we're looking at this, we're talking about fiscal year 21. We're currently uh, nearing the end of fiscal year 22, and we're planning for our budget for fiscal year 23. So at this moment, we're looking what seems like uh, a long time ago uh, backwards, but it's, it's relevant um, to look at where we've been uh, to help us uh, be very strategic about where we're going. So just wanted to give a little bit of that context in terms of the, the time frame on this. The mission of the Parks and Rec Department is to provide quality public spaces and experiences that build a healthy community, foster equity, and better the environment. Um, and within the report, there's some really great narrative uh, that drills down into detail about, uh, about that mission and what we do. Um, in the report, you'll see a number of goals, our 2021 goals that we have outlined here. Um, and by way of numbers, you can see some of these on the screen. I think one that we often talk about in Parks and Recreation here in service to Santa Cruz is that we've got 96% of all of our residents within a 10 minute walk of a park. So we have 50 total uh, park properties, 32 neighborhood parks, um, so a really uh, world-class or truly amazing uh, park system. We've got more than triple the national average of trails. Uh, so from a numbers and metric standpoint, we, we stand out uh, nationally uh, and we stand out among our comparison agencies even throughout the state of California. So if you look at our parks master plan, comparison agencies like San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, so on and so forth, uh, even surpass our levels of service compared to a lot of these communities. So uh, a real point of pride there. Um, again, I'm gonna move through this very quickly. So a couple of the highlights that we've included in this year's annual report and reflecting on 2021, um, that during the, the sort of, uh, during the pandemic and um, challenges we faced in 2021, we had about a 10% vacancy rate. That vacancy rate was even higher within our park maintenance division. Uh, I think it was over 20% within our park maintenance division at its worst. But even with staff shortages, we were able to keep 99% of our park acreage open and accessible to the community. Um, and we saw a, a, a real increase in usage of parks during fiscal year 21. Uh, use of Westcliff was up over 100%. Uh, the golf course had a record year in terms of play uh, and revenue. So 
parks were in heavy use. A number of highlights in terms of our investment um, in the natural environment from uh, investment in uh, clean energy from solar um, to our street tree master plan um, and work to migrate uh, our gas powered equipment to battery powered lawn equipment um, in addition to others, reforestation, tar plant recovery um, at Arana Gulch as well. So significant investment in our natural environment uh, even in the face of staff shortages and a challenging uh, year in fiscal year 21. We also made significant investment in our community services. So 2021 was not a normal year. So we were providing essential worker child care at the London Nelson Community Center. Uh, summer school classes began uh, at Bayview and Galt Elementary Schools, um, offered a number of teen employment opportunities to get teens plugged into local jobs and a lot of efforts uh, geared toward reaching our senior population uh, with new technology, working with Nueva Vista, uh, Elder Day, a number of uh, programs to serve our senior community uh, as well in 21. So a number of lessons that we've learned now with our second annual report. Um, at number one here, the report can really help us support a dialogue with the community um, uh, on the value of parks and recreation. That's part of the reason that we're here tonight and we've continued to put this document together uh, to inform the community on the value of parks and recreation. Um, and so we're seeking feedback tonight uh, from the council on um, how is this report? What can we do to improve it? What is your feedback um, on this report and our efforts to communicate to the community uh, in regards to the Parks and Rec Department? Uh, secondly, um, uh, we continue to do work. This was a topic uh, that the council raised last year when we presented the annual report. We continue to make progress Toward standardizing our benchmarks and our KPIs, our key performance indicators um, on what are we measuring and what uh, what does the community want to hear? What do they need to hear in terms of metrics and measurement from parks and recreation? So we've uh, improved that um, and taken the council's direction from last year, but we continue to work on that. And that's a real focus for me and Lindsay and the team um, to really get uh, solid data, key performance indicators so that we can report to the council on that. Um, over time. And then our uh, perpetual challenge is how to cover everything that we do in parks and recreation, communicate this out, but keep it as succinct as possible. So always a challenge as we go into the report. So just a few key takeaways I uh, want to leave the council with um, and the community um, uh, just reflecting on fiscal year 21 is that parks and recreation is really essential. And we saw this uh, more perhaps than ever in 21 um, from an infrastructure standpoint, parks and our facilities are infrastructure uh, and served uh, in that capacity. We served in an emergency service capacity uh, during the CZU fires, um, the essential child, uh, the essential worker child care, um, opening our facilities to that need. Um, and then um, again, just parks in terms of that infrastructure to serve the physical and mental health and well-being of our community. We knew that. We talk about that a lot from the health and wellness and health and all policies um, uh, uh, lens uh, through parks and recreation. But when everything was shut down and we were still uh, going through the, the those early uh, months of, of the pandemic, um, we saw uh, even more so that uh, Parks and Rec it provides critical infrastructure for our physical and mental uh, well-being. Um, another key takeaway is just that we continue to face the challenges of, of the time. Um, in fiscal year 21, that included the pandemic and wildfires. Um, but in the annual report, we do a spotlight on the impacts of homelessness and parks. Um, an ongoing challenge as we're talking about San Lorenzo Park and the bench lands and so forth. Um, and then just tight budgets. We've got t really tens of millions of dollars uh, in deferred maintenance. And so really facing those challenges of the time and finding innovative and creative ways to, to address those challenges. That's kind of a key, a key theme. I mentioned it briefly earlier. I think that uh, the, the parks and recreation system and the staff here in Santa Cruz, it's, it's such a point of pride. Uh, I think we've, we truly have a world-class park system here um, really high levels of service, iconic amenities, West Cliff and the Wharf and so on and so forth, highly ranked amenities and assets throughout the city. 
Uh, so there's a lot to be proud of there. Earlier in the council meeting today, we uh, uh, heard from a number of volunteers and the volunteer recognition uh, that occurred around four o'clock this afternoon. I think that was a great reflection on a real key aspect in parks and recreation, which are partnerships. Um, if we are successful in parks and rec, it's likely because we've got a successful partnership going on. And that's uh, credit to our, our volunteers uh, through partnerships uh, with some of the organizations that we heard from uh, this evening, uh, Save the Wave, Save Our Shores, so on and so forth. So a lot to be proud of. The community loves the parks, they're engaged. Uh, and uh, so again, wanted to leave the council and community with these key takeaways uh, from our annual report. Um, and with that, I will uh, end my presentation. And again, just acknowledge Lindsay, Travis and Rachel for all of their work on this, acknowledge the Parks and Rec staff and just appreciate and thank the council for your support um, always of Parks and Rec and would just welcome your feedback on things that we could work on and improve uh, on this report uh, moving into the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Elliott. I appreciate you um, giving that overview and, and really all the work that your department has contributed during that time period. Uh, you know, really calling out the investments in some of the above and beyond or unusual uh, programming and services, the uh, summer school classes and, and essential daycare and, and really, really thankful that you're investing in some of the, the environmental aspects uh, and seeing, you know, examples like battery powered lawn equipment and so on. So thank you for that overview. I'm going to bring it to uh, council members for any comments uh, and discussion on this item. We do have, um, it's, um, it's an item to review, provide feedback, and accept the Parks and Recreation Department fiscal year 2021 annual report. Council Member Golder. I just wanted to thank and appreciate everyone who worked on that report and all of the quality work that went into um, making um, everything happen in the last year. I just, I can't thank you enough for all of the work that you did to provide um, services to our community and the, all the collaboration you did with community partners. So thank you. It's a great, really comprehensive report. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Golder. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, and I'll echo those sentiments. Thank you, Tony and team, for the report and the work that you do that is um, clearly articulated in the report. And I was really thrilled to see the Children and Youth Bill of Rights as one of the objectives under the goals and objectives. Um, so thank you for your continued work and thank you for the thorough, comprehensive, and easily digestible report. Thank you, Galantar Johnson. Council Member Brown. I'll add my enthusiastic appreciation for uh, the report and for all you do. Um, and I, I just have a couple of comments. This is a wonderful report. I was thrilled to see it last year. Um, really thrilled that this is uh, an ongoing uh, goal to, to provide this information in a, in a way that's really um, uh, highlights some of the um, really innovative and amazing work that's being done, um, makes it uh, accessible to the community and to council members. Um, and uh, I just have a, a couple of comments. I mean, the, the first takeaway that you included, Tony, um, or Director Elliott, was um, that parks and recreation is, is critical. Um, and I would say, uh, or essential, excuse me, essential, absolutely. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see some more reference, I think in, in general in the, um, the, the work that Parks and Rec does, that, that Parks and Rec workers are essential. Um, I mean, the, the work that you all do um, in the field, uh, I mean, the hours that are put in, the, um, 
know, the challenging issues that, uh, that have come up um, over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to see a highlighting of workers um, in addition, and, and maybe that could happen in these reports, like through a profile. And I know that happens in uh, you know other other formats and and other uh, through other mechanisms. But highlighting the workers who are who are doing this. I mean, the commitment is when I talk to Parks and Rec workers, their commitment is just um, you know. Uh, you know, undeniable. I mean, they really embody the mission and values uh, that are uh, espoused in our uh, Parks and Rec uh, master plan and in the department's uh, guiding documents. And so, you know, just just wanting to to really bring that out. I think there. You know, we. I, I get a little bit uh, tired of hearing comments from the public, and you know, we don't hear a lot of it. But there's this. There seems to be a disconnect. We hear people say, um, you know, you know, stop all this, like, you know, the workers get paid too much, or you know, we the work, you know, we need services with, and at the same time that there's a denial that we need resources to pay people to do those services, and um, so I'm just saying that as like a frustration, and I think a way to maybe make that more, um, to highlight that more for the public. You know, it, it would be nice to see that in you know in this format and other in other ways, and I'm saying it now as a way to highlight it as well. Um, uh, the I, I didn't see near Lagoon, um, and I have a couple of questions about uh, what's happening there. I mean, it is a treasured part of our uh, parks network, uh, wetlands, and um, you know, really uh, you know a, a, a significant ecosystem. Um, an ecological resource as well as a recreational resource. Uh, and I know that we did get some funding for some repairs along the walkways and um, just wondering where that's at. Um, and maybe it wasn't something to highlight because it's in process, um, but um, just would love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Brown, and appreciate the comments about highlighting staff. I think uh, really appreciate that. I think that's a good idea, something we could include. But yeah, well said. Um, yeah, our, our boots on the ground staff uh, are the ones that make it happen. So I appreciate that comment. Um, I would welcome uh, our Park Superintendent Travis Beck if he's out there to speak to updates on Miri Lagoon. Thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you, Council Member Brown, for that question. Um, Yes, we did receive uh, funding from the state park system to replace a section of the floating walkway in Neary Lagoon. And we've been working on laying all the groundwork for that. So uh, Lindsay and our park planner Noah Downing and field supervisor Blake Wessner have issued a request for proposals for um, contractors who will perform that work and we are expecting to receive those proposals at the end of this week, which will keep us on schedule um, to do the actual construction work once we enter the permitted season for that work, which will be uh, later this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just lastly say, I, I did appreciate the, the picture, the last page um, with the goats. And I'm really, I'm really <laughs> a big fan of the goats these days. We got them for the RTC right of way and um, uh, just love it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for that presentation. And I just, I'm actually going to build off of um, something that Council Member Brown brought up in her statements. <clears throat> and this might not sound related at first, but it's related. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think would be good for us to have a discussion about is that the child care tax got passed by the community, and that money is the cannabis child care tax, and it's, or I don't even know if it's child care tax or if it's the children's tax. But um, the idea being that children's fund, children's fund, children's yeah, fund, yeah. Um, not a tax, got, though. Not a tax. Yeah, cannabis tax. Cannabis tax for the children's fund, yeah, right? right. <laughs> um, so that, so that funding is supposed to go towards supporting programs related to children in our community. And you know we haven't really had a discussion as a body on how that money is going to be spent, it sounds like. I know that um, having been on the city schools committee, there's some discussion there. But I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity for us to discuss that because 
Um, you know, Parks and Rec offer a lot of programs uh, for children in our community. And, and when I was on the um, City Schools Committee, you know, there's discussion about offering scholarships. And I think the last time we had an update, there was a substantial amount of money in that fund. But I think it would be good to get a sense of how much money is being generated from that fund annually. And could some of that money be used to provide staff who are going to be working and operating these children's programs? Because um, I think one thing that I've heard meeting with some uh, Parks and Rec staff is that, um, you know, oftentimes they're um, shorthanded and they're in charge of running, whether it's junior guards or other camps. But, you know, some of these staff members are running around trying to support these programs that are understaffed. And if there's a way for us to have, you know, whether it's one staff member who's um, supported from that fund or what have you, I think it might be good to see how we can make sure that we have enough staffing programs for these, for um, the children in our community and for the programs that support children in our community. So that was just a thought of whether or not that should come back and we can just have a, a look at how that money is being spent. I think it would be good too because oftentimes members of the community don't know, understand like where that money is going towards and what kind of programs it's supporting. So. I think it might be good, whether that's during budget. Um, actually, maybe budget's appropriate that we can look that's at a, that fund and have the conversation. I'm happy to speak. Yes, that Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about that, because as you know, it's been a policy by the council. But once it was voted on by the people, it really changes the structure in which the funding recommendations will be coming forward in the future. But the retroactive approach to it, and I mentioned this earlier in the, re in the report outs, is um, this next year we'll have a recommendations from the city schools committee to the council to use the funding, but also simultaneously there will be a process to um, use or identify key stakeholders in our community who want to help us um, in a more formal oversight advisory type capacity in which that will also provide transparency and leveraging partnerships and resources like we do with first five currently they don't have any administrative overhead that they take for providing a lot of our scholarships. I will say, though, that the fund is written pretty specifically in that it's not used to backfill um, staff or programming, but it's essentially used to provide kind of an equity lens to support our most vulnerable um, who could use scholarships to support the kids and families directly. So I think conversations will have to ensue in round, around um, you know, a, a different purpose or a leveraging of another funding source for that kind of purpose. But, yeah, there's, and the ballot language is on um, the city's website, so I encourage you to review that, too, and to get more um, familiar with the nuances of it. But I also know that we do have um, recommendations from the city schools committee that will be coming to the council and the discussions that could be held around budget time as well. But I also, while I have the quick moment, just want to thank Parks for your presentation and for the essential work you provide all the time for making Santa Cruz so uniquely amazing and beautiful for all to experience. This was a beautiful report. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, Council Member Myers. I'll just make it very brief. I just do want to thank you for everything that you guys do every day in the city. Um, I think your department is one of the ones that really touches people, you know, at all levels of their families. Um, and their experience, um, and I thought the report was great. Um, I like some of the suggestions brought up um, today. Um, it might also be great to maybe in future reports do a little deep dive into a particular park or a particular facility. Um, you know, we have a lot of capital needs, and um, it's hard to learn all that in a budget uh, framework. And so, you know, help us understand, you know, what are the needs for the Civic Auditorium, you know, when are we going to rebuild that gosh darn lifeguard headquarters, you know, I mean, just, yeah, put, put, a, put a face to these issues that we need to be thinking of for some of these capital investments for our future generations and, you know, give us, a, give us the ugly pictures and the, and the nice pictures, so. Um, it's fun also to just learn a little bit about the history of the buildings and the places we own. And uh, so that's another place to just sort of bring, pop that information for us. Helps us remember, distinguish. Thanks for your work, you guys. Thank you, Council Member Myers. All right. Uh, if that, yeah, uh, that concludes. Uh, this meeting. 
No, no, no. Oh, you have a cover coming. Come 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 <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> we will go to public comment on this item and then come back before we conclude this meeting. I am checking the attendees on Zoom. Thank you for being with us. And um, if you are a member of the public and you are joining us via Zoom, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. And you can press star nine by raising your hand or selecting the raise hand feature on your uh, webinar controls on your computer. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set to three minutes. Members of the public who are joining us here in chambers and wanting to comment on this item, please line up at, to the right of the dais. You will have three minutes to speak. We ask that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Okay, so now I will look to our attendees. And I am not seeing any hands raised. Uh, in the Zoom, I am not seeing any hands raised. And now I will bring it out to members of the public here in person. If you would like to comment on this item, please approach the microphone, thank you. Thank you. My name is John Golder, um, um, Grandpa Young. <laughs> and I've been doing this for 30 years, more than 30 years. Um, diving into city parks and rec programs and, and ball fields in particular and everything about the Greenbelt planning and, er and everything. In fact, I want to enter into the record this fresh copy of a tattered uh, document I did 12 years ago, uh, the Quimby Basics. The first two pages of the basics, I give you all the basics. I did all the research. And then another eight pages that an attorney told me I knew more about the Quimby Act than any attorney in town, because I had every decision and everything you could think of. So th this, please enter into the record. So I had 19 points to make, and I'm going to be super brief, and you can, if you want more, I've got it. Renee knows it. Okay, so I don't even have my glasses. So we'll start with number one. You want a world-class parks and recreation system. This city has built one ball field in the last 50 years. Uh, I, I was quoted by the Sentinel in a meeting years ago. At that rate, my grandchildren's grandchildren might see the next one built. Uh, I was president of, uh, or vice president of the Santa Cruz Rugby Club in 1984 with them for 10 years. We never had a home field and basically had to leave, leave Santa Cruz uh, uh, because we could never get a home field. And we played t teams from all across the world. Uh, uh, you, how can you be a world class if you got the De La Viega uh, plan has been unfinished since 1962. Uh, and the golf course revenue that Gary lost a lot used to brag about that was uh, made money The city had to forgive a two million dollar loan to the golf course uh, The Charles Derby small ball range was destroyed and three hundred thousand dollars worth of infrastructure improvements with no public meeting about the closure only about the remediation uh, Depot Park the first ball field in 50 years Two acres, a green plastic failure, the field in, within two years, and cost $1,387,000 repair, and I don't know if that even includes the litigation. Um, Quimby, uh, for 37 years, not a, uh, no, par uh, no parks have been purchased with that money. Uh, uh, the, P, uh, uh, the money uh, for P&R, CIPs, uh, have been gone almost all for repair and maintenance, and I've got the, the figures to prove it. Parks, there's no criteria for different activities in parks. There's no description of park zoning. 
how every time we have a new park, there's endless debate about it. You got um, the definition of parks, essentially a parcel, uh, an unapproved parcel used for recreation. Does that describe urban parks? I don't think so. Um, general plan land use, you're supposed to be able to tell the difference in the land use plans. The city, the, the city. Thank you, the, the buzzer buzzed. So I know it did, will second. you give me extra time? Go ahead and finish okay, up your sentence. Okay, the city's general plan land use map, which is an extremely important document. You're supposed to be able to tell the difference in land uses. The heavily improved city parks are the same color and pattern as the state parks, Wilder Ranch, Henry Cowell. That's a mistake that came from them using the assessor's maps to describe parks. Thank you for your public comment right. on this item. We have received your documents and the public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate oh, it. Uh, one more, one more. Items comments A through F in the, in the DGBIR uh, for the current general plan. Every one of them multi-page and meticulously documented. With all due respect, uh, Mr. Golder, your time is up, and this. Thank you. I really appreciate your input, and thank you for joining us in person. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I will bring it back to council now. And um, is there a motion to accept the, uh, the Parks and Recreation Department fiscal year 2021 annual report? Council Member Cummings? Yep, I'll move the, um, I'll move accepting the Parks and Rec Department fiscal year 2021 and a report has to have a comment to make after there's a second. Is there a second? Council Member Golder seconded. <coughs> okay, and any further discussion or comments? Council Member Cummings? Um, I uh, wanted to follow up on a comment that was made by um, the member of the public. And we'll want to say uh, to the Parks and Rec Director that there is a group in Santa Cruz that very much is interested in trying to establish a rugby field here. And um, I think they're also you know, willing to try to help fundraise around that if there's a park that might be adequate for having such a field. So just wanted to let members of the council know and members of the public know that um, there is still interest in that and also just speak on behalf of that group because anytime I see them, they ask me about, you know, what can we do about getting a rugby field in the city? So if there's a park that needs some some TL, some love and, and, you know, some additional funding and might be adequate for putting a rugby field in, I think that might be worth considering. So just wanted to mention that since um, Mr. Golder brought up his uh, time playing rugby and there not being a dedicated field here in Santa Cruz. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. All right, I think uh, we are ready for a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brenner? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you very much for that report. And this meeting is now adjourned. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Isn't that a nice solid? Yeah, well shy of 12 hours, it's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt, for showing me that meeting. Yeah, you're welcome.